present. Here. 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 Thank you. Are there any members of the public who like to see any items on the closed session agenda? I will go out to the attendees list. Raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or select hand on the webinar. Attendees. Give it another few seconds. Sure. Oh. There. Yes. This is Laura, we have a couple of people on early um, that are not here for the whole session. I believe they're with downtown. So I just wanted to let them know that I'll be from this right now. Okay. Much. And they can um, return for public portion session at 11. We have one attendee. Uh, Chris, turn if you are here to speak on any item in the closed session agenda, you can press star nine, raise your hand, or select. And webinar poll on your paper. If not, we will bring it back. Okay. So, no attendees now. I um, bring it back. For closed session item, and I am uh, waiting. Are we ready for closed session? Okay, I'm. I'm looking for a motion on agenda item one, referral to closed session, owned get parcel at nine. Leaders. Uh, Council Member Kings. I'll move that out into closed session. A motion by Kings. Seconded by Myers. I will now ask her to take a roll call vote. Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimous. Approve a referral to a closed session for discussion regarding at least price terms, both of city owned vacant parcel at 950. This meeting is adjourned. And Eleven thirty AM session of the March eighth, two thousand twenty two meeting of the City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Mayor Here. 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 Brown. Here. Mayor. Vice Mayor what? Here. Mayor. Present. Uh, first, I'd like to start this meeting by taking a moment of silence uh, for children and innocent lives taken 
by the Russia's military invasion in the Ukraine and those living their darkest hours. Just have a few seconds, a moment of silence. Thank you. I would now like to begin uh, Council Member Cumming, you have your hand raised. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for a um, moment of silence acknowledging what's happening in Ukraine. I have received a number of communications from community members and been asking what the city could do in response, and some suggestions have been made around sending letters um, to our representatives, essentially um, the Ukrainian government, Russian government, um, and I just wanted to know whether or not um, I might be able to put an item on a future agenda that would ratify any communications that you might want to send, knowing that there's a lot of urgency, or if we could have an item based on a future agenda that would um, allow the council to weigh in on um, whether the community are so, Thank given you, that we council were talking about this. Thank you, council member Cummings. There is a draft letter and an uh, uh, agenda hold for March 22nd meeting. Thank, Thank you so much. Council also, member I don't know if anybody else is getting this, but I'm getting a back loop of today's meeting on my end. I don't know if anybody else I'll figure that out. Thank you. Council member Golder. Yeah, I just wanted to also thank you. I had out to the city manager regarding this, and I think it's super important to remember that um, originally our sister city of Alushta was, was part of the Soviet Union when we, um, when we became their sister city decades ago, and then they were part of uh, Ukraine um, up until the last Russian invasion when Crimea was taken over by Russia. And Prior to that, I've, I had two different um, delegations of, of um, Ukrainian um, uh, professionals from our sister city in Alushta and one from Kiev come and stay with me for, I think, almost a month, um, each of them. And it's just really, you know, I, I also feel like a super strong connection that was why um you know i originally joined sister cities was from writing letters as a pen pal um to students over there as an elementary school student here in santa cruz and it's just um i i would wonder if anybody from the sister cities committee has reached out to any of our prior um delegations that have gone out there and so if, if any direction can go back to sister cities to ask them to to reach out. Um, I've reached out to the people that stayed with me and I just, I don't know if they could report back with any um, any news, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Folder. Council Member Cumming? I can just say that I, I um, email that went out to the um, mayor um, with sister city members included, I was also able to attend a meeting uh, this weekend, they had a retreat and there was discussion around what to do moving forward. So I would just recommend Mayor uh, maybe reach out to um, some of the members and maybe the chair if they could kind of fill you in on what was for that meeting. Um, but I think that one thing that came out was that uh, it sounded like there was a clear interest in seeing if the city um, um, express our opposition. Or, I just wanted to put out there that um, it might be worth following up with them to kind of figure out what. Thank you, Council Member Cummings, for that up. 
Okay. We are ready then to continue with our agenda. And um, I would like to move on uh, to uh, our first presentation, which is the Downtown Streets team presentation. We will have Genevieve Lucas Conwell, and the Senior Project Manager, and Jocelyn Cran, Director of Downtown Street Team, uh, with a presentation. Welcome, Genevieve. And Jocelyn, I see, there you are. Welcome to this meeting. Hi, um, thank you so much for having us. I'm gonna share my screen um, so that we can uh, just start the presentation. Um, okay. Boom. Well, first off, happy International Women's Day. Thank you, Sonia, for the start of the meeting with a moment of silence for Ukraine. Super important. Um, so, um, like mentioned, I'm Genevieve. I'm the Senior Project Manager at Downtown Streets team in Santa Cruz. And um, today I'm just going to be talking a little bit about what we do, how we do it, and um, where we are currently and where we hope to go. Um, first and foremost, I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, where we come into play with uh, the current state of homelessness in Santa Cruz. Um, so uh, right now from the, as we all know, the time count happened in before the pandemic. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the statistics and how um, our model helps to support um, our current um, folks. So from the point in time count in 2019, we do know that there's over 2,100 um, folks experiencing homelessness estimated. Um, in uh, Santa Cruz County, and the primary events that led them to this was 26% um, uh, of them lost their job, uh, and 18% of them actually were evicted. This is all from time count again, so um, there was only a few surveys that were um, from the estimated count that were actually reached, so of course all of these are estimates um, from what we know. So where and how does downtown Street team actually play into supporting um, the um, our homeless population here in Santa Cruz. So our model is a community first model. Um, this is a beautiful um, junction with our uh, other uh, partners that are housing first model. Um, this is how we play a part in supporting our folks experiencing homelessness. Uh, when we first were founded in 2005 in Palo Alto, um, our uh, CEO Eileen Richardson uh, was part of a survey that was conducted um, to folks experiencing homelessness in the area. And um, the survey asked, what is the worst part about your population? And the answers came to be that the isolation of homelessness was the worst part about being homeless. And so that is where the need uh, for our model kind of came about, um, where we saw that building a community um, first for our folks was really kind of the central part and part of what we do. So um, as you all may know, you see our yellow shirts walking around. Those folks wearing the yellow shirts are our team members and our program participants. And they volunteer to beautify um, Santa Cruz. They volunteer four hours a day, five times a week, Monday through Friday, all around town. Um, and while they volunteer with us, they receive a non-cash basic needs stipend. They have access to a case manager, um, employment services. And uh, while they are on the team, we um, help them support, expand their support network so that we're not just the only uh, service provider supporting them, but they uh, also have doctors, den dentists, any other um, partners that we can seek out that can help build their net of support. So a little bit about, about our basic needs stipend. Um, it's right in the title. Our hope is to help support um, their needs so that they can get to their wants. We want to lift them out of survival mode so that they can get into goal setting mode. Um, there's, of course, a list of barriers that can sometimes um, stop them from getting to goal setting mode. So our case managers are there to support in removing some of those barriers, such as obtaining vital documents, um, meeting with pr primary care physicians. Um, if they're new to the area, supporting them and getting, getting to know the area, getting to know where are their local uh, services, where they get a hot meal. Um, while they're also on the team, our uh, non-cash uh, basic needs stipend covers food, storage, um, rent if they have any, phone bills, um, transportation as well. Um, so anything that they might absolutely need to help them get to the place where they wanna go. Um, the first step into joining our team is um, going to our weekly success meeting. Um, so it's in the title, it's every Thursday 
at 12 o'clock on uh, at the Little Red Church on Center. And um, we, our folks uh, that are new to the team, it's a chance for them to not only get to meet current team members, chat with the um, team leads there, chat with me, chat with the case managers. Um, it's also a chance for them to celebrate any successes that they might have. Something as small as I smoked one less cigarette to uh, I got employment, I got housing. Uh, so it's a platform for them to kind of speak about what's going on in their life if they want to, um, and also to feel lifted. Um, it's definitely the heart and soul of what we do. If you've never been to a weekly success meeting, this um, this is your invitation here right now um, to come. Um, and uh, since we have started in 2017, we have grown, which is beautiful to see. Uh, we've grown from our downtown team to the levy. Um, we've expanded our downtown team starting yesterday, which is really exciting. Um, we are uh, at the beach, at Cowles Beach. We're going to be in Midtown coming uh, in about two weeks on the 28th. Uh, we're in Emmeline, Harvey West. We're also in the North County area. So we are in Felton as well as um, Scotts Creek, which is not in the picture. I tried to get all the pictures in, but um, we, we have what we have. Um, so with uh, this expansion, we're going to have the ability to and to 50 team members, which is really exciting. It's more people that we can support, um, and um, we're, we're very excited about it. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit moment of um, speaking to our impact that we've had since we've come to town almost five years in August. Um, and so some of the barriers, I jumped a little too quickly. <laughs> uh, so in 2021, uh, we've had removed over 150,000 pounds of debris um, in Santa Cruz as well as over 5,000 needles. Uh, barriers to self-sufficiency um, is one of our metrics that we use. Barriers to self-sufficiency, you can think of uh, how many resumes that we've um, helped people build, how many jobs that have been applied to, um, any, you know, have we helped them with expunging their record? Have we increased their access to transportation, IDs, vital documents, any of that? Um, so we've had um, over 200, almost close to 300 uh, barriers removed. Uh, transformational barriers, we have 25, so transformational barriers are those that have gotten housed, gotten employed, have they gone in and seeked higher education? Um, all of those are, are transformational uh, barriers. Now, since 2017, we have removed over 700,000 pounds of debris in Santa Cruz County. Um, we've removed uh, 23,000, over 23,000 needles, um, over 1,000 barriers were removed, had over 100 transformational barriers, and uh, over 500 folks have gone through our program um, since we've, we've been here. Um, a little bit about um, how people actually feel uh, about our program. Uh, so every year we have um, the ability to uh, conduct an anonymous, anonymous survey, just kind of you know, check the polls. How are, are people uh, feeling about our programs? Is there anything that we can do better? So um, these are the some of the answers that we've together uh, from the 2021 survey results. So 93% of survey participants feel that their case managers are compassionate, trustworthy, and able to help achieve goals. 100% uh, of survey participants feel that their project manager is fair, respectful, and available. 92% of survey participants stated that their involvement with DST has decreased the quantity or improved the quality of interactions with law enforcement um, slash the court system. 100% of survey participants agree that participating in DST has improved their self-esteem, motivation, and hope. And 100% of survey participants feel good giving back to their community and helping others. Um, that's definitely one of um, the most important ones that we wanted to stick to um, because our model is so concentrated on not only uh, coming to work and having something to do every day, um, but being a part of a community. I mean, of course, we're community first model. Our whole hope is to not only serve our unhoused population, but how can we bridge um, unhoused and housed um, population? Um, so quick send off before I sign off. Um, quick, really quick ways to get involved is just saying hi, um, not only to our team, um, you have some team members that count how many highs and thanks, thank yous they get, because that's um, something special that they love getting, uh, but also anybody that um, is unhoused, uh, I think uh, when we see the current situation um, within our community, I think there's just more bridge uh, community version that we can do. And it's just something as simple as saying hello and getting to know each other. 
um, weekly success meeting for um, downtown streets team is every Thursday at 12 p.m. So like I mentioned, the invitation is still good. Um, you can absolutely come by. We have meals um, and we will absolutely celebrate you. I can maybe even do a little dance uh, when you come in. <laughs> Those are for the special ones, but everyone's fine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, my contact information, if you have any questions, um, is right here below. And our wonderful director, Jocelyn, is also on the call, and that is now as well. With that, um, that is the end of my presentation, and I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Genevieve. Um, Jocelyn, did you want to say anything? Yeah, no, I'm just, thank you for giving us the time to present and, and Genevieve really was our, our representation. So thank you all. Please stay on, um, I see a couple hands up. So I'd like to um, bring it out to the council for any questions or comments. Uh, was the council member Myers? Yeah, Justin, and I just want to thank you for today. Um, I've dipped in, out, in and out of um, being involved with DSP and um, great fun work with folks, the natural resource program we had for a couple of years before the COVID place sort of, you know, kind of made change. But um, I just think your statistics show that about relationships and helping people get out of home. I believe that, you know, people who are solitary and on their own, and not able to connect with people can help guide them. Um, so I or really telling and it's also telling fortunately on the impact that homeless has on a lot of different but most great on the individual. So um, just appreciate your work. Um so that you're here and I know you're also in that and so I'm just thrilled that you guys are here on this Know that you are part a big part of this. Thank you so much. Very very kind of you. Uh, Council Member Cumming. I just wanted to echo my appreciation for all the work you all have done. And actually, before the pandemic, I actually had an opportunity to go to one of the um, success, weekly success meetings, and it was just great to see you know how far some come and how. The asking people are about wanting to, you know, do better and you know, get the different shirt, move up in the program, and um, so it, it's really great work, and it shows with participants. I did have one question. I know that you pointed out in your slides that there were roughly like 500 or so people who went through the program, and I was just curious about um, like what were the outcomes for those people who went through in terms of kind of where you see people going, like how many end up, you know, improving their lives and moving on to having housing, those who kind of maybe fall out of the program. And I know that there's some people who probably come in and out for a variety of reasons, but I think it'd just be good to kind of understand, um, you know, of the 500 people who come in, what, what does success look like? I think that's a great question. And thank you for the appreciation from both you and um, uh, Council Member uh, Myers. Um, I don't have the statistics right in front of me, but I do have them available. Um, I can absolutely send them your way. Um, it completely varies um, from the top of my head. Um, I can tell you um, some of them absolutely get employment. Some of them, it's not the right time for them to fully commit to the program, so they uh, come back again. Um, but I'll get you those statistics so that they can um, say a little bit more. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Kellen Terry Johnson. Thank you. Yes, and I'll ditto what my colleague said. Thank you for this presentation and for all the work. And um, anytime I come across a downtown person um, in our community, they are always so friendly and so engaged. So um, you're doing a wonderful job and they're doing a wonderful job. I had a similar question, um, Council Member Cummings, but wondering if you could share a little bit more about transformational barriers and what that looks like and removing of those barriers. Yeah, so transformational barriers, um, they are, um, like I mentioned, they, they're they they're the hard ones to get, right? They are the ones that um, are gonna take some time uh, to get to. Uh, for example, housing is a big one. I can speak to, um, for example, we had a few of our team members on one of the slides um, 
that recently got housing. And uh, I think they're a perfect example as to how it takes a village to really support our team. And it wasn't only with Downtown Streets team, it was with Encompass uh, Services, it was with Wings. Uh, we all collaborated together to support these folks to getting into housing. And so um, I think that example is a really good one as to, you know, transformational barriers is, you know, of course it's housing, of course it's employment. There's also other ones like um, uh, expungement of records um, and uh, getting education certification, um, uh, of um, other ones right now, but I'll definitely get you the full list of barriers. And um, there is a breakdown of how many we've gotten, uh, you know, how many we've gotten housed, how many we've gotten um, to higher education, um, et cetera. So I can get that list as well. Great. Well, that gives a good picture of it. And I'm looking forward to coming to a weekly success meeting and hope we can do a little dance together. Yes, let's do it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I think uh, you know, we see the community first model uh, from your teams in our and um, very appreciative of uh, the work and the, the change that it creates. I know I've talked to many folks who have gone through the program and a couple of them who have graduated program and and um, it's just wonderful so thank you for all the work you're doing it's definitely noticed and appreciated thanks for sharing with us your your presentation today. thank you guys all right uh, we are now I'd like to to take a moment and acknowledge National Women's Day, Happy International Women's Day. And we have, um, uh, it's also uh, Women's History Month. So I will uh, take this moment to read through a proclamation. Whereas the month of March has been designated by presidential proclamation to honor the contributions women have made over the course of American history, women of every race, class, cultural, and ethnic background have made historic contributions to our nation and world in countless recorded and unrecorded ways. And whereas women play a critical role in every facet of life constitute a significant portion of the labor workforce, both inside and outside home. The 2022 Women's History Month team is providing healing, promoting hope. Both attribute to the work of caregivers and frontline workers during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and also a recognition of the thousands of ways that women of all cultures have provided both healing and hope throughout. And whereas women have served as early leaders advancing movements for social and economic justice, equal opportunity, the right to vote, abolition of slavery, civil rights, human rights, for the environment. And, and whereas there was a long record of local activism in Santa Cruz to support the right opportunity, contributions of women, including an early appearance of separate activist Susan B. Anthony in 19, 1869, to Loretta, Lorette Wood, the first woman city council member and mayor in Santa Cruz in 1971, who advocated for pregnant teachers to not be fired, and the literature of the recently deceased Bell Hook along with outstanding contributions by local women in virtually every area of human endeavor. And whereas despite these incredible contributions that women have made in our world and in our community, their achievements and importance has consistently been undervalued, overlooked social systems and most common records in history. And whereas celebrating the importance of women and their impact in our world every day across the full spectrum of endeavors, science, 
community, government, art, sport, medicine, environment, education, economy, and more has a huge impact on the development of self-respect and opportunity for girls and young women so that they may be inspired to write the next chapters in history. And whereas today, on March 8th, International Women's Day, the theme, Break the Bias, observed honor the cultural, political, socioeconomic achievement of women around the world and throughout history and to cultivate an ongoing commitment to the diversity, equity, and inclusion. And now, therefore, I, Sonia Brunner, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, to hereby proclaim the month of March 2022 as Women's History Month in the City of Santa Cruz and call upon our community and institutions to recognize the incredible contribution women have made and celebrate generations of women who have shaped our history and continue to advance gender equity. I also invite all citizens to visit our Santa Cruz public libraries and local bookstores to learn more about Women's History Month events, important contributions of women in our history. Thank you. All right. Thank you. As we move on, I have a few announcements and we will move to the regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen to the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, please raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not regular updates. Items that will be open for public comment during this meeting are numbers eight, through 20, with the exception of items 18 and 19 on our agenda. I'd like to ask council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. None. I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions and deletions. Sure. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on the closed session. Good afternoon, Mayor Brunner, members of the city council. Uh, the city council met in closed session this morning at 10.30 a.m. via Zoom. Prior to going into closed session, by motion, the council added a real property negotiations item, uh, the property at 915 Cedar Street, the closed session agenda. Uh, items discussed in the closed session were a conference with labor negotiators. The city council received a report from its chief negotiator, Lisa Murphy, uh, concerning labor negotiations involving all bargaining groups. A, there was item three on your agenda is real property negotiations uh, concerning the property at 915 Cedar Street that the council added to the agenda or referred to closed session prior to closed session. Council received a report from Gabe Director to its chief negotiator concerning uh, the potential lease price terms of payment for both. Uh, and lastly, there was an item of pending litigation, a case entitled City of Arcata et al. versus Pacific Gas and Electric Company, 
pending in the San Francisco Superior Court. Council received a report from uh, City Attorney's Office and outside special counsel, Michael Collin Tuno, and there was no reportable act in the closed session. Thank you. The City Council will now review the meeting calendar attached to the agenda and revise it as necessary. I'll call on the City Clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. I have no update. Thank you. Next up is the consent agenda. These are items through 13 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on any of the items 8 through 13. And 8, uh, eight is resolution authorizing the city to continue teleconferencing public meetings. Nine are the minutes of the February 22nd, 2022 City Council meeting. Ten is support for California Senate Bill 843, Taxation Renters Credit. Eleven is Wharf Reinforcement Project Plans. Twelve is the Emergency Escalona Drive Culvert Rehabilitation authorization to award and 13 is the Central Coast Community Energy Member Agency Planning Im Implementation and Innovation Grant Program grant acceptance authorization and appropriation. Please remember to mute your streaming device, raise your hand by calling star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on pull any item? Council member coming? I have a comment for number 10. Item 10, support for California Senate Bill 843, taxation renters credit. Anybody else? Okay. You want to go forward with oh, Council oh. Member Myers. I don't have any other, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have any, I'm, I, I, I would, uh, after you take a more comment. Thank you. Uh, I will, <laughs> I'm seeing hands up. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Council member coming. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to, um, I want to express thanks and appreciation for uh, Maria Elena de la Garza for uh, the action board who brought this to our attention, um, supporting Senate Bill 843 taxation renters credit. Um, this provides, you know, while it's not a lot of support, um, the tax credit hasn't been updated since the 70s. And um, this would provide, while it's not a ton of relief, some tax relief for um, renters who are in that very low um, class. And um, so I also wanted to thank council member uh, Colin Clark Johnson and Mayor for supporting, putting this on the agenda and hopefully uh, our our support for this um, should it pass, taken into account when this is under consideration um, at our state level. So that's all the comments I had. Thank you for your comment, council member coming. Uh, I will now bring it out to public comment. Uh, press star nine to raise your hand 
on any of the consent agenda items 8 through 13. I see attendees, however, no one has their hand raised. Okay. I will bring it back to council. Making sure, all right. I will bring it back to council for motion. I see council member Watson. Um, I'm happy to move the consent agenda or second it if Councilmember Myers wants to make the motion either way. Yep, Councilmember Watkins, why don't you, um, yeah, I'm happy, I'll do the second. Okay, I'll go ahead and move the agendas, item 8 through 13. We have a motion by Councilmember Watkins, seconded by Councilmember Myers, and I'd like to ask the city clerk for a roll call vote. Member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. 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 Brown. Aye. Myers. Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. Mayor Brunner. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next up on our agenda is item number 14, public hearing for small housing units, general plan, downtown plan, local coastal plan, and zoning ordinance update. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you'd like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. Okay, we have I will bring it over now to our planning department. I believe we have Butler here. Is Sarah Noisy also or Matt Ben? Okay. We, Sarah, and potentially Matt, welcome. And I will now hand it to you to present this item. Thanks very much, Mayor Bruner. I'm gonna give a brief introduction to this item and then hand it over to Sarah and Matt. Um, and I, I wanted to um, <clears throat> thank Sarah and uh, Matt and their team for working on this work that stemmed from the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee and the recommendations that came from the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee that had then Mayor Chase as well as Vice Mayor Watkins and um, Council Member Brown, who are Still with us on the council, and um, we um, we had a number of comments that came in from the community, and so I wanted to address a few of those. Sarah's going to go into more detail, but I wanted to sort of broadly address those. There were some concerns about um, additional units that um, could come online as a result of this, and the CEQA implications associated with this. And I just wanted to. Um, note that this number of dwelling units is already allowed under our current regulations um, through the single room occupancy um, allowance. And in fact, single room occupancies, uh, those units can actually be smaller. And so they would actually result in more of those units. And uh, there wouldn't be additional massing associated with this proposal. It would be um, the, the same development standards that apply um, whether or not rules move forward. Um, I, I do think that this is a, a creative approach um, that uh, the team has taken here to 
addressing the direction that came from the housing, uh, that came out of the housing committee and was given as direction from the council um, back in 2018 or so. Um, and I, I also think that this will help us effectuate our general plan and meet our arena targets, um, the regional housing needs assessment targets. Um, they would be subject to the 20% inclusionary ordinance requirements. And um, there were some concerns about, does this, does this meet the needs of family? Um, and at 650 square feet, you can actually get a two bedroom unit in 650 square feet. And so that would allow for smaller families or, um, to, to have a relatively more affordable option, just given the square footage, particularly over time as, um, are, as they come online and as they age. Um, Sarah's gonna speak to you also about some of the details that about what we've got now in our housing stock and what we've got um, uh, with um, the single family and apartment units in our community. Um, and uh, there were some concerns about um, mixed use and uses that um, uh, would or would not be allowed. And, and um, I wanna say that is also a very significant concern that we have and something that we really want to promote is um, maintaining that um, commercial component both so that we can um, retain our um, small businesses as well as for the um, environmental benefits and the health benefits that come along with having um, a uh, commercial and retail and um, job component in close proximity to our housing. Um, I wanna point out that, that these would not, in the commercial uh, community commercial zoning district, residential only projects can be developed right now. And so this would not be changing that. And I think that was some of part of the confusion in the, uh, some of the public comments. So Sarah's gonna speak to that in detail. We are actually requiring a mixed component in other portions in our downtown and in the uh, beach south of the area. And so Sarah will get into those details, um, but wanted to clarify that. And for those folks that are interested in, in, in maintaining that commercial component, our objective standards process, we're gonna be bringing that information forward to the council in the next few months here. And that will be identifying when and where commercial are required, um, when and where uh, live work units um, are required um, or mixed use and when and where residential may be allowed in and of itself. Um, so at its basic level, this new unit type, the flexible density units is pretty similar to the SRO, the single room occupancy units. There are a couple of few differences um, they can't be as small, I mentioned how there's more SROs, um, but they can be larger and be up to 650 square feet, um, which that's what matches with the current small ownership currently allow. Um, it can be rented or sold, which is a little bit different, you know, with SROs, they're just rentals, with SOUs, small ownership units, just ownership. So that's a difference, the ownership status. And then we're also proposing that it can be mixed with other units. And those are the big key differences. And um, hopefully that helps frame the, the detail that we'll get from Sarah as, as she dives into it. I mean, I could just run the presentation and you can just carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, as we mentioned, I am, I'll go through a little, a little bit more detail here, um, and hopefully this will address a lot of the questions. I know we, I read all the correspondence that came in, and so hopefully, um, I do think some of it is kind of misunderstanding what we're proposing, um, so hopefully we can at least clarify those pieces of it um, for everyone today. So I will go ahead and share. Can everyone see that? Okay, great. Um, so just as a refresher, Lee mentioned that we are at this point responding to the direction that we got, excuse me, as part of the housing blueprint work that was done a few years ago. Specifically, this was a um, direction relating to um, housing supply, housing production. The direction was to be 
staff should review state laws relating to efficiency units and compare those city small ownership units and single room occupancy regulations to assess whether city code changes are needed to help promote the production of smaller units and a variety of housing types. So I just want to pause a, a minute here and, and talk about why this might have been part of the direction that was part contained in the housing grant report. Um, the existing housing stock in Santa Cruz is right around 75% two bedrooms and larger. And the remainder, those smaller units, are zero and one bedroom, right? So studios and one bedroom. That represents a pretty decent mismatch with our demographic trends in which, um, according to our housing element, which, you know, our housing element is pulling from data from 2010. So I think this trend has probably increased in the last, you know, census cycle. But we had over 30% of our households were single people. They were people living alone in, in over a third of our households. And um, then there is some, you know, other component that's also, you know, two-person families, couples, single parents. Um, and so there really is a need in our community for meeting that demand for people who are interested in living alone and not living alone, right? um, or being able to rent exactly as much space as they're actually to use and occupy. So I, I think that is a key piece of why all units are a component that we need to catch up on. We haven't been meeting that demand very well. Um, it doesn't make sense to meet that demand with a single family home. And a lot of our, you know, land is, land is dedicated towards that in Santa Cruz. So um, this is one more tool that we're proposing to kind of add to the toolbox. All of these small unit types could really address some of that need for these small households. So let's go into a little bit more background definition. So we have two existing in our code today. We have two types of small units. We have something called a small ownership unit, which is a local unit type. It was created here in Santa Cruz um, a little over 15 years ago. It requires that it's a full dwelling, so it has a full set of habitability features, a full kitchen, a full bathroom. Um, the way the code is written now, the intention is that these units will be for sale, and so the way that's modified is that a minimum of 50% of the units have to be for sale. You can't rent more than 50% of the units at, at any given moment. Um, these units are a little bit larger than sort of like really micro units. So they, the SOUs range from 400 square feet all the way up to 650 square feet. Um, they're currently limited to having only one bedroom. And there is no density limit that applies to these. So this unit type that exists today um, is regulated by site standards. That's how projects determines how much, um, how many units can fit on a site. They have height, they have setbacks, they have a floor area ratio, um, they have parking standards, they have open space standards, and all of those things kind of come together to determine how many units can be built on a site. Um, the single room occupancy is our other type of small unit. This type of, an, a single room occupancy or an SRO is a type of housing that you will find all over the country. Um, they've been in place for many, many decades um, and kind of come out of a history of, you know, needing transitory housing, lodging houses, um, but then they also have kind of progressed as, um, as needs have shifted to being sort of an entry-level housing unit in, in some of our tighter urban housing markets um, throughout the country. So um, SROs can sometimes be as, as like really kind of set up like a dorm room where it's a very small unit and then they share a kitchen and a bathroom facility. In our code, we have a cutoff at um, 200, uh, 220 square feet, where as soon as the units are 220 square feet or larger, sorry, there's a siren outside, um, they have to contain a full set of habitability features. So um, after 220 square feet, every unit has to have its own kitchen, its own bathroom, but when the units are smaller than that, they aren't required to have that full set of features. Um, these units, typically throughout the country, they're rented, and they're smaller. In our code, we require that the, the largest they can be, we allow them to be as 400 square feet, and in a project, a development proposal, they have to have an average of 345 square feet or smaller. Um, and these also have currently no density limit, and they're regulated, again, by you know, site standards. 
determine how many units are built on a property. So just to give you some examples, this is um, an SOU project that was built, so you can kind of see how, um, you know, kind of get a sense of what 640 square feet might look like. That's over here on the left, and then a smaller studio apartment, 440 square feet over here. So these are studios and smaller one-bedroom units. And then this is an example of an SRO um, hitting right around 250 square feet. So you can see that this is significantly smaller, right? And this is a full unit, has a, a kitchen and a bathroom, um, but is really intended for occupancy by one or maybe two people. So um, we looked at both the existing SRO code and the existing SOU code. And in general, it seems like the SRO code is functioning pretty well getting project proposals that are seeking to use it sort of a few every few years um, and those projects being built and um, you know running relatively successfully so we're not proposing any major changes to that section of the existing municipal code there are two places where we want to add some clarifying amendments to sort of codify our existing practice and and state explicitly some things that are currently on uh, not stated explicitly so the first is um, to codify that there is no density established for SROs. Um, currently, the municipal code is simply silent. There is just no density that's ever established anywhere, and we think it would just be more clear to say explicitly there is no density. They're regulated by site standards. Um, so we're proposing to add that text to the code. And then we also would like to codify that these can only be rented. These units cannot be part of a subdivision um, or a tentative map. Be sold off as a condominium, and that has been our practice uh, historically. Um, proposing to codify that and um, lock it in at this point. Conversely, um, the small ownership units, the SOUs, have been a little bit more challenging. We've seen two projects um, in the city in the last, you know, 15 years. They were sort of created in our code. Um, looking around for other examples of type of housing. This feature about it requiring owner ownership was not something we were able to sort of find anywhere else represented. Um, so uh, we're proposing to take a look at that as one of the challenges. We're also, these types of units have been critiqued by the community as sort of creating monocultures where you just get like extensive projects that are just one type of unit. Um, and you know, why can't they be mixed in with other sizes and styles of units? mixed income, you know, mixed household size kind of a development. Um, and then also, you know, when SOUs were created, they offered some incentives for development. They required a lower parking standard. Um, they sort of incentivized uh, creating ownership housing. There, if the feeling at the time was there was really a demand for that. Um, and then, and those incentives have sort of been whittled away at. We've made changes to our parking ordinance, so there's really no benefit that's provided to SOUs. They're not getting any, you know, incentive in terms of parking. They're now at the same level of parking as other units of better studios or one bedroom. Um, we're also also seeing a shift in the market. Now there really is more demand for rental housing, and so um, we're looking for ways to um, allow developers to meet that demand. And then also, Again, I think we're, we're interested in um, creating communities where we have a mix of housing types and income status and family sizes. Um, we just think that creates more vibrant, interesting communities. So our proposal, the proposal that's in front of you and so was recommended by the Planning Commission, is to replace the existing small ownership units with flexible density units. So we would... Um, address the challenges of that 50% um, for sale requirement, um, the inability to mix other unit types. Those are really the big land use changes. And then there are some other um, minor issues that we're going to come up at the same time. So um, what are the key changes? We kind of, uh, mentioned some of these at the beginning. Um, the proposed flexible density units could be fully rented or sold. And they could be rented by the developer. They could be sold to private owners and then rented the same way that we treat all other types of housing units. Um, we're proposing to make a slight change to the size so that flexible density units would come down and sort of meet SROs where, where the SRO code currently requires a full set of habitability features at that 220 square foot mark. Um, we would let flexible 
density units be as small as that potentially, and then the upper limit from small ownership units. So these would be between 220, 650 square feet size. Um, they can mix with other size units. I think that's one of the key changes we heard about that community. So we would allow um, projects to, you know, meet the density that they're allowed zoning um, to, you know, build out two bedrooms, three bedrooms, one bedroom units, which are often subject to slightly um, higher density standards than two bedrooms, three bedrooms. And then any space that's left in the development in the, um, within the site standards potentially be used for flex density units to add a few units um, and kind of fill out the project. Um, one other key thing to mention here that I forgot to put a bullet about is um, we are proposing to remove the existing standard that limits these units to only one bedroom. We think there's a big opportunity here to allow for small bedroom units to meet the needs of couples, single parents, um, you know, seniors who are downsizing and maybe still want to maintain, or you know, empty nesters that are downsizing and maintain space for, you know, um, kids to come home at some point. So uh, that also helps us address some issues where, um, you know, we have some of these large, like 600, 600 to 650 square foot units. You'll see, um, start to see on site plans spaces that are labeled like study or lounge. And um, the reality is they end up being used as sleeping space, but they're not being built as sleeping space. And so there are safety concerns that go along with that. Like every space that's identified for a sleeping space needs to be built under the building code to have egress in case of an emergency. And so um, it just puts us in this position where we're kind of like trying to find ways, to, you know, to work with developers to make sure that, you know, we're only seeing one bedroom and how are we making sure that this other space isn't really going to be used for sleeping. And it's just, um, it's very clunky to regulate things like that, and proposing to not state the limit and let, Know, let the market kind of decide if these are going to be studios, one bedroom, or even actually two bedroom units. Um, so a few other things that we are proposing to add into this um, new unit type that aren't currently required for small ownership units. We're going to add a requirement for laundry facilities on site that was mentioned in our community meeting. And so we hold, um, there's a requirement for shared laundry facilities already exist for single room occupancy. So we just Hold that language in for the flexible density units. Um, we're also requiring that, stating that flexible density units can only be used when the project has a minimum of three units. We just want to be sure that these really are um, being used to fill out multi-family or mixed-use style development, that they're not somehow being used to build like a funny, small, single-family home on a, a downtown lot or something like that. Um, removing the explicit bedroom uh, limit. And then we're keeping the zone districts where these are allowed the same. So these four zone districts are the only four zone districts in the city where single room occupancy units are currently are allowed today. And the only four um, zone districts where small, uh, small ownership units have been allowed. We're going to proposing that flexible density units only be allowed in those same locations. I'm going to show you a map in a second. And the one thing we are proposing to add, which is not currently in the code, is a requirement for mixed use in three out of zoning districts. So the RTC is kind of our beach commercial area. The central business district is the downtown. And the CBDE is the area south of rural. And so in those places, like that's really our commercial core of our city. And so we want to be sure that there is a mixed use component that is included there. Um, the CC zone district stretches way out into all of our other, um, lots of other neighborhoods. So the CC is shown here on, in pink on this map. And you can see it extends along Mission, along Water and Hotel. There are pockets of it up along River Street and um, in the Coral Street neighborhood over there. And then all up, up Ocean as well. Excuse me. Um, and so in these areas, um, there is already an allowance for mixed use. There is, um, for a mixed-use project to happen in the CC zone district, uh, it requires a larger parcel. So it's only allowed on parcels that are 8,000 square feet or larger. Um, and so we just didn't want to limit flexible density units, saying they could only be used in those projects. Um, thought it made sense to allow them 
everywhere in the zone district, even on smaller parcels, in the same way that SROs are currently allowed in all of those locations without requiring a mixed use component in the CC. There are several standards in here that are moving straight from the SOU code into the FDU proposal without any change. So there would be no specifically assigned density standard. Um, the open space requirements are staying the same. We did add a caveat about how some of that open space has to be for shared facilities. So, and that again, pulling a little bit from the existing SRO codes requires a common indoor space and common outdoor open space um, of minimum sizes. So added that component, but the overall requirement of 150 square feet of open space it is staying the same. They'll still be required to have one parking space per unit. The inclusionary standard is not proposed for a change. And again, as I mentioned, they're being allowed in the same four zone district. Um, lastly, we got several comments about this. The density bonus process is not changing as this. Our existing density bonus project requires that a developer bring in a fully conforming set of plans. So what we're, what we're looking at here is a portion of the front riverfront project that applied for a 35% density bonus. And what we see on the top is that conforming base project. So this is the project that meets all of the zoning standards, all of the area plan standards, and is the downtown plan, and any standards that may come out of the general plan. We use that to determine how many units fit on the property, and then that number of units is the number that we use for calculating the bonus. So you can just you can see the change from the, the top picture, which is showing you the conforming base project, and then the project proposal that was approved, which is the density bonus project. So um, in this case, they added um, a little over one floor of height. You know, so some buildings went up more than that, but the overall height that was went from um, six stories to seven stories for the project overall, and that aspect of our process and development regulations does not propose change at all. Um, this move from SOUs to FDU. Um, in changing this nomenclature, we are proposing to then change the text of our general plan and downtown plan to reflect that. Um, and we're not proposing any other changes to the standards that are contained in those plans or the permissions that are required. Um, for development of this type. So we did two community outreach events last year. Um, we had a, held a focus group with um, lenders and developers to sort of hear what their concerns and interests were. They, they expressed some interest uh, in being able to mix the units um, and potentially have projects that have like several two bedroom units in them and then have you know uh, some additional studio apartments as well. Um, they felt like that could help make some projects that are currently don't really make sense uh, for you know redevelopment start to make sense and you know, start to be places where we really could add to the housing stock. Um, they did have some questions and concerns about the open space requirement. Um, felt like it was kind of high, and they were also concerned about parking requirements, which should not be a surprise to anyone. Parking is very expensive to provide, and we are not providing. Um, with these types of units, any concessions around parking right now. Um, we held a community meeting as well. And uh, during that meeting, we also heard concerns about parking. We heard concerns from some people that um, there was not enough parking that would be required for these units. We heard concerns from other people that there was too much parking that was being required for these units. They are in these, you know, intended to be sort of, you know, downtown and in our commercial core areas where, you know, places are within walking distance, jobs are with walking services. Um, so we kind of had both sides on that. We did hear a desire for increased amenities and, you know, including laundry, storage, common space. We actually went back and um, added those in in response to that community comment. Um, and then we heard a lot of concern just around rent prices and um, the ongoing housing crisis to where we find ourselves and, um, you know, the ongoing cost of market rate housing. We went to the Planning Commission last month and uh, discussed this uh, proposal with them after we had done some work with the Planning Commission subcommittee to uh, get the ordinance um, into a place where they could support it. So 
So the planning commission recommended the conversation there with the planning commission focused a lot on um, the aspect of allowing flexible density units to mix with other density, uh, other sizes, styles of units. Um, so just to be clear about what that means, like our existing zoning code creates a building envelope, which is what we see here in the illustration on the upper right. A building envelope is an imaginary square box that's set based on the other site standards, so setback, building height. Um, if there's a floor area ratio, that also factors in, into that. And then development proposals come in and they fit within that box in some manner. Um, and so allowing flexible density units mixed with other size units, what that could potentially do is that in these, in these commercial locations where these units would be allowed, we could see a developer that could max out their density that's allowed as two bedrooms or three bedrooms or you know, one bedroom. Um, and then if there's any remaining building, they could add more units so we could get more housing built within that existing envelope. So without going taller, without reducing setback, um, we could fit in more housing. We would still have a parking requirement for all of that. So it is sort of a step in the direction, a midway toward a more form-based standard for these residential and mixed-use uses in, in those locations. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we, we do think this could make redevelopment a little more feasible for some projects and allow them to really start creating this housing stock that we need. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, in all cases, SROs still represent the maximum development density that could be you know, created anywhere. Those units could be smaller, and then they are required to not go over a certain median size, um, average size. And um, FDUs cannot be that small. They're limited to only 220 square feet as opposed to 150 square feet. So um, they're a little bit less dense uh, than SROs are allowed to be, which are already allowed today and have been for 40, 50 years. So, um, and then as I mentioned, the base density calculations for the density bonus are not changing. That is, that process is staying exactly as it exists today. Um, so ultimately, the Planning Commission voted, passed a motion recommending that we allow mixing and help use this housing type to promote housing for small households. So our next step after today, there will be a second reading. It's an ordinance amendment. Uh, it requires a second reading. Um, at that second reading, we will be bringing a resolution for um, submitting to the Coastal Commission. So Coastal Commission review will have to take place on the downtown plan and the um, ordinance amendments, which are a component of the local coastal program. And then um, should the ordinance be adopted, uh, it will take effect outside the coastal zone 30 days after final approval and then inside the coastal zone at the time that the Commission approves the proposed ordinance. So I actually have a little markup of the recommended motion um, just to acknowledge the general plan is not currently part of our local program. So um, the, all of the changes that you see here, the strikeouts and underlines are just acknowledging that the downtown plan and the ordinance, ordinance are part of the local coastal program. The general plan is not. So um, our recommendation is that yeah, your council pass a motion to approve the resolutions amending the general, town, general plan and downtown plan. The amendment to the downtown plan will also constitute an amendment to the local coastal program to reflect the elimination of small ownership unit use and the addition of the new flexible density use. Introduced for publication an ordinance amending Title 24 of the municipal code regulating small housing units, including replacing small ownership units with flexible density units and making minor clarifying amendments to single room regulations. And then lastly, direct staff to submit the approved ordinance to the Coastal Commission for review following the second reading should the ordinance be adopted as part of the second reading, as well as the changes to the downtown plan as changes to the local program. And we're available for any questions. Thank you for that presentation, Sarah. Council members have questions for planning. Uh, Council member Myers and then Council And you're muted, Councilmember 
but that was great. Cleared up, cleared up a lot of it. I just wanted to. So you, Steve said that SRE available built own district, but there was a restriction that lots had to be houses. So I'd have a lot basically to build SROs or. Just um, no, sorry, that was about mixed use projects. So currently in the CC zone district, in order to do mixed use, so both commercial and housing together, you need 8,000 square feet of lot size. What is the change that you're proposing or not for? That's say the We are proposing no change. Okay, great. And then you have the demographic about Mention that housing type that thought out risk during the but for a way that you were able to identify demographic that looked at this or curious about how it identified it as highly sought. Um, so that's just based on um, our census demographic, which um, they're in our. I'm looking at our housing element. Um, with the statistics that I cited, which you know our housing element was last written in 2015, so you know these statistics are not up to the minute. But um, you know that it, this says 31.7 percent of households are living alone, um, okay. and you know, and just looking at like the size of the housing we have and the size of our households, be a little bit of a mismatch. And I will just also say, I mean, just, no one's going to force anyone to live in a smaller unit if that's not what they're seeking, right? But this does sort of just create a choice and an option that isn't really well provided right now. And then my last, that's helpful. Um, my last question was, so we did get a lot of communication. Um, this is all kind of all brand new and I appreciate the introduction. They sort of placing this with housing. I think sometimes, I know I lose track of the fact Housing blue were walk in around the background that work in the uh, there is from the our time on it that guys work through all of those glad that, again just kind of going back at work coordinating effort that went on with folks that really just up on all the different aspects. Last year, we really shown that a lot of this components fighting us. Um, on the SOE coordinate, um, you mentions in the staff report that um, so it seemed that seems the market in the, mentioned this a little bit in the presentation. Um, do any more deep dives and you know, done those projects either in other places or just evaluating done here? Were you able to take the time to? Individually, or um, about about what about the um, you know the fact that really there's only been two projects this whole occupancy ship unit and I know we're you know the proposal is electrical unit type but I'm just curious if there was a deeper dive at all around those projects and why they maybe yeah so we did actually have um, both of the developers of that of the two existing projects um, participated in our developer focus group and um, the financing is really tricky this is kind of what it comes down to if um, if the developer can't be certain that they're going to put all of the units on the market for sale at once, um, it 
just gets a little bit tricky once you start renting them. You get into this really difficult place of like, well, now there's too many units being rented, and banks won't lend borrowers to buy units in a project that's like mostly rented. So, I mean, what we heard from the um, the developer focus group was that you know SOUs can work when they're small projects. That's what, at least according to the group of folks we had come in, that you know under 20 units, like a dozen, maybe 15 units, that's a project that could maybe pencil out for SOUs. Um, but that's like a pretty small project. Honestly, we don't see that many projects that are only doing a dozen units. You know, like the, the cost of construction right now is really pushing development towards larger projects so they can like get that margin. And so that, um, you know, that's a component of that as well. Do you think, I mean, is there any way to understand, um, I mean, I think that that designation, you know, on the, you know, ink, ink blobs that go kind of off into all the different directions into town. Um, but the flexible density, I mean, there's interest in, there's some interest in big projects, but there's also, also a lot of interest in smaller projects, you know, and I know that the cost margin is, cost of production is driving. have the pencil, right? Nobody's in the, not going to be able to basically build a for a project fancy. But do, I mean, so there's part about, you know, flexible on help with right? kind of smaller project that may versus going going bigger five six. have any that kind of talk or is there a way to kind of understand you know this new type of you know new type of uh, basically categorization of how people develop and scale and the Uh, yeah, so I, I can I can try to speak to that. Um, so we're not we're not doing anything with this ordinance that would change the development envelope, right? Mm -hmm. um, when we come back in a few months with our objective standards, we are going to be talking about things that are pushing on that development envelope, different ways that affect the design of buildings. Um, we think that this development type, this unit type, could be useful in some of these smaller projects. And maybe it would take them from, you know, a max potential development of like, you know, 15 to 70 units. Maybe they could fit in 20 or 21 or 22 units um, if they can really sort of fill in that development envelope in a different way. Um, so. I don't think that's going to tip the scales on every single one of these small projects. I mean, the reality is a 5,000 square foot lot is hard to develop. It's hard to park. That's really what it comes down to. The parking yeah. is just it's real squishy. Um, those are always going to be challenging, those sites. And, and um, we do think there are some locations where this could really help developers, like, get that little bit of extra density that makes the project work without seeking a full density bonus, which then saves our, our site standard, right? So this is sort right. of like a step in between to maybe help some of that happen a little bit better. Um, you know, and th there's no silver bullet, right, when it right. comes to housing. There's a, a lot of challenges um, in the market, but I see that my um, superiors are here and they may have something to weigh in with. It's kind of the dollar question. It's the thing I think then not to discuss with how do we create that, you know, that acknowledgement that we will have taller buildings potentially in the future, but also how do those integrate with, you know, maybe, you know, developments that have a little bit more uh, of a smaller, more, you know, it's that diversity, right? Not going spray and spray everywhere, but maybe some interest by 
developers and owners or maybe they are looking If, if I could, um, Council Member Myers, I would also, I, I agree with the comments that Sarah mentioned. I think one of the impacts that this could have is you know, developers are typically seeking to maximize that building on the boat, right? They, they've got developable area, um, but if they can't mix the units, then in all likelihood, maximize that developable area. If they've got a DU per acre, a, sorry, a dwelling unit per acre cap, then they're going to have larger units. And what this will allow for is you know, instead of having a, a 1600 square foot um, in a project, they may have a uh, 1200 square foot unit and allow for a 400 square foot FDU, a flexible density unit. And so that's going to provide some of that diversity that you were talking about there for Myers. And it could actually allow for projects to cancel out um, as Sarah was going to. Uh, Mayor Breer had a slip away, so I will go ahead and move us along. So we'll go ahead and move on to Council Member Cummings. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that presentation. Um, first question I have is that um, one of the things that was stated that you know, this would lead towards relatively more affordable options. I'm just curious because I did, while this conversation was happening, I actually went on looked at 555 Pacific, one of our more recent developments in the community. And right now, studios there are going for 2,800 one bedrooms are $3,445 a month. Which means that if you want to rent a studio and it's 30% of your income, you need to be making $9,333 a month or $112,000 a year. And if you want a one bedroom, you need to make about $11,483 a month, which equates to about $113,500. So I'm just curious, um, you know, when we're trying to make units more affordable and bring in more affordable housing, we look what the cost of these smaller units are, really not. This isn't really helping to address our affordability issue. So I'm just kind of wondering if you can speak more to how this is going to help with affordability when what we're seeing in terms of smaller units is built, not, we're not really reaching. Yeah, of course. That's a super important question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so there are several components to housing policy that affect affordability, right? We have um, subsidies, so direct payments to tenants. This is our Section 8 programs. This is like um, our first-time homebuyer programs, things like that that put money directly into the pockets of buyers and renters. We have um, stability, which is ensuring that housing that exists in the market that, that has, carries a um, Ability restriction is some of that like naturally occurring affordable housing um, that that sticks around and that that stays affordable for the rent for the um, occupants that are currently there and for occupants that may come in the future, right? So those, those are two pieces of the puzzle. And the third piece upon which all of this depends is supply. So the supply of housing units does not by itself create affordability and we are not going to get to affordability without new supply of housing units. If you look at like when the housing was built in Santa Cruz County, um, well over half of it is um, built prior to 1980. So we have an aging housing stock, not replacing the housing stock um, and building new housing in every decade to house, um, you know, the generations that are coming. So there's, so there's that piece of it. And then the other piece to just sort of remember and understand is that all new housing, when it's new, is going to be at the top of the market. That's just, that's how capitalism works, honestly. I mean, that's just, the this is the envelope we live in, right? Like, this is just our reality is that developers are a business. If they can't make five and a half percent yield on a project, they're not going to build it, right? We're not going to get any new housing created. And so what we're talking about here is the ability to pay market rate rates for a unit, 
basically purchase what's important to you. Is it important to you to live in a new unit? Okay, have some new units in mind. Is it important for you to live by yourself? Maybe we can mix out an option. So what we're talking about here are creating more options in the housing market. If you were to take those, you know, look at a, a projects that were built around the same time that are larger units, um, my guess is that the cost per square foot is going to be pretty similar, right? And so what we're tell what we're saying here is that with smaller units, people have to pay for square feet. And so we're giving them that choice to do that. Matt, anything you wanted to add? No, I think you hit that on the head, Sarah. I, I was just going to say that you know, while we can't guarantee that this would create a more affordable option, uh, it's certainly likely that a 350 square foot uh, studio would be cheaper than a 500 square foot one, or a you know 500 square foot one bedroom would be cheaper than a 700 square foot one. Uh, so that's where what we're really trying to add to that that mix, creating those housing types. Uh, and a variety of them in the city. Thanks. And I guess one of my concerns, and maybe speak to this, is that you know, with the inclusionary requirements we have, I guess my understanding based on this ordinance is that there's really nothing. This would have passed, right? And within a mixed use development, there's a potential to put in um, units that are as small as 220 square feet. There's really nothing preventing a developer from having all those 220 square feet. Is that correct? Uh, so the inclusionary units have to be the same average size as the market rate units. That's standard in our inclusionary ordinance. That's helpful. And, and for density bonus projects as well. Okay. Um, those are pretty much all the questions that I have. I have some comments, so I'll share it later. Uh, thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, Council Member Brown? Mayor, um, thank you, Sarah, for the presentation and trying to make uh, the, these changes and you know, make our, our zoning code legible to us, <laughs> the, the layperson and to council members who, um, at least in my case, no matter how much I study this and read the materials, still feel kind of lost. Um, so I do have a couple of questions. Um, I'm I'm trying to understand, how, like I, I, so what I've been doing is trying to use an example to play out how this would work. Um, and so I'm gonna, if I could, just try to do that. Ask if I'm on the right track, and you can stop me if I'm saying something here. Um, so as I understand it, then um, we think about run through an example, and I'm I'm using kind of the, the basis for this came from a member of the public sent in comments um, on an. So in an acre lot, let's say we have an acre lot um, zoned, currently zoned with a density limit of 40 units per acre. I'm just, this is a hypo, hypothetical. Um, developer proposes a project with 40 larger units that don't met, meet the FDU um, definition. And then an additional 100 units that would be FDUs with, with the proposed change. Um, so now we have potentially 150 units on uh, one acre. 100 of those units, because they do not count towards the density limit, are just not, they're, they're not counted. They're counted in certain ways, but not in others, yes. Um, so now let's, we have 140 units, 40 of which um, meet the zoning, the current zoning. And then that project developer applies for a density bonus. That's what I'm trying to understand because you're talking about how, you know, we're trying to use this as a, um, you know, kind of that in-between space where a density bonus might not 
requested, and so those rules wouldn't apply. Um, but they, it, I, I don't see anything that says they can't in the materials I've read. So at that point, we're at 140 units. Um, a developer applies for a dental bonus at 50%. They get to use, even though they're, they're not counted, that 100 units towards the density limit, they then have 140 units with a 50% density bonus. Now we're at 210 units. 210 units, once the dense, and they request a density bonus, that means that all of those site standards, which hearing um, will control to some extent the building envelope, not, not lead to an additional massing, must be waived. The developer requests it. Okay. So now we have 210 units on <laughs> an acre, and of that, because you can only um, apply inclusionary unit requirements to the base, the developer would be required to give us eight units inclusionary. Okay. Uh, an additional, and I, I'm so terrified, I, I, I've never been, even on paper, I can't figure it out with the formulas for different waivers and concessions, but um, some additional units, some percentage, uh, in order to get the density bonus. But essentially, there's a possibility that get a project that big that would have maybe, um, you know, instead of the eight portable units, 10, 12 units that would, could, could legally require. So we're talking about less than 10% affordability project. So am I, am I missing something here? Yeah, several things. So let's Thank get you. into it. Yeah, Please. totally. Okay, so first of all, this is, I think this is like a really interesting example that we don't, I wish I had like, I wish I could do like computer graphics and draw it all out. So the first thing, the very first thing to think about is the site standards that we currently have in our code, I set back, parking, open space, all the things. Uh, for the most part, with the exception, like let's forget for a second that our general plan isn't implemented. Like think about all the other places where a general plan is Forming, which is most of the city, um, the site standards we have pretty well match density that you can develop. So I cannot think of a situation where you could have a density of 40 units, max that out, you know, 700 square foot units that are, that are two bedrooms, whatever, and park it and have 50% of your development and local remaining. That is, there is not a situation that would create that. Okay, so our, our height limit in the CC zone district is three stories. Um, the setbacks are based on what, what the neighboring parcels are, you know, otherwise they're zero. The housing requires one or two parking spaces per unit. Parking takes up a lot of space. Each of those develop, each of those housing units is gonna have to have somewhere between 100 and 180 square feet of open space. So like you have to fit all of that in on your site. It's, and then, oh, go ahead. Just really quickly, because this is where I'm confused. Um, except for, you can't require any of those standards if density. Right, so let's, we're, we're getting, we haven't gotten to density bonus okay. yet. So let's just yeah. set that aside for a second. We will get to it. So let's put a pin in it. Because this is really, really important. I think this is what people fail to understand about the density bonus. And I understand why, right? Like, I understand this is a technical process. Because the first step in getting a, doing a density bonus application is bringing in a fully conforming project. So um, you have to bring in a project that meets every one of our development standards. Only three stories tall. It, you know... 130 center, it shows the mission style architecture, right? It's meeting all of the density, all of the zoning standards that we have, and you fit whatever number of units into it. So we have a one acre site that can fit 40 units. That's like pound style density. Um, have to park the whole thing. You have to show us that how this is a fully conforming project. Then. The proposal would say, if there's anything left in that density bonus, it's not, I'm sorry, not density. If there's anything left in that building envelope, you can fit in a couple of extra units of flexible density units. You still have to park them. 
still have to provide open space. You still have to, like, meet all this other stuff. So um, you're not going to double the size of your project in doing that. You know, you're going to max out. Like, if a developer really wants to, like, maximize their profit, they're going to, like, build out as many big units as they can do, right? And like Lee said, you might shrink the size a little bit if you want to fit in a couple more units, but you're still building within that three-story and building envelope, and you still have to park every one of the units. You're, we're not giving anybody a break on parking these units or open space. So I think that's going to be pretty hard. So once you have, and so now here's now the density bonus. So let's say you've got 40 units per acre. Let's be like ambitious about it, and let's say they add 15 units. FD. I think that's like on the high end based on, you know, thinking about building plans and, you know, what things could actually fit in. So now we've got, now we have a base project instead of being 40 units, it's 65 units. That's the, then the base density for the density bonus, right? So yes, it's a little higher, right? The point of this is to add a little more housing. Um, it's not twice as high, it's not three times as high, right? So only after the, only if when the density bonus is put in and we take that 65 and make it 90, whatever the density bonus is we're seeking, only then do we start waiving our, our site stamp. So the FDUs could be built as part of a conforming project with density bonus. You know? And another thing, every density bonus project is different too. Um, some projects are really using density bonus just to get the reduction in parking, and they're not adding any additional height. Others are, you know, doing the whole shebang. They're asking for parking reduction. They're adding the height. They're, like, reducing the setback. They're, like, really trying to, like, push it out. But every one of them is a unique, different situation. So I would, I, thanks, Sarah. Uh, the couple things I would add, um, one, that base project is also what the inclusionary is applied to. Right. So in Sarah's example with 55 DU, wouldn't be the 20% of 40, the 20% of 55. Okay. So while those numbers were exaggerated in the example from the community member, um, which is understandable because there there is that you know that concern out there, but that even in that exaggerated example, it would be 20% um, of the 150, right? So it wouldn't be at the eight units, 20% of 40. It would be the 20% of that. That that becomes the base, um, and. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that was the case, that, that was clear. And these can also be done, you know, more units can be done with the single room occupancy, right? And that was what we were talking about before, is you can even have more because it's at, what, 125 square feet, Sarah, the base? Or, um, 150. 150, minimum. thank you. 150 for the smallest um, Okay, thank you. Helpful clarification. And that was, yeah. <laughs> Most of my questions were wrapped up in that. Again. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, Council Member Kellen Tari Johnson. Thank you. Um, trying to wrap my brain around where, <laughs> where I am. I think some of my questions were asked. Um, first of all, thank you for, for bringing this to us. I know it's a lot of um, information that you had to um, boil down and narrow, narrow it down for us. So I appreciate that. Um, I guess I'll just, I'll just ask this question that some community members who um, uh, sent letters and communicated with us indicated that, that these types of flexible density units um, have not been implemented in other communities and haven't been tested in other communities. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. How, what have we seen in other communities? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. So uh, as we mentioned, we do think this is kind of a creative approach. So we have not seen exactly this proposal elsewhere. And there are lots of places that never density. They use a form-based code, right? So they control the size and shape and position of a building on a parcel, and then they, you know, let whatever uses go in, go in. And so um, there's, 
there are many examples of that um, around the country. There are also lots of places that have micro unit development standards, which um, those are a little bit more akin to um, SROs. But this idea of like mixing studio apartments with larger size units, you'll see that in lots of places that, you know, just use encourage like mixed income development. Like there, if there are places that have like specific standards around mixed income development, sometimes you'll see that where they will mix the unit sizes a lot and you'll end up with studios and two bedrooms, one bedroom, three bedrooms, four bedrooms. And um, in fact, a lot of affordable housing projects do that because they're pulling from multiple funding sources so they have to meet these different um, demands. And so this, that's not a new idea, allowing you know, unit types together. What we're talking about is like trying to address the way that we regulate density to allow a little bit more flexibility, um, you know, without going over that limit that was, you know, studied in our general plan EIR, like the, that maximum is still the SROs. We're not touching that. We're not adding more capacity than would be allowed under that standard. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think these units, they, there are lots of places that are working around micro units and bringing new stuff online. And, you know, it's a mix. It's really dictated by, like, what's the market, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they, I think these are units that work really well for certain demographics and don't work well for others. And so what we're talking about is, like, letting part of other styles of development as well so that there can be just a few of these units. It doesn't have to just be a massive, like, hundreds of these small units all Okay, and, and um, I, mean, I think you sort of touched on this, but how, how does this, uh, as we're looking at um, diving into our housing element in the next year or so, how does this like queue us up or, or, or work into that process? That's a great if, question. If it does, I don't. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so as you are, are without aware, we are uh, gonna be working towards meeting our regional housing needs allocation um, that's, you know, dependent on creating a whole bunch of housing units. So we do believe that this is, could be one tool in our toolbox to like help us meet those numbers. Um, in terms of, you know, exactly how and what to be, I think that's something that we're still um, figuring out and we're figuring out how we're gonna, you know, estimate for these kind of units. Um, but it does seem like there's some interest in the developer community in like allowing something like this. And so um, we're pretty optimistic that this could really help us in sort of getting to our arena and, and building it out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Council Member Cumming. I think part of my question was answered related to have we seen this in other cities? Um, because it'd just be interesting to know, like, you know, if there's communities of, you know, similar geographic location, like beach communities in California that have, they allow for these kinds of units built with like 220 square feet and how much those units are going for. I think that would be helpful um, to inform kind of, you know, what, what are those costs? Like another, because the numbers I brought before, the size of those units and the you know, with the studios at five by five Pacific, um, eight hundred. That's a four hundred four forty square foot unit, and then the one bedroom is six hundred sixty. So that's pretty small width, and it's you know well beyond anything that's affordable for most working. Um, The other question I had just gave um, Sorry. Um, if I have it, I'll ask in the next session. I know that we've been discussing this topic. Um, but, oh, this came back to me. So what is the potential? Because if, if, the, if the goal is to try to fill up the amount of affordable housing, what potential is there to set feed restrictions around I mean, one of the things I've heard this notion of if you build it over time, it will be more affordable. But I think it was last year, maybe the year before, we had an issue where Cypress Point was trying to 
build some more units and when we were looking at the rents at that location because the ownership had changed uh, some of these older units were actually not any more affordable um, due to their age and a lot of that when we were having this discussion it was discussed well they're not being restricted so therefore unless units are restricted then they, they won't be necessarily affordable over long periods of time so i'm just wondering if the goal is to get more affordable housing with this proposal what opportunities are there to have smaller units be restricted as part of the ordinance are you you're looking to create a new housing type that's age restricted all units well if we're if we're saying you know there's flexible density units or flexible units that can go from 220 to 600 uh square feet what opportunities are there to say units below x size must be deemed restricted affordable because otherwise you know, there's nothing that guarantees units are going to be affordable moving forward i mean we just saw 300 square foot house sell for a million dollars right so the one would think that if you have this smaller house, it's older, that it would be affordable, but in fact, not. And area, what else comes with those units? So I'm just trying to figure out how we can actually create something that's affordable, knowing that um, in the absence of having leadership, that I mean, we can build many new studios as we want, but if they're all going for a hundred dollars a month that's not really providing an affordable unit thanks thanks for that question uh council member cummings uh i think the key here is that we still have our inclusionary 20 percent requirement and these units would still be subject to that requirement uh, so in sarah's example for instance uh say a project that right now do 17 units that now goes to 22 that that's one full additional inclusionary unit um, that that's deed restricted affordable that would be on the market um, with with that project so we would certainly see in addition to just adding housing units itself you know, incremental uh, increases in those inclusionary units as well through this process one thing i'll just add to that i would be um, i would be a little bit hesitant to, to um Say that all units below a certain size have to be affordable. I I'd want to think about that and a bit of analysis on that because it seems like um, you know our current like the the current standard that we have for inclusionary and restrict, speed restricting units is that they have to match in size the market rate units, and I think there are good reasons for that. So um, that's just that's a piece I'd like to give a little bit more thought to if. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, I had a question that I'm uh, was also brought forward, and I'm still not quite clear the intent of the uh, SLU ordinance increased ownership opportunities. And um, uh, so the revision here to eliminate the ownership requirement. Can you talk a little bit about, about that more? Yeah, sure. So yeah, so the, when the uh, small ownership units were originally created, um, the idea was that they were gonna create something that was similar to an SRO, but sold. And create some, you know, home ownership opportunities, opportunities for folks, um, you know, who are single people or or of lower modest means to sort of get on the property ladder. Um, and I think, you know, that was a great intention. And um, the issue is that it just not has, it just has not come to pass. Right? Like it just has not worked out the way that um, it was intended to. And so. Um, with this proposal, we would still maintain the option for that. We'll develop condos that are of this size um, and sell them as an ownership product. Um, but it would not be required. Um, we, we felt like that was the place where um, projects were getting a little bit tripped up and other projects were being 
hesitating to go in because they would, you know, have to sell them. Um, and that just that issue of whether it's rental or for sale is is very sensitive to the housing market, which um, is affected by so many external factors that, you know, it's not necessarily something we can fully control locally. Um, you know, and there are obviously choices that we can make that can have on it, right? Like that's why we're all here. Um, so I think the idea here is that we're still preserving that as an option while we're moving it as a requirement. And the hope with the hope being that we get these units gated, period. Because, um, I do think there's a market for them and a use for them and a good use for them, providing housing for um, for small households. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've mentioned before that new housing is always kind of comes in at the top of the market, be restricted or affordable housing. Um, but if we look at what rentals has from UCSC, they're saying that a one bedroom apartment condo goes $2238 and $4,000 a month. So, um, that's a wide range, first of all. And then, um, you know, I think that some of these smaller units just come in below that upper limit um, just by virtue of being a little smaller. So, yeah. Um, as a follow up question, was there analysis on or any look at um, requiring? a lower percentage for sale versus fully going from 50% to fully rental ownership model? Um, yeah, okay, good question. So um, there are financing reasons that kind of eliminate that as an option. So um, traditional bank financing to an individual purchaser they don't like to lend on properties where more than half of the units are rented. So um, moving to a lower percentage required to sale, like they would have to be all cash buyers, which it just seems kind of unlikely in that this small housing, small house. Okay, thank you for that clarification. <laughs> All of my other questions have been answered. Thank you, everyone. I, if that's it for questions, I will uh, take it out for public comment. In addition, uh, let's see, if you're interested in uh, commenting on the small housing units general plan, at downtown plan, local coastal plan, and zoning ordinance update, item number 14 on today's agenda. Raise your hand by either dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature on the webinar computer. When it is your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will then be set. Okay, going out to public comment, I see Kyle Tully. Unmute. Hey, council and staff, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I just want to call in support of the changes and that I support more homes and density. I think there's been a good amount of analysis on you know what what prices homes are gonna be, how we can try to share the city with, with more people. Uh, and to Provide more accommodation for their rent overburden, living in overcrowded housing, um, or homeless right now. And I think one thing that I would like to see staff and council study a little bit more is what's the cost of a mortgage? So, uh, Councilmember Cummings earlier brought up the cost of a piece of land with a house on it as being a good chunk of change. But the reality is, is that if we were able to build higher density housing on it, the individual cost of housing for someone to live there would be less because the difference here is between land, between sharing land with people. And fundamentally, that's that's the question for us. Are we willing to share land with more people? Are we going to make room? 
And that's what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle Kelly, for your comment. Next, we have Rafa Sonnenfeld. Unmute yourself. Welcome. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of Santa Cruz EMB, um, who uh, supports the concept of flexible density units. Um, we sent a letter in, I think, I believe back in October, but for some reason it never made it into an agenda pack um, in support of this um, proposal. Um, I just wanted to, to point out that you know, this is really about providing more flexibility and about trying to reduce some of the barriers that are um, caused by an overly complicated and burdensome zoning code. Um, and this is the exact type of program that we'll need to implement before adopting a housing element if we want to have a plan that's approved by the state. And um, if we don't make these sorts of changes, it's less likely, maybe unlikely, that the state will approve our, our um, housing element. And, and the consequences of that is actually losing more local control over land use. So, you know, these are the types of policies that we really do need to be moving forward with, create more options. Um, if we want to work on affordability, there are other ways of that. But, um, but zoning isn't necessarily the, the, the tool for affordability. Uh, you know, we can look at local funding sources for affordable housing. Uh, the city could be acquiring land for 100% affordable housing, maybe creating new group housing options or co-housing options. But mandating that units be affordable doesn't actually make more housing affordable. It just creates more barriers to uh, when we have market rate projects, uh, making them uh, harder to um, harder to finance and less likely to even be proposed. So um, I think it's a sensible thing for us uh, uh, making this simpler. Um, this isn't about making bigger buildings. Um, it's just about making more options for the existing building envelope that we have. So uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention is um, uh, I hope that we are not creating any in additional parking requirements or creating additional um, uh, requirements that that can become burdensome. Um, uh, you know, this is about removing barriers and um, and I hope that that you know, as we move forward with this, that this is about creating new opportunities and not uh, creating new problems that that developers have to overcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Zenin Oyate. Go ahead and unmute. Hi, thank you, Council. Uh, my name is Zenin Elliot Crow. I'm the president of the Student Housing Coalition, and I'm just speaking today in support of these proposed changes. Um, I think that when we look at affordable housing, especially housing for students, we know that smaller unit types are what are more available, whether you're splitting that between a significant other or you're splitting that between even two friends. You know, those things are much more affordable than the predominantly single family housing stock that we have within the city. And so when we talk about allowing for a more flexible use of density within projects, I think it opens up a real possibility for other types of like co-op. Because when we look at you know the possibility of having you know, shared dormitory style housing off campus, that is illegal today in today in the city zoning. You know, the naturally affordable co-op and communal living situations that we know affordable outcomes, that's illegal because the density requirements actually preclude it from happening. And so when we talk about going ahead and actually allowing for more flexibility in what can be built, what types can be used, I think it's really important that we make sure we facilitate that. And especially when it comes to burden some parking requirements, when it comes to density requirements and all the rest, the way we know that we can get to more housing is allow for more types of all houses. So with that, I really implore you guys to support this. And oh, and one last thing, uh, I know there was comments about why there was a reduction in the ownership rate. And the State Board of Equalization actually requires when uh, condos are being sold that a condo map drawn up for the apartment building. And therefore, once you sell one condo with 
building, you need to sell all of the condos. So it extensively includes the possibility of a mixed condo and rental building. So that's just one last. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Antoine Haddad. Go ahead and unmute. Hello, uh, my name is Antoine Haddad, and I'm with the Student Housing Coalition of UCSC. Uh, and I agree with uh, this uh, recommendation. And I think that as uh, other people have now, it's just a way of having multiple tools to create uh, different types of housing that could benefit us to solve this housing crisis that we have. And like Zen uh, talked about, to open the door to maybe more different housing options like co-ops. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Hunter G. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, are you guys able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, I'd just like to say thank you to all the council members and for your time, because um, I absolutely love Santa Cruz and I'm happy to be a um, resident here. And yeah, I just fully support this housing measure. I think it would be great for our community, um, especially for creating more types of units, especially like leaning towards the entry level. Because um, what happens with a lot of students is they're living in suburban houses, which could otherwise be going towards families. So in building this type of development, it's both good for the families that want to live in Santa Cruz and work in Santa Cruz, um, and also for the students and people looking for more entry level housing. Um, so I just really support this measure and I even read through it. Um, and I'm also with the um, Student Housing Coalition as well. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are watching this, even though everyone's kind of busy with finals, a lot of young people are working right now, um, but we're all like very um, like concerned about this as well, and are just watching this in support. So yeah, just thank you um, very much, and I fully support this, and hope to see more um, options like this in the future for our city council, but thank you. Thank you, Hunter. Our next speaker is Reggie Meisler. Go ahead and unmute. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Reggie. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I can see a lot of uh, our sort of allies um, in fighting the OVO are supporting this. And I want to join with them to support it because I know that this really affects them in a lot of ways. But I do want to point out I do like density. I want more density. But if the density we're talking about, just taking a five-bedroom home and making it into five units of housing, just kind of adding walls to the problem, I don't know that we really accomplished much. I mean, when we're talking about overcrowding in a house, um, we didn't really achieve much by just like sectioning off parts of the house and then still having people in roughly the same uh, square foot of living space. Right? I mean, that's my uh, opinion on the matter. Uh, furthermore, at 300 square feet, <clears throat> if uh, people are aiming for like a price of $1,800 a month or so, or even higher, it sounds like between $1,800 and $1,000 was like the sort of market rate uh, goal. I mean, it just feels like we can do better than that, given that we have some bargaining power here to ask for some kind of strings to be attached. It doesn't have to be unreasonable, but it 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 seems like we could at least get something out of this, you know, because students aren't pulling in $8,000, $9,000 a month to not be rent burdened in these units. And um, um, and the units are so small that they can't split that cost among a lot of other students, which they're used to doing in single family homes. So I am concerned that students might be looking at the $1,800 price tag and thinking that's great or something around there, but if this comes in at three thousand or four thousand, I'm used to seeing students split a one bedroom, uh, three thousand dollars a month between four people, and I just uh, I have trouble seeing how this would work 
for a lot of stuff. But that's about it. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Sal Caruso. Go ahead and unmute. Hi. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Sal. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, the planning department staff and all of you as council members for considering this. I'm 100% in support of this change in the ordinance. I feel that this is visionary. It is something exceptional, and I really and hope that it'll model other communities. Some cities have you know, uh, co-op ordinances, San Jose, San Francisco, some other areas, but uh, for Santa Cruz to uh, do this, it is absolutely outstanding. We are in an unmitigated housing crisis, uh, not just a meager shortage, but an actual crisis. And just based on the principles of supply and demand, the more supply we get out there of housing, the prices will come down. That is a simple fact of economics. And this is a brilliant plan and gives uh, people the flexibility to comply with banking standards for financing and, and create uh, within the existing envelope, as planning staff had mentioned, within the existing envelope, higher density, with still complying with parking standards and other general standards of uh, the, the code. So it doesn't harm anything. It actually improves the environment. And all we have to do is walk the streets of Santa Cruz to know how desperately we house. So uh, thank you so much for considering this, and I hope to I'll vote in favor of the uh, amendment on the order. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Ryan Meckel. Welcome. I'm, uh, I just wanted to call in in support of this measure. Um, I believe Santa Cruz should have more density and we should have more options for our residents. Uh, something that's very much lacking here right now. Um, as you can see, if you look at our zoning maps, uh, I think it's important, uh, again, to have options, not just for students, but also for other community members, maybe single or uh, who don't need, you know, who don't want to live with roommates, who don't need that much space, who would just like to have a smaller space. Those people exist, uh, and they don't really have that option in Santa Cruz right now. As the previous caller mentioned, we also have a housing crisis, so this is a great way to add more units to our community, which, again, are sorely needed. Uh, I'll keep it short and sweet. I support this and I hope to see it voted through. Thank you, Thank you for your comment. Our next public comment is phone number ending in 495. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, this is uh, Candace Brown. I'm part of the Transportation Commission and live on the east side, Midtown area. Uh, I sent in a letter that unfortunately wasn't included in the packet, but I just wanted to note that. Um, how many, uh, how long do I have? You have three minutes. Okay, three minutes. Okay, first of all, the key issue about SOUs is that they eliminated the minimum lot area per dwelling which would be 1,100 square foot, which would include for open space and, and you know the additional infrastructure, parking, whatever. So by doing that, you can maximize density, and then you could you know also create waivers sometimes or concessions. Um, so the intent was to create very high density without looking at all the implications, but to take out the mixed use and then to add it into other projects creates all kinds of convoluted issues. Uh, first of all, by taking out mixed use, you're basically saying that um, the east side midtown area would just not exist. Um, you're basically saying that small businesses sh shouldn't have a place to be and support the local communities, that people wouldn't have a place to have a pedestrian engaged environment. The pandemic showed that the east side midtown was very successful in offering people a place where they could go, where they could be, where they could you know, shop and they could do it sustainably. This is creating a lot of high density. At 555 Pacific, the original development cost was uh, like basically 27, 000, uh, 27 million, six, 27 million um, and some change. And the profit would be like 
over 10 million, basically they would get a profit of 36.7%. So this whole idea that somehow the developers are suffering to, to gain profit, especially when now a lot of these major developments are being put under an NDA for some reason, um, so it's never been revealed, I think really shows you that there's more to the story. Um, transportation, a huge issue, huge issue. Um, the amount of density here would require so many different changes. And the project, Sal Caruso, who was the architect who just spoke for 908 uh, Ocean Street, is proposing 433 units on less than three acres, and they're stacking the cars. So um, that's their way of getting around this issue. But it creates a whole, a whole set of issues around traffic flow in a very key part of town. This has not been looked at, has not been modeled. Uh, you're basically also taking out um, potentially the auto zone. Impacts of that need to be looked at. My letter was very explicit about the fact that you need to have a CEQA review here. You cannot move forward without that. That's what really the motion should be about, if you re even consider this. And I actually say that the SOU's um, zoning should be eliminated. It's not providing what we need, and I think we do need student housing. The way to do that, which um, was not proposed with the dense planning, was to eliminate the number of bathrooms and kitchens and have a more co-op cohabitation environment. And without that, you're not going to have anything for 30% of this town with your students. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next, we have Isadora Alamne. Unmute yourself. Yeah, um, I'm Isadora. I'm with the Student Housing Coalition. I think um, as a student, there's definitely a really big housing issue and that going forward with these changes will make it easier to build more housing. Um, and with the amount of people who are in need of housing, uh, I definitely support these changes. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next, Andy, we have Frank. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Um, yeah, I'm Frank. I'm with the Student Housing Coalition. I just want to say I support the post changing to housing. And that's it. Thank you so much for calling. Are there any other members of the public who wish to comment on item number 14? We have Kyrie Ritchie. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Press. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi, welcome. Hi, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I want to definitely uh, uh, carry on supporting this measure. Um, also, from a, uh, local as a local Santa Cruz County worker, um, I think this is definitely important on expanding more units for the uh, local class as well as working class in Santa Cruz. Um, I think. I believe that a lot of the problems as a working class member and talking to other working class members in Santa Cruz is the availability of housing available, um, mostly in a lot, of, a lot of areas, including the west side and other areas of Santa Cruz. A lot of the units are first dibs to go to students, and it definitely kind of uh, discourages the working class from staying in Santa Cruz. Um, personally, I've dealt with a lot of people who are working in Santa Cruz that had to move out of the community to increase housing prices increase of housing prices and also the fact that a lot of units are simply not available. Also, the affordability definitely needs to be addressed more further as well because even though we have certain units available, the waiting list is maybe 200 people long for 20, for 20 units. And that's the reality of units across, you know, Santa Cruz when we talk about affordability or allowing affordable units to be allowed in Santa Cruz. So I think also uh, talking well, uh, with a, com a common effort earlier on making more units more 100 percent affordable instead of just uh, instead of, instead of just very few uh, units support uh, allowed for affordability so i definitely uh, believe affordability needs to be addressed as well as a working as a working class local thank you for your comment next we have Jeff another Bodhi shargal Welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. 
Uh, my name is Coach Cargell. Uh, yeah, I'm a lifelong Santa Cruz County resident, uh, UC Santa Cruz student associated with the YDSA and the Student Housing Coalition. Um, I pretty much am just going to say things that I've uh, said before at meetings like this. Um, I support uh, high density housing for um, economic reasons. We're currently experiencing an unprecedented housing crisis. Uh, density in housing is uh, great for affordable housing um, and preserving people's access to housing as well as environmental reasons. In um, high density housing, uh, lowers emissions due to transportation. Um, it makes it so people can get to work easier. It improves people's mental health, uh, decreases social atomization. Um, so for, for all those reasons, I think that the answer for, for today's question is clear, that we need to um, prioritize uh, flexible housing, uh, high-density housing uh, in, in Santa Cruz. So um, please approve this. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public that would like to do item 14 on our agenda, public hearing for small housing unit general plan, downtown plan, local plan, and zoning ordinance? Uh, regarding single room occupancy, small ownership unit, and a new use called flexible density unit or FDU. Okay, it looks like there are no other members of the public. So I will return to council for deliberation and action. <clears throat> uh, okay, council member Kalantari Johnson and council member Brown. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to all the callers and um, people who wrote letters and who were engaged with the Planning Commission. Um, the, the presentation was really well made. The discussion we had with my colleague here, the questions that were asked, um, were really helpful. And uh, I'm, I'm in support of this recommendation. I think the points were well made by some of the callers that um, this is a step towards addressing some of the housing challenges that we have here in the community and building a variety of housing. And um, a lot of thoughts got into it by staff. Planning Commission has approved it. So I'm, I'm ready to make, make a motion to support staff's recommendation. And I know there were some changes. Uh, so if we could put that slide or if someone can share that language with me, I'm happy to read it. Adopt resolution amending the general plan. Adopt a resolution amending the downtown plan, which will also constitute an amendment to the local coastal program to reflect the elimination of the small ownership unit and the addition of the new flexible density unit use. Introduce for publication an ordinance amending Title 24 of the Municipal Code regulating small housing units, including replacing small ownership units with flexible density units and making minor clarifying amendments to single room occupancy regulations, and then direct staff to submit the approved ordinance to the Coastal Commission for review following the second reading should the ordinance be adopted as, as of the second reading, as well as the changes to the downtown plan and general plan as changes to the local Coastal Program. Um, and again, just want to thank the creative, innovative, innovative thinking um, done by uh, our staff and the Planning Commission to bring this forward. Okay, thank you. We have a motion uh, by Council Member Colin Terry Johnson. Uh, Council Member Brown. Uh, I, I'm not gonna second that, but I do have comments. So if somebody wants to second it. There is a second on the motion. I'll second the motion. Okay, Vice Mayor Watson seconded. And now I will bring it for discussion and deliberation. So, Council Member Brown. Um, 
first, I, I want to make a, a few comments here. The first comment I want to make is response uh, public comment. Uh, I really appreciate all everyone who's called in. I recognize that there are different perspectives on um, what's needed here. There, there's kind of a uni universal understanding that we need more affordable housing. There is a, a real difference of opinion, I think, and I've I've heard this play out many <laughs> deliberations uh, over time, but I just I just want to say you know I'm dismayed, I'm frustrated with the ongoing inflation of density with, um, and it, I I don't believe that in a country like Santa Cruz, um, supply and demand, um, the rules of supply and demand are a fact. Um, it's a theory. It's an economic model about what should happen uh, under particular circumstances when you increase supply, um, but it doesn't take into account material realities on the ground. And those are, I say this over and over, related effective, much more so than simple. That's man backed up by the ability to pay, have a uh, limitless number of people in close proximity to us, um, given where we are we're located geographically, with an ability to pay more than a lot of local families, workers, um, people who talk about, and students for that matter. Um, so I just think that um, you know, I, I, it's, it's frustrating for that kind of, that assumption being so widely accepted. Nothing. There's no evidence to suggest that's the case. And we've seen it in other high end housing um, and we'll um, And I would add, the number of because that limit. So that's just my sidebar. <laughs> um, now, specifically to the proposal. Uh, staff is recommending essentially to um, eliminate density limits um, for flex flexible density, whether they're in standalone projects, component of another project. And while I agree that we need more of a mix of unit sizes, um, I, I think that for the clerk had problematic several. Um, first, with the densities allowed in mixed High density zones and the, de the current density bonus allowance is up to 50%. Um, allowing F with no density on top of that, that's, um, I think it's important to state here that officially declaring no density limit is a significant policy. Um, we've heard, well, this doesn't really change anything um, because we're already doing this, but it is a significant policy say that in our community, in particular zones, if you are, want to build um, anything, but, you know, anywhere between 250 and 108 square feet, there's, there's no limit. Um, <clears throat> that's significant. Two, the change would make it even harder for people in the community and for this city council to even un to understand how many units a project contains. Um, it, when the data density um, on these sites um, becomes meaningless. And third, I want to say that um, the, there's been a lot of reference to the Housing Group Subcommittee, where we looked at and ultimately supported incentivizing smaller units. I continue to support that. Um, the discussion at the time was in a very, very different context. Um, it was before all of these state housing laws had been adopted. Um, and so we had uh, different strength, different set of constraints then. So we're talking about exponentially higher density than we were talking about uh, when we did that work um, <clears throat> in 2018. So, um, so, so I, I have a, <laughs> a little bit different perspective now. Um, you know, it seemed reasonable, um, but we've seen all, you know, this effectively the elimination of local progression over what um, developed and um, another slate of housing legislation coming this year. I've seen 
that there's bills that will 100% them. Uh, likely, many of these are likely to pass for our ability to development. So why would we um, eliminate any sense, any any control that we have, um, particularly when we're not talking about, and I will just continue to just with anybody who says um, more affordability. There is not affordability that I um, beyond what we already require. Um, so with that, um, I because I, I don't think I'm get support for a friendly amendment here. So I'd like to substitute motion. I'd like to put it on record. Um, and um, the only change that I'm making is um, so you can pull up that language um, the, to approve the staff recommendation with the following change that we prohibit flexible density units development with larger multi housing units. So basically, okay, limiting. In, are you adding this one, three, or four? Or I'm adding it to the whole for thing all. for all of it. Um, prohibit flexible. So the with the following change. Prohibit flexible density units developments with larger multi. That's it. That's my language. Um, my the only additional explanation I would say is just it's that using um, basically limiting the F designation standalone project. I'll go ahead and fight. Okay, so we have a substitute motion uh, by Council Member Brown and a second by Council Member Cummings. And um, thank you for that. Is there uh, a discussion on on we have Council Member Mark, uh, Vice Mayor Martin Watkins? You're next. Your hand up. Uh, sure. I think given Council Member Brown's comments, um, I'll kind of reserve some of my other comments. For the original motion, but I guess I, I'd like to ask our staff to share kind of their thoughts on some of the comments that was made by Councilmember Brown and the impacts of the proposed a proposed substitute motion. It, in the re agenda report, as I read it, it was discussed pretty thoroughly. At the I wanted to see if staff could do that, as well as the dense elements that were. Sure, thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. I'm happy to speak to that and then I'll I'll see if um, anyone else on the team would like to chime in as well. Um, a, a few things that I would say, um, one, um, we, we already do not have density limits for SROs, the single room occupancy and the SOUs, um, the small ownership units. So in that sense, this isn't a, a paradigm shift. Um, this is uh, proposing, as Councilmember Brown um, astutely pointed out, and that we have you know, been very clear about, this is proposing to allow these types of units to mix, the, the new unit, flexible density units, to mix within larger projects. Um, and that is um, a, a change in how we do business. Um, the, um, the other point that I would make here is there was a question about if it creates uncertainty as to the number of units could be allowed. Um, that's the case currently with respect to SROs and SOUs. And so there isn't any additional amount of uncertainty that I would say um, from a member of the public. SROs and SOUs already don't have that. Um, so those are some of the key things. Um, and just like Matt would like to add, uh, point as well. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to add to the, the unit mix question. We did discuss that a lot with the commission. And the the one key thing there was that it, it is a change, but it's it's a really important change for this ordinance that 
it actually allows for these units to mix with other larger units and create a, a greater variety of housing types within a given project. That was something we heard a lot from the community too, uh, in regards to these you know monocultures and creating one specific project versus another. And allowing this mix really gives each project a uh, greater opportunity for a variety of those housing types, potential rents and uh, and uh, sale prices. So. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I know we aren't discussing the original motion, but we have the substitute motion on the floor at this time. But given the input, I think is how I interpret it, which is allowing for more diversity. And I like my experience you know, experiencing a community that has diverse people and different stages of mobility lifestyles. So for that, I won't. Council member Myers. And you're muted. I had a quick question, and I'm sorry, the outreach for uh, affordable housing outreach. Thank you. Does that conclude? Are you done, Council Member Myers? Okay. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just wanted to. I'm not going to go through all the comments Council Member Brown made, but I definitely agree with a lot that was stated because. In this community, you know, the notion that building more is, is going to result in lower housing costs I think is um, something that you know typically can be assumed in many economic models. But it's the time I've lived here, um, that's not what we've been seeing. When we see new housing come on board, we oftentimes don't see um, the impact that we would initially anticipate from bringing from building more density um i think there's also an issue with you know increasing student population on campus how that impacts housing availability uh, we also have one of the biggest global economic drivers over the hill which in our in our world which um as a result having people are making you know, six-figure incomes um that really puts a strain on housing availability because People want to buy second homes, much easier for them to afford that, uh, which then leads to a reduction of the uh, housing availability. And also there's a demand for, for higher priced homes. So, um, you know, unless we're building in affordability, unless we're restricting housing, paying it to be affordable over a long time, um, then what we'll see is that um, because of the fact that there are people who have, who are able to earn much more than what people are able to earn here in the city of Santa Cruz, then we will see housing prices go up. And one thing I'll point out is that the, the amounts that I mentioned earlier around one bedroom, 2,800, needing to make $112,000 a year, um, and that being, and if you break that down, how much you make a month, it's $9,333 a month for that to be, you to not be rent burdened. Median income of Santa most people in Santa Cruz is eighty-two thousand dollars. So that alone, and if we want to say, and that's for a studio, I'm, I'm a student. so with the median income being eighty-two thousand dollars, studios that are brand new, four hundred fifty square feet, twenty-eight hundred dollars a month. That's not affordable for people. So what we really need moving forward is to really try to figure out how we. For our workforce to ensure that low income people, working class, have the ability to live in the um, that they serve. Um, that being said, I also supportive of this motion because uh, to what Council Member Walker or Vice Mayor Walker pointed out, that this was this did go to the Planning Commission, and I believe that the substitute motion that was made reflect um, more clearly what was passed at the planning. And so for those reasons, supportive of the direction 
that Councilmember Brown has suggested because um, that's what saw come out of our planning commission meeting. And um, I believe it's a good compromise to various concerns that are coming up around um, this item of people's. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. And I see that, that Lee maybe wanted to chime I did, in. I just saw that. Uh, oh, wait a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to clarify that the, the Planning Commission actually voted to support the mixing of um, flexible density units in with other uh, unit types. And um, the, that was a, a lengthy debate there. The team here, Sarah or Matt, I, I don't know if you recall the vote. Council's interested. Um, I can't remember if it was five two or three on that. It was a item. four three. So, so the the planning commission did vote to support this in um, uh, projects, multifamily projects. Lee, can you speak to um, the uh, the motion that currently on the floor is uh, prohibit the mixed use in mixed use prohibit FDUs in mixed use uh, right. and developments with larger multifamily housing units. Um, so what would that look like then, if that were the case? So that would um, allow for projects that are solely made up of the flexible density units. So the um, 225, I think this is the minimum, to 650 square feet, they would all have to be that size. It would not allow for a project, say, 700 square foot units or 800 square foot units to also include flexible density units. And this, this was the, the most debated issue at the Planning Commission. Um, and as I mentioned, they did ultimately vote to support adding it in, in large part for the reasons that Matt articulated earlier with respect to this adding um, uh, additional options for housing, this providing uh, different price points and different sizes and uh, potentially mix of incomes and uh, development projects. Um, so, this adds um, more flexibility and can uh, potentially um, allow for projects to get built that otherwise might not be able to. So for all those reasons, staff is supportive of the mixing. And the uh, prohibition of, if, if, if a, a project was fully made up of flexible density units, um, what would the affordability was there analysis done on the affordability in those? So it would have the same inclusionary requirement as uh, a project um, with the mix. So those um, inclusionary, which currently 20% of the unit are um, deed restricted affordable at 80% um, my very median. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Terry Johnson. Yeah, I just had a um, comment for the city manager. This has come up uh, a number of times in the past on call. Um, it's come up a number of times in the past where um, items go to commissions and then they come to council, but we don't get the minutes uh, or the act out meetings and so I just like to suggest that as we move forward um, when we have items that go to commission get from those meetings included in our agenda packets it would really be helpful for, for us to be able to review kind of what happened in those what were the final outcomes what the votes were on these items because we just get a small um, kind of synopsis staff report but it'd be helpful for us to actually have um, and for members of the public to be able to review what happened in those I just wanted to put that out there as a comment for our new city. Understood, Councilmember Cummings. I appreciate you sharing that. I work with staff for, uh, to explore, explore that going forward. 
Thank you, Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Thanks. I'll just I'll keep my um, comment brief. I, I won't be um, supporting the substitute motion. And and just to be clear, um, what staff is recommending is what ultimately the Planning Commission approved. That's that's. I just want to confirm and be clear about that. Um, and just a comment that you know I think we all, especially here at the council level, care about local control. And I think some of the of the past decisions of um, our past colleagues, elected officials, have, have kind of placed us where we are right now and um, has given the state more opportunity to kind of bring down laws that may or may not fit our community. So if we don't think out of the box and we're not creative and we're not innovative, we will lose all local I just, I appreciate staff's approach and thinking in um, helping us build a diverse array of units that we can maintain as much control as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah, I just had a few additional comments, but I'm happy to make if you wanted to have me make those after we. Or do you prefer I make them? Let's take the comments on the substitute motion and okay. deliberation on the substitute. No. Okay. Then at this point, I'd uh, like to ask the city clerk for a roll call vote on the substitute motion. If we can have that <coughs> pulled up one more time, just to be clear. That's right. The motion would be to whether to accept the substitute. If it passes, then you can vote on the substitute. Correct. Right. Okay. I'm ready for roll call. Okay. Member Kalantari Johnson? No. Sir? No. Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Vice Mayor Watkins? No. Mayor Brunner? Okay, motion fails. So now we will return to the first motion uh, that was moved by Council Member Kalantari Johnson, seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins. And are there any comments on this motion? Vice Mayor Watkins? Yeah, no, I just have a few brief comments. I just want to thank, um, I want to thank all those that have been involved in implementation of the housing blueprint subcommittee and the work that went into that. You know, in 2018, it really, that those recommendations came on the heels of a very robust listening tour, engaging many elements and stakeholders and individual groups in terms of what types of housing we want to serve. And, and doing so, we were able to do a community informed approach to coming up with specific policy recommendations that reflected what we heard from the community in ways that translated to the types of policies we wanted. And knowing that our community values diversity and social mobility and opportunity for change in housing types over the spectrum of a person's lifetime, albeit from, you know, high, graduating high school to individual living to college or roommates to working and then families to single parents to elderly, as you name it, everybody in and wanting to see how we can do so in a way that's really responsive to really maintaining the character of our community. And so what that translated for those who aren't as familiar as I am, because I was part of it, um, is really the elements that we move forward with, which was community um, engagement and community 
protection, really maintaining character in other ways we can support the just the, all the things that we love about Santa Cruz that it um, community uh, housing protection, looking at how do we preserve our existing housing stock and then housing um, development and thinking about how we produce more types of housing that really reflect what the community wants and hopefully will lead itself to a more opportunity and so factoring all of those things really comes this transition of various policy recommendations. So I just really want to applaud our, our planning um, department and the community that has been engaged with seeing through some of these policies and, um, and hopefully that will then lend itself to a community that reflects the diversity that I know I heard loud and clear amongst that process of um, wanting different housing. So just sort of to provide this unique policy recommendation in this broader context around what we're doing to move forward with more types of stock and how we're moving forward to wonderful for all to enjoy. So with that, I'm happy to um, have seconded the motion. Are there any further comments or questions from the board? Uh, roll call vote, please. For Secretary Johnson. Aye. Aye. No. Brown. No. Councilor Meyer. Aye. Mayor Watkins. Aye. Mayor Brenner. Aye. Motion passed five two. Uh, with Cummings and Brown, no. Thank you. Thank you to our planning staff, Steve Butler, Sarah Noisy, and Matt Benoit for the information and being available for the question. Next on our agenda is item number 15, Transportation and Public Works Commission appointment. For members of public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. We will begin with questions from council if there are any. Then we will take public comment and then return to city council for nominations and voting to appoint someone to the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Are there any questions from council? Go ahead, uh, council member Myers. Um, I had one question, Bonnie. Um, Bonnie, was there other other applicants at all? Besides the two that were in the packet? Yeah. Uh, we did receive one this morning, um, mm -hmm. but that will not be considered. That we're going to hold on to that one for two years until the next. Okay, and is there, there was no other applicant at all for this for this. Okay. Um, Mayor, that's my question. Um, yeah, I'm happy after just more. Bonnie, if he went, if we, how do we go about trying to solicit more applicants? It only have to accept the ones that came in on this a little bit. Yeah, well, so there, typically there is a deadline. There wasn't um, a set deadline on this one, but we did just reset it this morning, the day of the day. So I opted um, not accept it for this appointment process. And, um, we'll hold on to them until the next thing. But if we could potentially, still, um, but we could potentially uh, ask that the applicant 
the application. Yeah, yeah, this if you um recall um maybe this was one. there was a group there was um a where we held off going. I can't remember but I yeah, can um make a motion uh, at the point at the time go out or like Yeah, I reached that in my details. In a couple of couple of faded. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from council? Okay. Um, and we will take public comment, and I will go to the attendees list. We have one person with their hand raised. If you'd uh, like to raise your hand, interested in commenting on Transportation and Public Works Commission appointment, raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or select hand in the webinar controls on your computer. When it is your turn, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will then be set in it. Ryan Meckel, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, hey, Council. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, I guess this might be directed towards Bonnie. Uh, I sent my application in on Friday. Was that the one that was not included today? I'm gonna answer that, I apologize. Uh, no, that was uh, that wasn't the application. That was not the application. Could I just so, have, I don't receive them? Um, we were... Okay. Uh, if that's you, sorry, do you have public comment? Um, in addition, to your question or was that it? Uh, yeah. Can I speak a little bit? You have yes. The timer. <laughs> Going. Okay. Yep. Thank you for your time and consideration. So I'll try to cut down a little bit, but I've been a resident of Santa Cruz for the past five years. In that time, I've been both a student at UC Santa Cruz and now uh, an employee at UC Santa Cruz as well. And I plan on being here for the foreseeable future. I grew up somewhat locally in Monterey County, but in my time uh, here in Santa Cruz, I've really seen some, some great projects come through uh, the Transportation and Public Works uh, Commission uh, and the benefits they bring our community. So, for example, uh, things I've used personally and very much enjoyed were the bike sharing program since discontinued but coming back, new format, which I'm very excited for. Uh, the rail trail has been a fantastic asset for our community, uh, for people walking, for people biking, for families, people looking to exercise. The food waste uh, and compost effort that is ongoing has been fantastic. I've cut down personally my house's trash by about half just in food scraps. Uh, as well as the, and then also the river walk lighting. I'm looking forward to seeing put in, uh, as well as some of the work that has been done with the uh, San Lorenzo Park Neighbors uh, group, I'm a part of um, cleaning up San Lorenzo Park and kind of restoring it uh, a little bit, multiple projects. Um, so it's been great to see those projects. I look forward to seeing many, many more come through uh, the commission and I hope to be a part of it. I believe I would bring a unique perspective to this commission as a younger person who works in the city and somebody who also relies fully on alternative transportation. Um, I do not own a car, so I get everywhere on my bike or by bus or by walking. Um, so I think there's also a significant number of people in simu similar situations to myself uh, who live in the city. And I think that I could bring their voices to the commission and bring a perspective that is not uh, as visible. So thank you again for your consideration. Thank you. Our next uh, is Reggie Meisler. Go ahead and unmute yourself for public comment. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. I just wanted to call uh, in support of the candidate that uh, uh, Council Member Myers wants to sort of just ignore and uh, leave the <laughs> position vacant instead of allowing to fill. Uh, who is Joy Schendeldecker. Joy Schendeldecker um, 
has done a lot for the community, very similar to San Lorenzo Park neighbors, Joy uh, has formulated her own um, cleaning crew group on sanitation for the people. Uh, she is part of a local group um, that is very uh, environmentally conscious called uh, the Socialists. And she just is uh, a very like great person who engages in a lot of uh, local work. And I think she would be very appropriate for uh, any commission spot, honestly, but um, uh, this one, great too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next caller for public comment is Santa Cruz Cares. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, uh, I'm calling in on behalf of Santa Cruz Cares. Um, I'd like to also support Joy Schendeldecker for Transportation and Public Work Commission. Um, as previous callers stated, she is a really valued member of our community, she does a ton of time with the community. Her work with Sanitation for the People is really amazing. And if there's council members here that have not interacted with Sanitation for the People or looked into it, I really want to highly, highly recommend you do so and please support her in on this commission. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to comment on uh, item number 15, Transportation and Public Works Commission appointment? Okay. So we will return to council for nominations and voting to appoint someone to the transportation and public work and, uh, and deliberation. We had two applicants that were uh, accepted for this appointment, Sabrina Lopez and Joy Sendelbecker. And uh, let me go back to council. And I see Council Member Myers and then Council Member uh, Council Member Brown. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, my intent is not uh, obviously yeah, that are. I just like to make um then the uh, app. Uh, like at least um, maybe bring it back there, allow a four weeks, um, get back there, uh, get that way we have a little more outreach. So my motion. Okay, uh, we have a motion by Council Member Myers to extend the application period uh, for this appointment. Is there a second, Council Member Brown? <laughs> Is there a uh, second? I'll second that. Council Member Golder. Council Member Brown and then Council Member Cummings. I'd like to make a substitute motion nominating Joy Schendeldecker to the Transportation and Public Works. Okay, we have a substitute motion uh, by Council Member Brown nominating Joy Schendeldecker. Is there a second? I'd like to second with a friendly amendment that we move forward with the appointment today. Second. Second. Cummings, friendly amendment to move forward and was accepted by Council Member Brown. 
I can make some comments? Yes. Yeah, I'd just like to point out that um, you know, our application period for this, um, commissions um, go through you know, the end of the year and into early January. We have days where we hear from all the applicants and then um, you know, move forward with making our votes and recommendations. This has been pushed out um, because obviously there's a number or there's a couple of times throughout the year when you might not have um, enough applicants who will resign and fill vacant seats. Um, and I feel that looking over both applications, equally qualified um, for the And while there's people who um, thrown their hats a little bit late, um, I think we're respecting the commissions and the work they need to be doing that um, I'd like to urge forward with the record, of course. Okay, so um, thank you for your comment. We have our first and a second uh, on the substitute motion and uh, council member Myers. My understanding was resignation. But we wouldn't yeah. put it on these for the year. There was a resignation, not put the opening. My interest. Yeah. Sorry. If I could, um, I'd have to go back and look at the applicants in the date. These are applicants that they either submitted them um, when there was an opening or we have had them since the um, annual appointment process because we retain them for two years. So I'd have to go back and look at the dates, but they may have been ones that we had on file and they were still interested in appointment. Oh, my interest in, in proposing the extension for for four weeks to four weeks is not gave any particular applicant, but um, to acknowledge that there has been a resignation um, just to try to put the word out. We all have connections everywhere, and it would be good to just have a discussion. Okay, uh, Council Member Calentari Johnson. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Brown, and then Council Member Calentari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. So I just wanted for clarification here uh, to say that the application, Joe Shendel Decker's application was submitted years ago. Um, members of this city council, this current council, um, and previous members have voted again, have not voted for her. She has been nominated and she is, continues to be interested during that period. She has to do a significant amount of work towards our community that helps our city, uh, given the lack of capacity and I would argue political will for addressing in particular waste management um, in our public spaces. And um, I, I don't see any reason why um, we wouldn't support her today. So in terms of getting more applications, I understand the, um, the interest there, or the, the sentiment uh, but, and the intention, but um, I think we have a qualified applicant. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yeah, I just wanted to note that I've had a couple of community members who reached out who um, found out a little too late about this. One in particular who is a youth and who's really engaged and wants to get involved. And as we're thinking about our committees and commissions, I know we have some work to do in terms of how we communicate and do outreach. But um, I, I, I wasn't expecting this either. And I think some community members hadn't heard about it. so. I think we heard from one applicant today who called who wasn't able to get their application in in time. And I know of another community member who I was ready to support because I've been working with this for a while, um, who also wasn't aware of the deadline. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah, no, I'm comfortable with extending the, um, the process to allow more opportunities, especially given the fact that we had a resident and I know we've done this before. I think we recently commissioned 
Um, and I know that was unique. And then also just that individuals who are interested in serving on our uh, we, we thank you always, and it's an uh, uh, incredible attribute in our community. And we welcome you to reach out to, our, to us directly so we can understand your well. Um, so I just want to offer that to the applicants who are interested in serving on this commission or others that, you know, it's always helpful for us to hear a little bit about your background. And we have your paper application, but in terms of offering more input, um, that's always an opportunity. So, Given kind of our circumstances, and um, you know, I think I feel uh, allow not only the applicant um, because. Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to just make a brief comment that uh, some of the direction we have been working on from last year's full equity resolution. Um, under the health and all policy is looking at uh, the process for applicants in our advisory bodies. And, and um, um, this is a great example of, of, of that process. And having learned of a resignation, um, you know, several uh, applicants that were interested that thought they had missed the original deadline. However, um, how we communicate out that applications are on file and applications are accepted anytime for any members of the public that are out there who are interested on serving on any of the advisory bodies and commissions, I encourage you to submit an application now should a resignation or opening um, arise and need to build. Um, so uh, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. And um, so we will be, uh, there's no further comment, voting on the substitute motion, um, which is uh, made by Council Member Brown, seconded by Cummings to. Um, uh, uh, appoint Joy or nominate an or appoint Joy. Maybe you can say appoint Joy Shendon Deckler and continue with the nomination today. That did I capture that accurately? Uh, Council Member Cummings. I guess the amendment was. I mean, my amendment move forward with the uh, um, the appointment process. Okay. Okay. Thank Council Member Brown. Forward appointment process. Yeah, Council Member Brown was nominating the Shendel. I think we'd still, since there's other options, want to go through the process of offer of nomination. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Um, may we have a roll call vote, please? Um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. No, and for the record, it's to allow community members who have an interest to have the opportunity. Holder? No, for the same reason. Brown? Aye. Sorry, I, threw, I, I probably threw you off a little bit. I changed up the order. Coming? Aye. Myers? You're muted. Sorry, uh, my vote is no and record. I just simply want to help. Vice Mayor Watkins? No. Mayor Bruder? No. Uh, okay, so um, we will return to the original motion to extend the appointment and nomination, uh, the nomination and appointment process of Transportation and Public Works Commission appointment uh, to, uh, we didn't set a date. There wasn't a date in the motion. You just, you wanna clarify that? Yeah, I would recommend amenable to the seconder that act 
There's March 22nd and April 12th, uh, April 26th are part of. I know. Um, bring it back April 12th. The seconder uh, holder. Yes. Okay. I'm minimal to that. So, a uh, motion to extend the application period for and the the nominating and voting process for the Transportation Public Works Commission appointment to April 12th Council meeting. And we have a roll call vote. Member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Sir? Aye. Coming. I'll support the motion. I just um, would like for the record to ask that their communication sent out to all council members so that we can send that out to members of the public so that everybody has a full opportunity to Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Bruner? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Thank you for um, everyone who did call in with public comment and to all of colleagues comment. I will move right on into our next agenda item. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Can we take a short break since we've been seeing four hours? We have um, someone waiting who has to get 3 p.m. So I'm going to um, roll right in. It is Randy Morris from the county. Um, Human Services Department, and um, if you don't mind, we can take a break after Randy leaves. Perhaps I'd like to start um, accommodating time. Today. Mayor Bruner, I feel very uncomfortable between me and you not having a break. I am happy if it's a five minute break. Wait, I can be a little late to my three o'clock if okay. that's possible. That's wonderful to hear. Let's do a five minute bio break and we will return. Thank you for your patience, Randy. Uh, as council members return, if on your cameras and we'll jump right back. Here, Bruner, do you mind if I ask between Laura and Bonnie and Tiffany if they're going to do the screen share for me? I believe I am. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, I will go ahead and begin. We are now at item, agenda item number 16 for investments RF and updates on application process, review panels and scoring, award funding decisions process, and amended appeal process. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to 
call in using the instructions on your The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from city council. We will then take public comment and then return to council and act. So please, we will begin now with the presentation. And Good afternoon. Go ahead, Elise West. I was going to introduce you our sustainability and climate action manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Um, I am Elise West, the climate action of the City Manager's Office. And although uh, I prepared in collaboration with the county the agenda report today, I would like to introduce uh, for you. Uh, Randy Morris, the Santa Cruz County Department Director, who will be giving um, the detailed uh, presentation today and connecting it to um, Santa Cruz County uh, Board of Supervisors uh, being outcomes also occurring today. So I will turn it over to Randy. Okay, am I coming through okay? Um, okay, thank you, Tiffany, and I guess formally, Mayor, and Vice Mayor Watkins and council members. It, it truly is good to see you all. I just <laughs> meeting you on these meetings. Um, but uh, as Tiffany mentioned, uh, there was a presentation of the Board of Supervisors this morning, and we have intentionally, through um, the arc of this RFP process, been aligning our presentations to the board in the morning and your council in the afternoon because this is a partnership and we're trying to make sure both legislative bodies and the public can hear the same thing at the same time. I hope, having logged in a little bit before and knowing what's in front of you next, this is a little bit of a lighter presentation, um, part because minimize your one plus dollars of very serious. This is really more of an update, and you have full opportunity as a council to make decisions in June at a recommended award date and at your full um, budget hearings to make any final direction decisions. So this is just to queue up what's in front of you is not is at least as I track it, any heavy ask, it's an update. Um, I believe in your materials, it's really just to accept the report, which I'll walk through kind of what was in it. Um, and then to direct, I guess that would be Tiffany, uh, to return in June, and I'll explain to you what those dates are, but I'm uh, me or our deputy person will be here with you all throughout the way. I do wanna take the opportunity to say thank you to Tiffany um, and to Laura, your city manager. Um, Laura got thrown into this after a resignation, has jumped in, and great partner, and Laura has been steady throughout all of it. We have become text buddies at all kinds of crazy hours trying to figure out important policy stuff so you don't put either of our electeds in a complicated position because, you know, putting putting a lot of general fund money together is a precarious, so the relationship's very important. So um, what I want to cover today, if you can go to the next slide, is um, a, a bit of an update on what has happened um, we were in front of the county board in November and in front of your council in November when you approved the RFP piece. Um, the big shift is because of the Omicron COVID surge, there was a request from our community-based organizations to delay um, the application deadline because they were all struggling with staff being out and they literally, some were saying we can't even apply, so we all approved the one month delay. So the update today shifted from what we thought we were gonna update back in November because of those changes. So there's next item is timeline updates. The appeals process, which I'll speak to in a little bit, is something that we've coordinated with your city um, staff, um, is actually county administered, but in partnership. So this was mostly an action we needed to talk to the Board of Supervisors to make a, a modest adjustment to timelines in our board procurement policy. So this is from this morning's presentation, not an action council, but I can answer questions. Um, the next is going to give a, a update on the applications received. The applications from our community providers were delayed a month and moved Friday, 5 p.m. just passed. So by the time we published materials, we did not have information. So we did over the weekend scramble and have a slide to give a quick uh, peek at what's coming our way, um, city and county together. Um, a quick summary of some of the panel process to play out so you're fully aware of what's happening between now and when um, city and county are back in front of our legislative bodies with recommended awards. And then a couple updates on funding partner updates. And this is interesting because this morning I presented saying, let me tell you about our partnership with the city of Santa Cruz. Now I got to figure out how to make sure this weekend. So let me tell you about now. That was one of the updates. 
But the other two are, we were asked by the board and supported by your council to kind of look at the potential nexus of both the community foundation, because they have an open um, bid opportunity, their philanthropic funds, and then also the local area agency aging, which funds a lot of older adult programs. And um, the city and county core dollars and programs core dollars have historically often augmented to the AAA. So we also did the reporting back and I have enough there. So next slide. Um, so this is just a quick level set reminder. Um, boy, I got here two years ago. I was told that this uh, C-O-R-E was a four letter acronym. There was a lot of energy behind the efforts of getting to what used to be called community programs before. A lot of concern and question mark and worry about our based organization. So we spent a lot of time with the city and the county engaging in a, um, our, our partners' um, optimal solutions, affectionately called the Nicoles, um, who you all most know, uh, spending a lot of time engaging the community. And I just want to confirm that this process remains very um, driven by feedback from our partners. They're very close to the ground. And so a lot of the RFP structure was driven by, and we continue that spirit forward. Um, the total um, amount available, um, and again, this is just a reminder, it was presented in November, is um, $5,879,000, and you have just a, a, over a million dollars. Again, I want to repeat, your council and our board has full discretion and authority during your budget deliberations soon to make changes to this. This is just what's out public in the RFP. You have ample opportunity during recommended awards and final budget deliberations to make changes, but this is just a reminder what's in the current RFP. Um, the structure of this RFP was based on a look back of how the city and county funded um, awards five years ago during the last procurement, and the agreement of the county board and your council was to organize this RFP sort of based on a tier approach so that there wouldn't be a dramatic shift in funding. So there was um, RFPs in small grant sizes, medium, large, and then the new change was this one targeted impact um, of $750,000. And there's a, a moment there to work with your council as we get towards the recommended awards. There's discussion in your uh, community programs committee and council about maybe augmenting it, on a, tracking that, and there's opportunity to address that in June. And then, of course, equity is sort of kind of front and center, looking at some of these uh, precious general fund dollars. Where does uh, two uh, legislative bodies want to try to operationalize? Where they make a difference to balance the playing field with some of the populations we're trying to support. So woven throughout this is not just words, but real intent at least to build an equity to the process. And we'll keep talking about that, especially when we get to the recommended words process. So next slide. Um, this is just to go back to what I said at the beginning, the community-driven process. Um, we heard a lot, and, and again, me as a new set of eyes, those who have been tracking this probably know this. I was really struck by how much the narrative in the community was history of this is certain community-based organizations were locked in and guaranteed funding, and if you knew or you hadn't been in the club, if you will, you couldn't get in. And so we spent a lot of time trying to make sure the playing field was level so that all community-based organizations who wanted to apply had a fair opportunity. So this just is a summary of what has happened since the November present public presentations to date. There were 64 training and technical assistance opportunities in all kinds of formats to help any community organization get some feedback and TA to help prepare their application. Um, and the, the numbers at the bottom are to show you there was you know 152 unduplicated people, but 298 participants that participated in the process along the way. And the quotes on the right are just surveys to kind of hear if we're hitting the mark and heard, heard some nice things, including it had, and some community organizations think like a little differently about how to approach the procurement opportunity. So we appreciate that we, we think we are still um, partnering with well based. So next slide. Um, this is uh, an update on kind of timeline adjustments because of the COVID surge and the agreement to delay the application deadline. And again, the right column is the bill process also difference of county and city, and certainly, again, happy to ask answer any questions if you have any. Um, so the deadline for applications were early February. We got approval to extend them to early March, which was last Friday. Um, that has pushed us a little bit from what was planned to come back to your um, council and our board in May to early June. I do want to recognize that 
years to have created an administrative wrinkle for your council. I don't think you had an existing published date, but we had no way of getting the process done before the 7th. So we're trying to line up our recommended award date um, on the 7th to go to the board in the morning of your council, and we can talk staff to staff and if you have questions about that. And that is because we want to, we actually really need to get back to the two legislative bodies by the end of June, or we missed a fiscal year cycle, which is very, very complicated. And at least in board process, we are already beyond the um, two one-year delays of the procurement cycle, so it could, would get complicated. So this is what sort of backed us up into these dates. And then that leads to the appeal process. The Board of Supervisors did unanimously vote to approve it. That is the county board procurement policy gives um, a, people who want to appeal recommended awards five days to file an appeal. We pulled it back to three. And then county staff had 10 days to respond to the appeal, and we pulled it back five. So we took the bigger hit to stick within the timeline. The update for your council is, and I don't know if it's in the printed materials, I think it is, but I want you to know this, is that we've worked with um, your staff, Laura and Tiffany, and we, the county, will handle the appeal process because every grant award has at least some county money in it, but we will coordinate the city um, along the way if there's any appeals, but the actual technical appeal process is drafted. This adjustment is the county here's first level of appeal. And then very important is this last bullet. All of that is sort of um, moot a little bit in terms of the role of elected officials at the city because you get to ultimately final decision what you want to do with your one plus million dollars at your final budget, um, depending on what happens with bills and what you think about the recommended awards for staff. The next slide. Okay, so this is the peak. We knew this was coming. Um, we did not have this information until after five o'clock. Um, but as a reminder, um, we had went to the board and your council and we had agreed to have these sort of tiered um, dollar amounts. And the funding that was approved as a structure was what's in the middle column, 598 small all the way up. It actually, no, all, over on the right is what is what we had approved, 605,000 small all the way up to 795 that um, targeted and the dollars are in the middle. What you see is how many applications were received for each of those tiers. And the most important point is the middle column. Much to our surprise, we got little bit under number of uh, requests uh, than the funding available in the small tiers. Um, so we had asked the board this morning for some discretion um, to work as county staff in partnership with city staff to consider after the rating panels um, meet to come back to both the bodies with some possible adjustments of dollar amounts and small to apply them to the medium and large given you can see there is three times the amount dollars requested than available funds medium and large. And then also somewhat interesting is there was a lot of interest in the concept of a targeted impact, but we only received two applications. So I, I don't know, we anticipate a little bit more. Um, so I, I'd recommend we go to the next slide and please ask any questions about this. That's our little preview of what's in front of us. So um, the panel process that's coming up, um, big push by the based organizations, and I believe in concept, both legislative bodies asked us to try to reach panel members that were mostly local. So we wanna let you know we have our panel members assembled and, and it turns out 85% of them are local. The 15% are not, is we did reach out to um, colleagues, uh, contiguous Bay Area um, counties that do this sort of work and have been participating in these sort of um, public procurements for these sort of programs this sort of objective set of eyes, but we're pleased to say that it's only um, 50%. Also wanna let you know, we created a conflict of interest policy in partnership with your city staff to make sure this is a very small community, as those of you know who the life for me is a set of eyes, everybody knows everybody. So we had to be very intentional in making sure we um, ruled out anybody being a panel member that had a conflict by um, closely involved with an actual applicant. Um, we spend an awful lot of time, and Tiffany has been your point person every step of the way, working with us, a group of people developing sort of a scoring rubric that would help um, view the panels and rank them and give scores so that staff could then turn around and record recommended awards, and further to make sure there was as much integrity as possible in the application of that scoring rubric. Every single panel member is mandated to go through training, and we have a 
full training process in place, support all the panel members to make sure we apply the scores fairly and evenly. The next slide. So here's where this funding partner updates are. So as I told the board this morning, partnership with you all. Um, so first is we agreed with your staff and us that because we've made a conceptual agreement on the second two bullets, which is this round of core, unlike the first round, where your city dedicated 100% some of your dollars, some priorities to you that did not have any county money, this RFP, every contract is anticipated to have a share of county money and your money, and then some of them will have only given the dollar amounts. So based on that concept, we've agreed in concept right now to have the county hold all the contracts. This makes it easier for the CBO so they don't have to have two contracts, one with you and one with us for the same scope. But we understand that needs to be done through an MOU that your legal counsel and you as elected officials are comfortable with, that you feel like you know, can't just be based on handshakes and good feelings. It has to be really locked in. Um, and then also the comment about the appeals process. Should there be appeal, we don't, this, the intent of simplifying the appeal process was to make sure that we um, could keep within the time frame, not to take away any ability of the city through the process to weigh in. So we want to put all of that in MOU and then come back to both the board and the city council so you can approve that MOU and that would help us govern the end of the process and how we'd oversee the contracts during the cycle. Of so then the two um, partner updates. The Community Foundation um, was actually a very interesting process because uh, I was in touch with Susan True along the way. You had mentioned it at your council meeting where I was present in November that we wanted to try to find some type of way to take advantage of them having open funding opportunity and some of the CEOs apply for their funds as they do ours. And so we had a conceptual agreement to sit down and report back and develop a plan to maybe grade some funding. Well, it turns out um, the Community Foundation made a choice to apply. To so uh, Community Foundation is an applicant, a consortium of CBOs um, for the core. So in conversation with through, I was given permission to share that we conceptually agree we needed to separate and firewall because um, the foundation, the, the optics were very difficult to imagine if just not legally appropriate for them to be both an applicant and behind the curtain with us looking at applications, figuring out where to grade funding. So that's the update that we've agreed to kind of pause and separate um, any particular alignment of their funding process with ours. Um, and then the last one is the Area Agency on Aging. Um, you may be aware, not uh, just a quick 30 seconds of context, um, Congress passed the Older Americans Act in the 1960s. California was codified through the California Department of Aging. There is federal and state dollars that target older adult programs. The absolute largest core grant is Meals on Wheels, a $500,000 contract. So it's a meaningful amount of core dollars. And for the first time ever in Santa Cruz County, AAA is going through their required public permit process at the exact same time we are in core. So this morning at the board, the board issued additional direction to us um, to make sure that we aligned our um, procurement practices, we received instruction this morning to pull out all senior nutrition applications for because they are concurrently an application to the AAA and the AAA is going to make their awards in April. So we were directed this morning to pull out money and wait and see what the AAA awards and then make sure that we align the core money with the AAA select. That's part of the C of collective impact versus ending up with different programs that were one. So that was a direction we got this morning. I can talk to your staff about what that means. Of course, I'm here to answer any questions. So next slide. So this is just a quick summary of next steps and then it's open for questions. Um, after today, um, the rating panels that have been assembled and uh, organized as I described earlier, next six weeks or so are gonna be going through a comprehensive training and rating process. We will be working with Tiffany and Laura every step of the way um, and then this will lead to our current proposed timeline of coming back to the county board and your council on June 7th with recommended awards. I think that's the moment when we will have potentially the biggest set of questions if CBOs think they should have won and they appeal. And I think that's gonna be the bigger moment. Um, then we come back to the board and your council, you, you, your council and your final budget deliberations. And again, that is the moment your council reserves all rights. This is your general fund and our county's general fund. You have no federal, state, or local restrictions to make changes, we are bringing forward the recommended awards 
to what I've heard, avoid having public hearings be the place where you make budget decisions, but have this procurement process in the middle, but you still reserve the right at your budget hearings. Um, then we have to work on the contract process. Council agrees and we get the MOU in place will be a county process, but you'll be aware of them and MOU will govern how you're aware of outcomes or data to your staff. And then we do want to make sure we um, initiate a lessons learned process after we get the contracts done because I'm, this is like serious business having six million dollars of general fund money um, and we want to make sure to engage your council and our board and the CBOs and sort of talk about what it will look like in years from now when we do this again because this is at the complete discretion of your council and our board how to use the fund so we are prepared to administer some sort of lessons learned process after all done, which we'll talk about again. And the next slide is just the closeout slides, and um, you're welcome to remove the screens. And I'm here to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you so much for that information and presentation. <clears throat> Do council members have any questions for Randy Morris? Or needs to leave. Uh, council member Kellen Terry Johnson. Thank you so much for that great presentation and all the work. I know it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, I have a few, just a few questions. Um, the applicants who will, I mean, clearly we won't be able to fund everybody, unfortunately, since um, we have just a certain amount of money, but the applicants who are, who we are not awarding, how will we, will we communicate with, how will we communicate it was then will we kind of give them an explanation of why their applications aren't accepted and what they can do next time around or with other funders? So I track that as, and thank you for the compliment. It, it, uh, to Tiffany, a shout out to her. This has been a lot of work, and I think you know Council Member Colin Tari Johnson on the other end is an applicant. This, this is a lot of work. Again, this is to help minimize legislative bodies having to make complicated budget decisions during a budget hearing, hours of public comment, which I know you are no speaker to. So, so anyhow, yes, it's a lot of staff time to sort of create that buffer. Um, the first part is a little simpler. Everybody will be, will, will, there's a couple steps. First step is if there was a disqualification process. The second step, you were awarded or not, which triggers the appeals process. Your last part, I'd recommend we come back to you in June because we don't have the process fully baked, which is how to make sure to give feedback. So we have a process in place and we're doing some staff work now and when we bring recommended awards, how to communicate in a fair way with everybody so they can take their own lessons with lost. You, as you know, you have to be careful with that during an appeal process. Okay, that's great. And then on the other side, um, I heard you say we'll have a, a lessons learned opportunity, which is really great. I've already gotten phone calls and texts and emails from um, colleagues who are grant writers who have given me feedback. So I, I would be interested in uh, learning more about what that process will be and, and how we as a council and, and city can support that lessons process. And can I just be really clear and direct? We would value, welcome, appreciate direction, feedback, participation from your council and from our board, because this is, this is unlike anything else the County Human Services Department deals with federal and state dollars putting out. This is your money. <laughs> so if we are the administrators and staff, we want this to be something that makes sense to you, your money, and something that makes sense to the community-based organization. So we have some ideas, but we would greatly appreciate keeping a list of everything. And then when we will come back and we would like to engage in a conversation about how best to create a lessons learned process, because in the end, we want to bring it back to you and you feel good and right about how the next process comes out. Wonderful, that's great. And I think we'll have the opportunity in our our um, core committee and work with the Nichols and that's really great to hear. Um, I guess just my other question is, once we have selected the applicants and then given the awards, um, what level of engagement will the county as administrators have with the awardee? Um, what, what's the expectation for sort of reporting on um, progress on milestones or outcomes, and how will that be created with the city and county? And then beyond that, um, how will we just engage the, the the awardees to just to ensure that they're successful in 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 their implementation and that we're true partners 
not a here's the money, go do your thing, but that we're really in this together. That's kind of a big question. <laughs> I think I tracked. Let me try. Um, the first part in terms of city role, um, I don't want to speak for Tiffany or Laura, but I think I'm accurate. We want to make sure that MOU locked in place and then behind the curtain is your legal counsel and our counsel. We want to make sure we can answer that question in a way that's transparent, is informed by you, as the because again, this is your general fund money. So we have ample time now in the finalization of the MOU between staff and counsel, legal counsel, for you to have that answered in the MOU. I think that bumps up to the second, <laughs> which is probably something that makes great sense to you all. This is your general fund, we have our general fund, and we have limited staff. You know? So in an ideal world, we would all have more staff to be able to work collaboratively. This is a lot of contracts. So in an ideal world, given core COR as far as results, we would like to have a collaborative partnership with providers and where and if things are slipping that we have the time to work with the providers that collaborative, not punitive. But I just want to be candid, that's also staff intent. So we are actually, not to get ahead of my budget process for my board, but we are looking at whether or not we can add a little bit of resource to be able to, on a county side, be a little bit more engaged than we were in the first round and granted the last two years. So I hope that's responsive to your question, but I think if we are true to the purpose of core, R is about results, we want to have that be a collaborative effort. Great, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work. It's exciting to see. Thank you, Calentari, uh, Council Member Calentari Johnston. Are there any other council members that have questions for Andy Morris? Uh, council Member Brown? I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say thank you, uh, here and other staff. Happen. Really, really appreciate proactive approach. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, thank you so much for laying this uh, framework out before us and running through the details thus far and um, this process. I um, it was. Um, very helpful and um, very hopeful. I think there were some good points in there. So thank you so much. Appreciate your your presentation and your. Are, are you closing out? Because I don't think this is a vote. And if so, may I make one final comment? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you and th appreciate the appreciations. I, I have heard what this was like in front of the elected bodies before I got here. <laughs> very committed to not having that happen to our board again by our process. And I do want to say, because I see Mr. Huffaker just logged in, I was scheduled, if your schedule held to 4-3, to sort of be a partner to Matt and Larry and Lee on your next item, which is one of the most confounding issues. So I just want to take the opportunity, because I have to jump off, to say, appreciate Matt. I appreciate um, Rosemary before Matt, because the relationship has been so unbelievably set in the last year. I've been here two years. and. There is not a more vexing public policy issue that I've ever seen about trying to figure out how to deal with sheltered. But I just wanted to make sure the spirit of what happened with 14 million work we did together and just the whole effort underway is an unbelievable turnaround staff to staff. So I just wanted to share that as a baton pass as I have to log out. I'm very confident that my worries that federal and state would not vest in county and city of Santa Cruz applications because we didn't get along. That's done. So we've got a good pathway ahead. That doesn't mean the issues are going to be solved tomorrow, but I wanted to share that as a at his leadership and, and um, to Larry and to Lee, who've been great partners, as Tiffany has been in core. So I hope that was okay to jump over to the next item, but um, I have to run to my uh, next meeting that I'm late to. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. See you in June. Thank you, Randy. I will be going out to public comment. <laughs> At this time, um, if I'll, there are... I'll hold in case you have a public comment on this. Then I'm <laughs> I'm curious. Um, it, it, so let's see if there are any members of the public 
you're interested in commenting on core investments, RFP and update application process, review panels and scoring, award funding, decisions process and amended appeal process, please raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hands. Your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will then be set for a minute. Okay, let's go to attendees. We have Reggie Meisler. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Welcome, Reggie. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. So I'm a little confused about what is happening with change. It feels like city money is being sent to the county and then the county uh, gets to decide what to do with it. Am I correct in that? Um, because it feels like there was a city deliberator that's being cut out and then the county staff is the one who gets to choose how to spend like city set aside funds. It, it, am I correct in that or am I misunderstanding that? So, like me to respond to the structural process? So this is part of the three minutes of the public comment and um, I just wanna give the opportunity to Reggie to continue and finish out any other public comment with yeah, uh, I, I guess if if I'm wrong about that, which I see a lot of like uh, shaking of heads, um, then I think uh, it would be good to have clarification on that because I think it's just, it's very concerning the idea that we would send up uh, sort of social service funding to the county and then we would have to kind of like hope that we advocated for our own general fund money correctly at the county level. Um, so maybe I'm just misunderstanding. Thanks. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, does anyone else, any member of the public have any further comment on item number 16? I do have Serge Cogno. Go ahead and uh, press star to unmute. Uh, hey, this is Serge Cagno. Quick comment to Randy. Uh, Thank you for you and your team and all the amazing amount of support that you've given the nonprofits. Um, all of the many, many uh, class webinars from the, the Leslie's and um, the support and the for and the one-on-one -on -one TA time has been an amazingly easier process for this grant application than others that we all that the nonprofit world deals with. So thank you. Thank you, Serge, for that public comment. Are there any other attendees that would like to speak to this item? Um, okay, I will bring it back to council and I will um, ask Randy at this point um, and or Matt manager to answer the question that one of the callers had regarding social service funding county and clarification. I I think it's probably appropriate since I'm the one who presented that led to that public comment for me to clarify what I meant. Is that agreeable, Matt? Uh, okay. Yeah, so short answer is city has no way, shape, or form that was my bad in our way or whatsoever. How it the RFP was both the Board of Supervisors and the city uh, agreed to the process that was at RFP. In terms of where any control or say is, is ranking panel process. That's not county staff nor really city staff, that's panel members who don't have contact. To the question of who has controllers, any of it control away, we are creating an MOU, which the city council has full say on. This legal uh, council has full say on to make sure that the way this money is spent is fully based on what the council, your elected court, as a way to make sure that money is spent in purpose, the way you want it. You also have the city council has an opportunity at recommended awards and final budget, final decision about where the money goes. And then finally, to how the contracts are actually manager, managed, it was in response to the based organizations that said, it's really hard to have one contract that I have to then have one with the, one with the county do things. So it was really to 
the uh, work of a community organization to get money from both city and county to have it be one contract. And since we have most of the money, all the contracts will have some county money for us to administer it. But then again, that in no way, shape, or form takes away the city's ability to make sure how that money spent is based on what you want and how you want it monitored, and that will be governed in it. So I, if I wasn't that clear, I was maybe guilty of rushing quick to get through this, but um, the council has many opportunities for money's purpose the way it wants, um, through the decisions and also the life of the contract. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. <laughs> we'll now uh, return to council for uh, deliberation and action on this item. Any further comment from council? We have council member. You no, know, I just want to thank you for joining us today and providing the update on this item and um, that presentation. And I'll go ahead and just move the staff recommendation with the accept the report, the collective of results and evidence based investment request for proposals, amended timelines, review panel process, coordination with funders, and then direct staff to return in June 2022 as described. I'll, I'll second, second that. that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> go for it. It's uh, Council Member Golder second. All right. Uh, we have a motion by Council Member Cummings and a second by Golder. Are there any further comments? If not, we'll go to a roll call vote. Okay. The clerk, Bonnie Bush, we have a roll call vote. Council member is Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Sir? Aye. Coming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Bruce? Aye. That motion passes unanimous. Thank you so much. Okay, looking at, um, I'm going to take a minute here just to uh, look at our time here for our next item. We've gone through our break and we have oral communications scheduled for 6.30. Uh, I'm certain. Now 3.30, talking out loud as I assess our next uh, agenda item. Um, Okay, so our next agenda item is um, item number 17, homelessness response quarterly update. And um, I would like to ask the, the council how, if anyone needs a lunch break, we've been going strong since 1030, brief 20 minute lunch break, or just continue powering through. Council member coming. Yeah, I'd be open to having you taking a break. Or... Hey, I see another thumbs up. <laughs> I know we have people waiting for um, comment on this item, and I want to be mindful of that, but I also want us to be clear headed and nourished in order to um, talk and work through this next agenda item. So um, how about we do a 15 minute lunch break, get some, some nourishment, and we will return at 45. Thank you. Welcome back. 
It's 3.45 and we're returning from a quick lunch break. So much. And as other council members then please put on your cameras. Welcome back. Like we're ready to go. Is everyone ready to go? Staff is back. Okay, speaker. Great. All right, I will continue then with our agenda today. Start at agenda number seven homelessness response quarterly update. Uh, for members of the public, for streaming this meeting. If this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Please note the public comment period for the below will be for both items 17.1 and 17.2. Public comment will be limited to no more than a total of two minutes. Or we'll have two minutes. The order will be a presentation of items 17.1 and 17.2 by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action on items. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our the staff, Larry and Wale. Homelessness Response Manager, Matt Huffer, City Manager, and we'll let you start. Thank you, Mayor Bruner. Um, Laura is going to bring up the presentation here real brief. Bear with us for one moment. Great. All right, Mayor and Council, um, I'm pleased to introduce and kick off um, what is our first homelessness response quarterly report, including a proposed homelessness response action plan, as well as a funding framework, 14 million state funding, and an update on major response initiatives uh, and work that are currently underway. So we have a full discussion uh, for the council and the community this afternoon. Collectively, these actions, proposed investments are intended to shift our overall homelessness response approach from reactive temporary fixes to a more proactive, permanent, and, and sustainable solutions approach. You will see that this work aims to balance individual needs with managing community impacts. The action plan was developed with a sense of urgency, acknowledging the growing public health crisis we have for us, and was informed by our regional housing for a healthy Santa Cruz strategic plan, as well as employees all of our city departments involved in our day-to-day -day response. It also responds to council direction, the campaign services and standards ordinance, as well as the oversized vehicle ordinance. It addresses diverse and albeit sometimes conflicting community feedback that staff and council have received both ad hoc and through community surveys that we've conducted over the last several months we will not be doing this work alone. Uh, you heard earlier this afternoon from Randy Morris uh, with uh, County Services, as well as Robert Ratner. We've been working with very closely as part of our housing health division with the county. And I would argue that we are working more closely with our county partners than ever before with a huge commitment to work together on developing meaningful solutions to challenges uh, that we're facing. But to be clear, while these are important steps in the right direction, challenges are complex and decades making and will not be solved overnight. The first step, new approach will require continuous evaluation and improvement as we move forward. It's also important to emphasize that this work can't be successful without community support to advance these actions as we move through this journey. 
from establishing additional shelter locations, supporting affordable housing development, and additional resources to really sustain these services over the long term. As we all know, long term systemic change can only happen with systemic response across the entire community and our region. With that, with that said, we're looking forward to today's conversation and hearing from the community and the council on today's proposals. Uh, Larry and Wally and our homeless response uh, team are going to be running us, running us through the presentation. And then we look forward to receiving questions and input from the community <coughs> as we move through uh, today's update. So with that, I will uh, hand it off to Larry. Uh, thank you, Matt. Good afternoon, Mayor Bruner and council members. Um, pleased to be here this afternoon to share with you this quarterly update from the homeless response team. Uh, we have three uh, component elements of our update for you today. The first is just providing updates and progress reports on activity and action that's taken place since the December 14th council meeting with our last report. The second item, as Matt referenced, is the Homelessness Response Action Plan that has been in development. Third uh, element is the regional, uh, an update on the regional collaboration on homelessness with our county partners. So the first section, some updates. Uh, first set of updates uh, is related to the safe sleeping, sheltering, and the camping services and standards ordinance. Uh, as you recall from December, uh, we've been working uh, with the Salvation Army to establish a program at uh, the Armory Building. Uh, that's a 75-bed program, 65 of which um, be ongoing and 10 will be an emergency on demand. Um, we are in the process and anticipate getting that set up uh, with the next few weeks. Um, it has been in an administrative process with Salvation Army and executing the contract. Uh, we've been in touch with them on an ongoing basis uh, and we believe we are close to getting approval um, at the regional level. Locally, um, there's staff um, from a county program is in place to be able to transition over. And concurrently, we've been working recently at infrastructure up at the primary building to be able to get the program established and running as quickly as possible. Uh, so that should be happening in the next few weeks. Also, uh, we set up the first transitional community camp that was part of the plan we presented in uh, December. Uh, that called for two uh, transitional community camps, the first one at 1220 River. Uh, that was um, opened in early January, so right about two months. Uh, we reached full capacity of that camp uh, rather rapidly. That was the result of a lot of intentional focused outreach uh, with uh, program prospective program participants, the bench lands, from the cemetery, uh, in other locations, um, there was a real uh, vetting process for that program, trying to engage folks who were ready to really focus on uh, making change and working towards permanent housing. Uh, it's only been a few weeks, but we've uh, had a number of notable successes already with this program. Because again, it's not just an encampment, but it's coupling it with intentional case management and um, individualized service plans. Uh, there's been a number of folks who have uh, staff has worked with to complete the acquisition of their vital documents, driver's license, uh, issues like that that will allow them to be able to connect with public benefits, um, for instance. Uh, so that's been a success. Uh, we've had placements and exits to better housing situations. We've brought a family. Um, that was initially in the 1220 camp connected with a family shelter at Housing Matters. Uh, there have been a couple of participants who've been able to make, get referred and get into drug treatment programs. Um, so short time, good outcomes. Also, um, in just the last week of February, uh, our staff was able to get access to housing vouchers through the Housing Authority and uh, on a very quick turnaround, which also included uh, getting some of those vital documents in place for folks, 
I've been able to connect a number of participants of the 20 River Program to um, get acquire housing vouchers. So that's success um, at this point. Uh, the second uh, transition to community camp, we're still in the planning process. It really is looking and learning from what's being successful at 1220 River. Um, and um, after this short pilot period, then look at establishing a second one. In all likelihood, we're looking at the second one being uh, focused around a specific subpopulation, whether it be a transitional camp for uh, disabled persons or all women, sober living environment. So that's still under consideration, but uh, we're looking at doing the second transitional community camp with that kind of specific targeted focus in mind. Uh, the other update related to um, safe sleeping and sheltering is we're exploring uh, a shelter expansion at Housing Matters. We've reached out to them to see how we can expand their capacity uh, for about 30 uh, participants at this program. This would be 24 seven program using pallet shelters or similar kind of shelters. Uh, it would also come with 20, you know, 24 seven ongoing program with case management, uh, housing navigation, with that full complement of wraparound services uh, that Housing Matters provides. So we're exploring expansion of the city's shelter capacity through a program there as well. Next slide, please. Uh, on the safe parking and OVO um, ordinance front, um, we had direction to set up a tiered safe parking program. Uh, so far, we have tier one that is operational at the police department spaces. Also, on February 28th, we opened tier two, now operational, operating at lots four and five. Initially, we've activated six spaces, three at each lot. Uh, there is potential for expansion at those sites to up to six spaces each. Um, and uh, as that program gets off the ground for expansion, we'll look at adding spaces there. But we're starting small, um, testing the program out, and um, then looking to expand. Uh, for Tier 3, which is a 24-7 ongoing program, uh, we received responses in response to our open RFQ. Those responses are being reviewed presently, and we anticipate the next quarterly update, um, not uh, a little bit sooner to have a contract to uh, move forward for consideration by council for a tier three operator. Alongside the state standing up the safe parking programs, uh, there's been a process uh, for permitting for coastal development and design permit, Coastal Commission. The most recent updates on this front uh, that the city's uh, development design permit was approved at the Planning Commission on March 3rd, last Thursday. Uh, so after that approval, there is now an appeal period that is underway. Uh, that, um, that appeal can go either directly to the City Council or it could be appealed to the Coastal Commission. Uh, so those windows are open. Again, uh, enforcement of the midnight to 5 a.m. parking restriction that's part of the OVO can only take effect after the permit process is complete. Um, on the encampment management front, there's been um, a number, number of developments since December. Uh, all um, in response to the rising waters and potential flooding along the San Lorenzo River. Uh, the low-lying areas of both Benchlands and up by Cemetery made the decision that those areas need to be evacuated, and we stood up a temporary evacuation camp, uh, first at the Riverfront Garage, which had easy access from the, the lower Benchlands, that moved over to Deep Park. That encampment was open from December 14th through January 19th. And it was intended to be a temporary evacuation shelter. And as soon as the risk of a potential additional potential flooding uh, subsided, uh, closed that camp. The individuals there were assisted in relocation back to the Benchlands area. 
also in January, lot 27, where there was an encampment um, on the lot and around the lot that was needed to be closed due to construction for a water project. So that took place in January. Following that, there was also a closure of the cemetery camp um, necessitated by environmental cleanup. Uh, that work um, that happened on January 26th. The environmental cleanup took about two weeks to complete. Uh, and at that time, 95 tons of refuse and debris was removed from that location um, and uh, is now cleaned up um, free of um, ongoing encampments. Um, so in each of those instances, uh, it's been important to note that in the closure process, we had coordinated consistent outreach um, to folks in those encampments to offer additional relocation. Our outreach staff, Chris and Jeremy, made contact with folks in those locations were available in the bench lands where we had additional space um, to assist get them set up a new location there in advance of these closures. Uh, while a number of uh, folks uh, did move into the bench lands, uh, uh, a number moved up to the river Levy area, river walk and levee areas um, have been impacted um, associated with some of those closures. We are currently in the process of working um, to help relocate folks in those areas as well to uh, the bench lands as an alternative. And we've continued the, the same kind of process of outreach uh, and noticing with folks in advance of those efforts. Um, I think just this week, we've Chris and Jeremy worked with about five people to move them into spot open spots. In the Um, and then the San Lorenzo Park bench land itself, um, there's been direction to work towards a closure of that encampment. Um, and then when the expanded safe sleeping and shelter capacity in the city will allow us to do that, projecting the summer of this year, uh, when those additional programs come online, we'll have the capacity to begin to work towards closing the bench lands and restoring it to its use uh, for the entire community as a park. Um, in addition to the additional shelter capacity, there's a couple of uh, other grant funded programs that have been initiated that are working at location to do uh, outreach, case management, and rehousing efforts. I believe I've uh, talked about those in a, a previous updates. Uh, but again, the we applied or the county applied for an encampment resolution grant back in December supported the city, uh, the city council provided a resolution in support of that grant just to report that that grant application was successful. $2.3 million award uh, that will support that outreach and rehousing effort. It's specifically targeted uh, for encampments along the San Lorenzo River. Um, target number is to assist 65 people um, to be able to get connected to housing. Uh, this competitive process had an innovation component. The innovation, innovative aspect of that program was really providing housing scholarships um, as part of their case plan. So really providing flexible funding as part of that outreach and case planning to support uh, whatever barriers individuals have that will um, circumventing them to be able to connect them to housing. So, um, that uh, is going to be able to resource that, uh, provide support to, to make people uh, able to make progress towards the same housing. Uh, similarly, uh, through behavioral health in the streets program is starting. Uh, it was augmented as well from the county through Mental Health Service Act funding. So they've made a five-year commitment of approximately $8 million over the next five years. Again, with a doing case management, a behavioral health focus, and working with folks, connecting them to services, and creating greater stability. So those are other efforts that are targeting um, that location. So those are the, uh, the updates uh, related to um, our ongoing homelessness response efforts. So now I want to turn and provide an overview of our homelessness response three-year action plan that's been in development. 
Uh, the action plan was informed by best practices that are set forth in statewide, regional, and local homelessness response work. It also reflects input collected from our community, all the departments. Uh, it also includes employees that are on the ground assisting this work every day, members of our homelessness response team. And then in an effort to jumpstart this work, we held two half-day workshops with department heads and the homelessness response team to, to reflect on what's working well, isn't working, and then ultimately develop a set of actions to shift our approach to more proactive solutions. And so here you can see the various inputs into um, our planning process. Uh, it was a very assertive timeline when we kicked this off to our presentation here today. Uh, we started with planning and homework, uh, reading those background documents, those state and regional and local plans, uh, advance of a February 2nd initial workshop that was gathering ideas and brainstorming. Then we had uh, the homelessness response team did some refinement uh, with that initial brainstorming, organized it. Then we came back uh, collectively again on the following week on March 9th, the second half day um, meeting and planning session to come up with the draft uh, proposal. And so we've been working on organizing it, planning it, uh, and it's ready to share it this evening on March 8th. So the contents of the plan. So as part of this process, uh, we developed a commitment statement around our homelessness response work, which is that in Santa Cruz, our homeless response will balance individual needs and community impacts from prevention to exit. And this work too is grounded in our values, specifically our city's response to homelessness centers on uh, values related to health, safety, collaboration, transparency, economic vitality, fiscal responsibility, practicality, and resource stewardship. As we, you know, engage in this process too, important you know, uh, process or an element of the process is really envisioning what was successful look like. You know, what are the results? Um, as a result of our plan. And so as we thought about this inclusion, you know, sort of the conclusion of the first year, what might we expect? The outcomes we'd look towards would be things like more sheltering leading to fewer large encampments and the ability to enforce CS the CSSO. It will have safe parking programs that lead to fewer oversized vehicles overnight on city streets, ability to enforce the oversized vehicle ordinance that San Lorenzo Park will be operating as a park free from encampments, and that there will be a safe environment uh, for all, supported by more community service officers downtown. And as we thought about future years and look at towards future years, uh, we can envision more people in housing and people living on city streets, uh, more treatment and support services available for those who are struggling with mental health, and substance abuse disorders, and just overall a greater sense of health and safety citywide. Um, so these are still broad goals and objectives, and in the coming months we'll be working towards some more specific metrics as focus in our specific um, strategies towards tackling homelessness. So coming out of that work, um, as trying to organize and refine it, it really um, it got shaped into five principal response action areas. Um, the first being building capacity and partnerships, permanent affordable and supportive housing, basic support services, include things like hygiene, sheltering, and storage, care and stewardship, and community safety. So I'll go into each of those in a little bit more detail and also um, give a few examples of kinds of strategies uh, and activities under each of those action areas. So for the first uh, category, building capacity and partnerships, um, this really looks at um, taking a holistic and integrated approach to expand capacity effectiveness in our homeless response work. 
So part of that is increasing our response capacity. This means building out our team to be able to provide uh, these services effectively. It involves re-engineering how we do these services. Again, that's more integrated and holistic. It's having specific staff members and specific roles. It is identifying partners who can play a role in supporting this work. It involves you know, other specific vendors to help on issues such as you know, ongoing refuse um, removal and cleaning open spaces. Uh, it involves building a task force of and business partners engage in this work. Then part of this too is engaging in advocacy for policy reform and bringing funding to jurisdictions like Santa Cruz that are confronted um, with disproportionate impacts with homelessness. Uh, the second area is permit affordable and supportive housing. And this really acknowledges that housing affordability and availability are a significant driver in our region's homelessness crisis. So our goals in this area are to, uh, among the goals in this, our area is, this area is to meet or exceed arena requirements for low and very low income categories, uh, as well as executing a master plan for Coral Street campus. And this would include development of a navigation center, which would include permanent supportive housing. Uh, the third area of basic support services speaks specifically to effective care and support services uh, that need to be placed to help break the cycle of homelessness, support our unhoused population. So among uh, activities in this area are addressing all levels of sheltering from emergency to transitional to permanent. It involves establishing safe parking programs as well as creating um, an infrastructure and a uh, programming for RV waste disposal. Uh, the next category, care and stewardship, builds off the basic supports, and it speaks to our joint responsibility to support our homeless residents, but also our responsibility for protection and restoration of our natural environment. So within this um, action area, uh, the activities and objectives include optimizing our response to mental health and substance abuse disorders, services, creating and partnering to create transitional employment programs to support uh, employment and income generation uh, for our unhoused residents. It involves closing the bench lands, as I've mentioned, and restoring it to its use as a park. Um, and it also includes enforcing other environmental protection regulations particularly looking at our sensitive watershed areas. And then the final uh, area, action area, reflects community safety. And this is about partnering to keep Santa Cruz a safe environment for all. So here, this includes equitably enforcing behavior, operationalizing our OVO and CSSO ordinances, as well as partnering with downtown businesses on a community safety strategy. So those are the overview in the broad areas. And so there's additional um, activities under each of these action areas. And what we begin, begin to do is map these onto timelines for implementation um, for the plan. And so I won't go into every detail here, but you can see is uh, the, different, the different color coding reflects the different action areas and each box is a set of a specific activity, and we're beginning to look at the timing and of when it starts and when it's ongoing in each of these areas. And what you can see uh, quite quickly just by the first page, which covers the first three action areas, is that this plan is really front-loaded in terms of our timeline. Uh, some of this work is already underway in terms of just the development of this action plan, developing a spending plan for $14 million, um, spoke to getting uh, safe parking programs for tier one and tier two up and running already. Um, but most of these activities are really starting in this year um, and um, are, it's, it's a front-loaded timeline. It's time to get to work.
Uh, so those are the first three categories. And again, these are the other two, care and stewardship and safety. So we're continuing to work on those and build those out. We'll be adjusting those timelines based off of reality um, and learning in the field. As Matt mentioned, this action plan is going to be dynamic and evolving that's responsive to uh, emerging needs and what we're learning on the ground. So continuous evaluation as part of this process, and that will inform our timelines and our sequencing in this work. So one of the elements that I want to dive in a little deeper on uh, is related to first action area, but we talked about building out the city's homelessness response. And you know, this work involves every single department. Through the action planning process, uh, there was articulated a need for some additional positions to build out the city's capacity to be able to do this work. As you can see here, we attempted to summarize it, um, involves uh, new positions or changes to positions in the city manager's office, but also positions for parks and rec, police and works. So you know, the color coding here really reflects back to those different action areas and roles that different departments have, but you'll see within our homeless response, uh, we have a couple of positions that are related to strategy and oversight, straddle, straddle that work, strategy, oversight, and then program and operations. Uh, but part of the change is to see, and uh, Lisa Murphy from Human Resources will speak specifically in a little bit to positions, but um, we'll have a deputy city manager uh, role that is going to be overseeing homelessness as well as other programs. Um, there's the homelessness response manager. Um, that is, stays the same. We are reclassifying a homeless uh, a management analyst to a homeless response services homeless service coordinator. Sorry, um, as well as we have our outreach and shelter specialists are currently temporary positions, and we're looking to institutionalize those and have three part time people who are working at a two full time equivalent positions. Uh, we are also looking to add a community relations specialist half-time position to support community engagement, outreach, patients. Um, and that's with all those positions are within the uh, city manager's office. With uh, Parks and Rec looking to establish uh, two new full-time positions that are dedicated to uh, land and re uh, resource and land management. Those responsibilities will include a response and abatement of illegal encampments, preservation of public spaces uh, and environmentally sensitive areas, and then res restoration of those impacted areas. Uh, they'll also re-envision them interacting with our outreach team, be able to be conduit for connecting uh, unhoused residents uh, to services. We're also, uh, and it calls for hiring and expanding the community service officers by two full-time positions. And then we're also looking to add a half-time position uh, with the job title building maintenance worker that will be responsible for helping maintain uh, and repair um, any of the city uh, shelter or safe sleep locations, safe parking programs, any of the infrastructure needs each of those locations. So that's an overview. And then I will turn it over to Lisa Murphy. Good evening or good afternoon, Mayor. So the item that I sent for detailed analysis of your actual, the action of 17Q. So I've condensed it into this slide. So your action today consists of adding 1.0 PE planning and development director. You're going to add the recommendation three positions for the homelessness shelter and outreach specialist one, two. And, and a one, two means it's alternate staff, higher lower level of the one, or the more advanced level. We add one full-time homeless service coordinator, add two SP community service officers, deleting a 0.65 position management analyst. 
That one is directly related to the services coordinator. Those two were swapping. Those two felt that it really needed, to, other than be a general management analyst that we use throughout the city, to be more specified in the duties of the homeless world. And also deleting a 1.0 F for the city manager. And for your informational only and not for action, no action needed today, is the existing deputy city manager, the city manager office. It's a one, two, again, meaning it's alternately staffed. And it's currently staffed at the two level because it was combined with the development. Now that will be reduced a point, and that's a salary. Yeah. But there is no action necessary. But I did want to call it to your attention what will be served. Next slide. And then for your future reference, as Larry went to, but it's not part of your action this evening, but I believe will be it is in the future is a the 0.52 building maintenance worker the two resource and land management positions, and the half-time community relations special. But again, that is not on your agenda this evening. It is that first slide that I presented to add, and that's specifically under 17. And that's it on the staffing piece. I'm not sure, Larry. Thanks, Lisa. I will speak to regional collaboration on homelessness. I'm Lee Butler. I'm Deputy City Manager and Director of Planning, Community Development, and Services. And um, you can go on to the next slide. Thank you. So regional collaboration is really essential for any long-term success in uh, homelessness realm. And I want to start by thanking many people in the city and in the county and nonprofits and those members of the general public that have contributed to um, our homelessness response efforts um, and to our knowledge base, um, both with this current action plan as well as previous have fed into this, as well as those who are um, offering service directly out in the community. And I'm going to focus um, largely on our uh, regional collaboration with the county on various homelessness related issues. Uh, we have been working really closely with the county on a wide range of homelessness issues. We meet with them on a regular basis, both staff to staff, as well as with the two by two, which includes the mayor and vice mayor and two members of the board, as well as um, meeting regularly with the, the county and nonprofits like Housing Matters. And then, of course, we meet with um, the county as part of the continuum of care meeting. So, formerly the uh, Homeless Action Partnership, and now the um, Housing Health Policy Board. And we've built a strong relationship with the county, um, in part based on the mutual understanding that neither of us have the full breadth of resources necessary to tackle the homelessness issue. And we've worked towards understanding each other's perspective, in part through better defining our mutual roles, responsibilities, and we're using those and understandings to ground our discussion in how to allocate our limited resources so that we're collectively working towards achieving our goals. One of those common goals is better data, and we've had um, some successes recently um, with uh, 1220 River Street, for example. Um, our city staff were recently granted access into the Homeless Management Information System, HMIS, so that we can track information on the same system that the county is, is encouraging many of its um, nonprofit partners and our nonprofit partners to also track data on. And they're, they're retooling that as well in terms of how that uh, costing um, is um, being um, uh, covered by the new uh, continuum of care rather than by the nonprofit encourage more participation. And um, we recently, last week even, um, went out and I know that there were at least six um, staff members from the city and um, at least four members of the council and, and probably more that I don't know about among across the city who participated in the point in time count um, last week. And um, 
that's going to contribute to our collective um, uh, data resources. And we've been supportive of the county in their effort to get additional funding through the HAP to do that point in time count on an annual basis rather than a biannual basis so that we can improve the data. And um, just one other um, point, Larry mentioned the encampment management grant. You'll recall that the council supported that encampment management grant back in December. And so we, another example of a collaborative effort and something that we're excited to uh, get moving on with the county. And next slide there, Laura. Um, so we've, of course, been collaborating very closely with the county on how to spend the $14 million that the state uh, is providing to the city as part of the current fiscal year budget. And the proposed plan includes approximately $7 million in infrastructure and about $7 million in programmatic support focused on preventing and addressing individual and community impacts related to homelessness. And um, this was the point where I was going to invite up um, Randy Morris from our uh, county um, human services department, the director there. And um, as you heard from him earlier, he had a conflict due to our timing. And um, I don't think that he is back on, but you heard the gist of his comments, which um, you know, essentially acknowledged that we are working really closely together with on a regular basis and do have a really strong relationship and have worked to formulate this proposal together for, so I'm gonna jump right into that. Um, uh, the, yes, thank you. The expansion of um, Coral Street campus sheltering, that includes some really significant costs um, related to um, hygiene bay repairs to provide um, uh, shower and bathroom facilities in an existing building there at the campus, as well as property acquisition on Coral Street. That um, total collectively comes to nearly $5 million. We also are embarking on an effort, something that I'm excited about from a, a planning perspective, um, to um, bring a consultant on board and do a design charrette that will help us uh, prepare a Coral Street master plan. And that master plan will then guide the future phasing of investments in the Coral Street area and help inform what land use changes we might pursue in order to facilitate the overall, facilitate realization of the overall vision for the Coral Street area. And then we've set aside some really significant funds, $600,000 towards um, environmental remediation efforts and towards pre-development funding um, for a navigation center out in the Coral Street area. And so that money will go towards things like um, preparing plans and setting us up to be um, competitive when it comes to grants. And that's something that we really, and moving on to the second bullet here with the pre-development funding pool, that's something that we're also looking to do throughout the county. And so we've got a significant amount of money, $500,000 set aside for um, pre-development uh, costs associated with projects, not just within the city limits, but throughout the county. And that will align us uh, to really um, leverage that investment to hopefully achieve additional grant um, monies through things like Project Homekeeper. So we've talked through eligibility criteria with the county, and um, we're really looking at targeting projects that need that initial injection of funds so that they can prepare the plans, so that they can then put in a competitive application for a grant. And that's going to expand our long-term capacity in shelters, in transitional housing, and in permanent supportive housing. And then. Finally, we've got structural investments to expand operational capacity for proactive response. And this includes things like expanding the capacity that um, Larry was talking about in um, the um, sheltering facilities, the transitional community camp, um, but it also includes case management services and the staffing necessary for those additional services so that we can help connect individuals 
with county services and ultimately with permanent housing. So that's the, the uh, 14 million in a nutshell. There's additional details in your, um, in your packet in the attachment with the spreadsheet. And I'll turn it back over to Larry. Great, thank you, Larry. Um, and I just wanted to close again, um, this is the same slide you saw earlier about, about success, really to link this regional collaboration around homelessness with the county um, and the importance of that alignment that we spoke to, that we're working towards the same of outcomes and success look the same. So this work is intentional. Um, and with that, um, that's our presentation. Uh, the recommendations that we're bringing forth to you all this evening are twofold. First, uh, we're asking uh, to adopt the Homelessness Response Action Plan by motion, acknowledging the associated funding requirements and sources, including use of $14 million from the state this response. And secondly, uh, we're seeking a resolution amending the classification and compensation plans by administratively implementing staffing to support the city's new homelessness response action. And with that, uh, we are happy to entertain questions. Thank you so much, Larry and Lee, for that presentation and running through those slides. I will now at this time bring it to council for council questions. And I will start with council member Cummings and then council member Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, <laughs> the, um, city manager yeah. and the staff that have been working on this. Um, just thinking back to you know when we started reopening the conversations around homelessness last year, um, one of the things I was very much advocating for was having us come up with some kind of plan because um, we just haven't had one forever. And you know, trying to pack this piecemeal um, is not a good approach. And so I just want to really thank um, Matt as our new city manager. Uh, the uh, approach that you've taken with making this priority right off the bat, um, getting this plan to the council. And uh, although it's, um, you know, it's a first step, I think it's really um, comprehensive look at how we can try to address uh, homelessness as a city. And I really also appreciate the goal work off of some of the information that's been brought forward in previous reports because uh, so much work has been gone into doing community outreach, getting input. And I think one of the things that I had heard from community members was just, you know, we spend so much money uh, creating these reports and then they just go and sit on the shelf, right? So the fact that we're actually taking what's been <clears throat> um, some of the input that we received from the community from these reports and now operationalizing it, I think is really a great step forward. I do have a few uh, questions. Um, I'll try to keep brief. Uh, but I think that, you know, with this being the first step of this kind of plan coming forward, there's been, there's a number of questions that have come up. And so um, I guess I'll just go ahead and get started. You know, one of the things that was mentioned in the report was that at peak COVID, about 1,008 beds in the county as a whole. And one thing that we've been hearing is that a lot of these are coming offline. And so I'm just curious if you all have the data on how many beds come offline from the county? And then also with that, what would have happened to those people, right? Because some of them, obviously, there's an effort to put people in housing. Um, but I guess the question and concern is that we are already at capacity with what we have going on at the lens, You know, we have what we see in our community. And if people are in these programs and now those programs are being closed by the county, the sense is that a lot of those people are just going to end up, you know, on the street again. I'm just curious if you can speak to that. Yes, Councilmember Cummings, I, I can speak to some of the detail on that. Um, I'm not sure I have all the information on the current status of the county, but I'm happy to, to update you all on what I do know. Uh, in terms of the county programs, I, you know, the capacity is certainly down with the closure of some of those programs, particularly around the armory, though. Uh, County has been working towards, you know, increasing its rehousing. My 
They're also looking at how they can um, uh, find other um, shelter for folks that they are transitioning from their programs, um, exploring options around master leasing. Uh, so I don't know the, the details of where they stand in that. Uh, my latest understanding is for the programs they closed at the armory, specifically are looking to close at the armory, they've got alternative placements for all but five individuals. Uh, we've been in conversations that as soon as we can open up our uh, shelter for, our shelter program at the armory that we can position folks there and there may be a bridge if there's a short time in between. So I know the county is actively working with the, the change and closure of those programs to really find an alternative shelter space for folks. Uh, on the longer term, it says, you know, that uh, pandemic-specific funding really allowed for expansion of that shelter capacity to levels that it has not been in. Um, and the pandemic has taken a toll and undoubtedly increased homelessness. So trying to find the right level of shelter um, for this community on an ongoing basis. There's a target number in the countywide um, housing for homelessness plan. It's really set 600 shelter beds as kind of that target number uh, for the county. Um, and presently, my understanding is we're somewhere around 450 something, if my recollection is correct, from the last update I saw. Thanks. Um, I know you mentioned earlier that um, there were a number of people who got vouchers at the, I think it's 1220 River Street. I'm just curious, if those people who got vouchers, how many of them are actually getting housing? Because I think one of the big issues is that people get those vouchers and then they can't find a house, right? And then those vouchers expire and then they're like kind of stuck in the same place they were before. So I'm just wondering kind of like how many of those people are getting housing and what efforts city making towards ensuring that the people who get vouchers. Yes, that's a good question. So um, it is too early to tell yet. As I mentioned, it was just the last week of February where those vouchers, um, city staff had access to be able to obtain those vouchers. They were able to get vouchers, I believe, for four uh, folks up at 1220. So that's in process. That's been about a week. Because you're exactly right. It's a you know it's a laborious process sometimes to be able to find a place to take the vouchers. So we will certainly update on the results. You know how many people are of those four that are placed. Great. Um, my next question. I'm just curious if you can touch on kind of the <clears throat> how we're defining transitional encampments because there's a number of different definitions that people have used in our community and um, twelve twenty River sounds like it's location that has a lot of support versus the bench lens, which um, I didn't really realize the city had determined that was going to be a sanctioned encampment. But if that's, I just want to make sure that people aren't um, getting confused with when we say we're going to, for example, stand up a transitional encampment in their neighborhood. I, I really want to make sure that <clears throat> we have and people can image, imagine what that is and kind of know that there are <clears throat> like, well, I guess the question is, are these safe managed locations provided with staffing or are these encampments that are just kind of run where we're just putting people and you know we're providing them with toilets and that. yes the transitional community camps is we're we're setting them up and establishing them <clears throat> they just articulate what they are so we they are smaller uh by design uh trying to create an intentional community among them. so the cap is really around 30 and we have our first one. That's what we're doing at Twelve Twenty River. We will learn um, how that works. So far, it looks good uh, and promising with results. But the model there is creating a smaller encampment uh, where you can build community, um, and you know um, it's meant to be self-managed on a regular basis. So again, as I mentioned, for Twelve Twenty as an example. It was real intentional outreach and selection process to identify participants for that particular encampment, folks who were ready to then engage and work in a case plan towards um, getting connected to services and supports and getting on that pipeline towards housing. So that's a requirement of that process. So that's where city staff 
are doing the case management with the folks um, at that encampment. City staff are on site at 1220 River every day, making contact with um, the participants and residents there. They have uh, they meet with each person um, once a week to discuss their case plan, uh, make those service connections, check in. Um, so there's city staff on site every day, but they're not there 24-7. Uh, a lot of the, it really is a self-managed community. Uh, there are volunteer requirements. There's a code of conduct. Uh, the participants in that program are responsible for man, you know, maintaining the camp in good order. There's agreements on who takes care of what tasks. So that's kind of a whole, uh, there's a real whole community that's built around that and it is supported, it provides, as I mentioned, that case management. So it's not just a matter of creating an encampment and, um, and not having those kinds of supports. Councilmember Cummings, if I could dovetail on Larry's comments, I agree with all the points he made. Uh, it's an important question. I think when the community here transitional encampment or transitional shelter, what they envision right now are the current circumstances we have at the Benchland. And I want to be crystal clear that that is not our kind of effective shelter. Uh, when encampments grow to that size, we're not able to provide standard of care, the standard of service it really helps to get those individuals on a path of supportive housing. But I want to be very clear for the community as we talk about establishing additional shelter, we're wanting to get out of the business of the current environment we have at the Benchlands and move to a more meaningful, higher standard of shelter for those other locations. And the sweet spot, as Larry had mentioned, is around 30 individuals where we can provide more hands-on case management services um, to help those individuals really move on a move on to a healthier path for housing. It also, and you'll see this in the action plan, identifies the goal of identifying 20 of those sites throughout the county, not just in the city of Santa Cruz, which allows us to collectively as a region try to meet that goal of beds with again a higher standard of service provided to individuals to really break the cycle of homelessness, get folks on a more healthy path. Um, I had a legal question around the 10 bed, 10 emergency beds that are allowed in for, for enforcement. And um, I'm just kind of curious because it sounds like, I mean, we have, um, you know, 150 beds is not going to allow us to reach the, the need um, in terms of the number of beds we need to house people. And I know that for years now, there's been a lot of <clears throat> issues with Martin versus Boise, um, but it would seem as if, you know, those 10 beds would build pretty quickly. And then as a result, we're kind of in the same situation where we don't have any beds available. Therefore, can we or can we not move people who are experiencing homelessness? And so I'm wondering if there can be any kind of discussion about that or, or how those beds are going to operate. Larry, really, if you want Hi, to take I, a first crack at it, or Cassie, perhaps. I think Cassie is weighing out. Oh, yeah. I popped in. Thanks. Uh, this is a good question. Um, you know, I think the city's goal is to, uh, at least my understanding, is to establish a level of shelter capacity um, where we can say that there is um, frequently or always some level of availability. So. Um, is to, to get to that kind of sweet spot where we've got availability, people can have the option to come in and, and uh, you know, avail themselves of either a shelter or um, one of these managed camp situations. And, you know, they sort of always have that. Option. And so um, that's sort of what the goal is to get to that number, uh, knowing that not everybody always wants be in a shelter or want to be in a managed camp situation, um, but that that option is available to them. So I hope that answers your question in terms of like the number we're, we're seeking. I think to help with the number, I think the, my question is, you know, in terms of if all of our, you know, if all of the shelter capacity is full, because I imagine we don't have 
you know, we're not going to have full full capacity for the number of people who are experiencing homelessness. And then, my understanding is that the reason for the emergency beds, as was outlined in some of the ordinances that were proposed, was so that you could enforce um, some of the these ordinances that are on books. My question is, if there's not capacity, where does that place us as a, in terms of risk of being sued? I think the idea is to develop that capacity plus the 10 emergency beds just to very sure. Okay, um, I'll, I'll wrap up my comments and questions. I'll wrap up my questions and I'll have some comments for later. Um, I guess I'm just curious as well, when we talk about case management, I'm wondering if you can speak to kind of what that entails because obviously, um, and this is, I guess I can make a question, but, um, you know, what does that case management look like and how are we kind of, how are we targeting different populations experiencing homelessness? So the idea here is that we have people who are, have substance abuse and mental health issues. Um, you have people who are, um, you know, maybe they're, they were formerly incarcerated and have issues with connecting to either family or kind of getting established. Then you also have people, we also have people in our community who are working homeless and they just can't afford to live in the housing that's available. So, and those people, for example, they just need an affordable place to live. So I'm just wondering kind of what case management looks like and how we're targeting those different populations. Yes, I can, I can speak to that. And I think with, with where we're doing case management, 1220 River is our, as a city, our first focused effort um, where we're intentionally doing that with city staff. Um, Chris and Jeremy, who've been doing a lot of the outreach uh, work uh, prior to 1220 and Benchlands, you know, we're responsible trying to make those connections to other services that may also include case management, uh, but weren't doing it directly for city role. But so 1220 and those participants really are the first uh, cases where we're doing that work. And what it involves really is case planning is, is individualized. So there's an individual service plan uh, with each person. And so their goals are based off their situation, right? So it's not in with a one size fits all. This is, this is what we do for every participant. It's really based off what their experience is, what their issues are, and what's required for them to be able to get the support, uh, to be able to be in a position to get more stable and permanent housing. And that looks like something different for the person. Um, but that's where the goals are set in conversation and interview with each individual, so articulating those goals. And then the case manager is playing that role of facilitating and connecting to those support services that are identified in the plan and doing tracking and follow up um, on, on those efforts. So if it involves getting them connected to a particular service, um, the weekly meeting would follow up and saying, so were you able to make that connection? Do I have to help facilitate a phone call or help you get to that appointment, whatever it may be? Um, so that's an ongoing process and it's very individualized, um, particularly with this group that is a little more diverse. Um, as we process what we found out of the same, but as we spoke to, as we think about doing uh, additional transitional community camps, there may be a more thematic focus that might allow us to have a more targeted kind of set of interventions with a particular focus, like you said, it's, substance abuse or it's around disabilities, et cetera, um, can be a little targeted in the strategies because there might be some commonalities among the population. But 1220 River wasn't selected based off of that. I could just add to that, Cummings. I would also uh, just share that the goal, the idea of presenting that team is really based on the local experience we have had in best we've had with both Jeremy and Chris, two examples who are currently doing that work. They can tell you today how many veterans are currently housed uh, in the Benchland as an example. And to Larry's point, uh, on an individual basis, help triage how best to connect individuals with the services they need and where they are. So that the goal is to really scale that model, utilize what's working for us um, here locally and scale that shelters that are being proposed uh, to really provide that meaningful pathway again uh, the goal that we all share 
uh, to permanent housing. That's that's the that's yeah, the spirit behind adding those. What we're hoping to. Do. I'll um, hold the rest of my questions, but thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, okay, Council Member Myers, and then Council Member Cohen, Terry Johnson. Thank you, um, um, Pat, out of the gate, all my discussions with members, almost off of the list. And especially want to appreciate all the work that work really come right away in operation. on that. Um, I just have a couple of questions that I received from working with lots of people over the last weekend. And I just want to recognize the hundreds of letters of support that you for the program approach, but also ask for um, I think that there is a lot of hope that so starting to develop a programmatic um, I want to recognize the county this now, but you know decades of really non-success or really just not really understanding the the issue for us to feel like with all the added Higher cost of housing, the um, drug and alcohol issue, rival of meth, you know, what maybe feel like a manageable problem will be a problem. Um, it is pretty problem in our And so I really hate. Really nice. Well, and again, um, I wanted to ask a couple. Of, um, one was, um, I think sometimes when we use words like "is" and we sort of talked about how we that as a versus how the um, want to verify that. Um, we think about that. I think about Jeremy and Chris. I mean, Chris, know the individuals, a lot of the individuals. Um, they know who they are, they know, you know, they're facing, they know skills that they need to basically make that initial cut or gain that. Um, that's a different type of service than, you know, um, but a case manager that may be department out of the county, okay, with those individuals, for example, on a uh, trauma-based situation or a uh, medical situation. So we say some is we're not going to be doing the work at uh, the specialized uh, folks at the county. Our, our folks imagine those uh, not correct. I just want to make so, you know, I've seen Jeremy, Jeremy and Chris at work, and I've talked with this. These are really work that are the people that start that cross by this level. That support service structure, though, remains health and human services. Tony, that's for the medical, the mental, mental health, behavioral health, other type of services. That can help get access to us having a basically a person there to help folks situation. That kind of puts in vision space. Um that that's correct. Yes. I mean that's and that speaks to the part of our conversation with the as well about clarifying roles and responsibilities. That's exactly right. 
But I think as well, the action plan, even though the city won't be directly providing those services, I think within the action plan is the city role working with the county to try to augment and expand those services where they're needed, but not directly provide those services. Right. And in talking local and state regional experts on this, this is that 12 foot of, you know, having someone that shows up not every day, but regular pattern, people feel safe, able to find that person, the place where they um, I think it's really important what this what this goal in relation. Um, my next question is, what's the vision for who may run the navigation? Also, a go is it? You know, what is what does that look like? Thrilled to hear that. I'll be off. Tried a couple of years ago and. Who do we look at? I would say, uh, Councilmember Myers, we're open to that. We have engaged in some preliminary conversation with Housing Matters that's very encouraging. They are a willing, eager partner on this work. You'll see in the action plan, we're already in discussions around an interim expansion of shelter capacity at the site. And I've had some great conversations with Bill Kramer, uh, the executive director for Housing Matters. So we think there's a lot of a lot of possibilities there. As kind of a follow-up to your last question related to related to the navigation center, part of the work is um, that we're striving towards is also expanding the capacity of our community-based organizations to take on some of this work as well. Uh, organizations like Housing Matters, Compass come to mind. Um, so that we can also expand our capacity in ways that's not necessarily just falling on the shoulders of the, of the city or even the county for that matter. That's that's part of our collective work as well. And Housing Matters is a great example. I think whatever the whatever the program looks like at the Navigation Center, it'll likely be supported by, by many parties, my guess. And as we move through that process, that'll be, that'll be part of the work. So would you imagine, Matt, that would might even depend on what the model is or joint powers authority or you know some kind of operation model that may actually that looks at kind of creative way to get that going without burdening one or what have you. Exactly those kinds of models. Yeah, there are a lot of successful best practices out there that we would pull from. Uh, we may have more to add on it, but absolutely I think there are a number of ways it, we would be pulling that from where similar structures have been successful in other parts of the state. My last uh, two other questions, one other question, and then I have one comment on kind of, I'll make a plug. Um, I guess Larry and, and Matt also, you know, we got several, many of letters that said, look, you know, we just put all this 14 million on the ground, boom, in one year. I wonder how realistic that is, um, and then um, whether you, as you're working through all these various aspects, you know, basically in the quarterly update where you would, you know, I looked at your um, at your flowchart there, Larry, and it's like those those bars may be shifting, I would imagine, and so quarterly updates are not only meant to look at the numbers and how people how how response response pattern is showing up, that's for at least tiny. But also um, scaling out any expenditures, get those sliding scales, get that kind of that where we would see the discussion that what would come to when you quarterly update. So adjustments schedule, for example, with the fourth. Yeah, I think that's right, um, Donna. And and with all complex plans, ebb and flows we move through. Uh, you all will see a detailed budget as you would for any department uh, or or divisions we're moving to the, the department uh, the budget development process um, and, and I think there will be there will be opportunities to explore more detail there when it comes to all the expenses being front loaded in year one and Larry had pointed out in the flowchart all the work being front loaded in year one 
you know, part of that is there's a sense of urgency of wanting to take advantage of the home key funds. We can get ourselves into a place where we have a navigation center that's close to shovel ready. Um, we've had some good conversations with the county and are optimistic that a pro this project could be very competitive. And there's only a window of time uh, that we have certainty around the, that funding being available. So we're, we're trying to hit the ground running, take advantage of the additional funding sources that are available. But there's a good chance, you know, some of that work is going to flow into year two and year three as we move. Okay. Right. Yeah, I, I appreciate your comment. Um, and knowing what shovel ready looks like, it's not a common term to a lot of the public how these large things really provide that time in the. Um, I think I'll end it there. I have a couple of comments towards the end. Um, and uh, I guess the last thing is um, I really appreciate the potential for looking at different shelter models or different shelter availability for special populations. Exactly right. Ability, folks, folks facing disability as well, not have a dedicated. Always very um, that women are living in, especially in um, all of you setting the bench in there way too long, caused way too much environmental damage to a park that kids or really, really appreciate ability. I'll leave it there and have my colleague, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Uh, I'd like to call on Council Member Colin Terry Johnson and then Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. And um, I'll also echo my thanks to um, everyone who's worked on this. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's been a long year and then some of addressing this. And I actually also want to acknowledge and thank all of my council colleagues for engaging in this very difficult conversation, um, right? This plan that we have for us today um, didn't emerge out of nowhere, right? It's been years of engagement and the 2017 homelessness plan and the catch recommendations, and then ultimately the policy directions that um, we provided as a council over the last year. So we've landed here and, and I think it's a good place to be. And I just, I wanna thank everybody for the work that's gone into it. Um, I, a lot of my questions have been asked by council member Myers. Um, you know, I, I too talked to a number of community members over the weekend who were appreciative to see everything in one place, uh, but those same concerns of um, needing a little more specificity um, there's a lot of specificity in the agenda report, but not reflected in the in the plan that we see. The plan's a little bit more of a step back uh, view. So I think I think Council Member Myers touched on that, but to to see that the next time around, um, and then I also had questions about the navigation center, and and glad to hear that we are thinking about uh, CBOs and other partners in the community not just for the navigation center, but for the service provision of many of these um, programs that we are helping stand up. Like I see the city as the entry point, the touch point that sets up the infrastructure, and then the CBOs and county who have the expertise, um, more capacity, everybody's out, out of capacity and doesn't have enough resources, but um, the expertise to really provide the services. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Um, I do have uh, one question that wasn't asked. That is that there was a big, pretty big number in the agenda report in terms of what we have been or are currently spending in response to um, the challenges that we see around homeless. I don't remember the number right now, and I tried to look back at it on my agenda report, I couldn't find it. But that, so that, how, how is that being taken into account as we think about the budget? Because, right, if we, hopefully, the intention is that we're not uh, in crisis mode and we're not spending uh, our resources and time and energy and 
funds in that way, we have this um, we have this approach that is that we thought through and planned out. And so, however millions of dollars we're spending right now in the way that we are, we're not going to be spending that. So, has that how is that being entered into the bigger scope of budget? That is my question. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the question, uh, Council Helen Tory John. So, um, the goal is to as we move into a more proactive and reactive response to relieve some of the burden on all of our operating departments that are somewhat of an ad hoc fashion called upon this with our homeless response work. Remember that you're referring to the largest pie of that wedge really just behind staff support. That's staff that are being pulled away from their other day-to-day -day work um, in an effort to help with this Herculean task of responding to the challenges we have in front of us uh, because we really had no other but as we move into this mode and we make these investments, it's not going to eliminate that, but our hope is to uh, lessen the impact on the department and uh, over time look at other ways and allow our employees that uh, never signed on part of the homelessness response team uh, to go back to their other work and um, have a more focused, more efficient uh, team that's dedicated to that, that work. And you'll see that reflected in the budget back going back to core of your question, um, and and over time uh, reduce the amount currently spending on that on that uh, response. Okay, that that makes sense, and that and that's huge. I mean, this this not only impacts those who are unhoused, but, um, community members who are housed, but our city employees. I think that's a really really point that you're making. It's it is about quality of life for everyone involved. Um, so the, those, again, my questions were asked, that was one question, and then I have other comments that I'll save for. Um... Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, and Council Member Brown, and then Council Member Watt. Thank you, Mayor, <laughs> and uh, thanks to everyone. Add my thank you to all of the work that's gone into this. Who have been, I know, working really hard to try to put us in a more proactive place, get organized, you know, invest some resources. And I, I do very much support, uh, for the most part, the direction that we're heading in here. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one I'm is a follow up. I just want to clarify and make sure I understand this correctly. Uh, this is a follow-up to uh, Councilmember Cummings' question about the um, holding back and uh, bots in a given uh, shelter or uh, encampment setting. Um, it, it sounded like, Cassie, I heard you say that the goal of, with that is um, to do that so that the city can assert its right to enforce the camping ban, um, because we can't do that if there isn't available shelter space, according to Martin versus. I know it's much more complicated than that, but that's kind of the idea. Um, so I think that's what I heard you say. So I, my question is, um, will keeping the number of people who are able to access shelter below the act actual availability simply to demonstrate that capacity sufficient for the purposes of not uh, having exposure to a, a similar constitutional challenge. Um, I'm still not convinced of that, so I guess I'd, I'd just like to hear more about that. Um, and then related to this piece of it, um, another question, which is probably for someone else, um, perhaps Escalante is on here, um, but whoever from the team has been working on this and feels best equipped to answer. Um, how will that, how would that work in practice? Um, how, how will the know which beds are available? And I've asked this question before. We've been through this several rounds where we didn't really get very far, and I will in this case. So um, I'll just ask it again. Um, how will will that work? Practice? Do you know where there's a 
um, before they issue a citation or move someone along? Would the person be transported with their belongings on the spot? Would they have to go somewhere advance, which wouldn't necessarily make sense because they wouldn't know that they needed to do that or they hadn't had the contact with uh, law enforcement? So I, I'd just like to hear more about that. So those are, are two, and then I have questions on the budget. So, so I can take the first part. Um, Martin versus Boise is couched in very broad language in, in holding, but, but it's also narrowed significantly by, by other language. And one of the narrowing uh, aspects of it is that the court said that uh, an ordinance that prohibits camping uh, can be enforced against someone who has access to free available shelter but just chooses not to avail themselves of. And so um, we've heard arguments that cannot enforce our camping ordinance until we have enough shelter space to accommodate all of the homeless people in the, the city. Um, that's a very expansive reading of the Martin case. And so far, the courts don't seem to be um, reading it that way, uh, as we found when the city um, uh, vacated the upper uh, portion of San Lorenzo Park last year. So I, to follow up, I recognize that, that I'm not suggesting it's all or nothing um, or all or 10, right? I mean, I guess I'm trying to get your opinion that obtaining kind of those 10 spots efficient not end up potential challenge. I understand that the courts have not said you have to have one to one ratio for every unhoused person. You have to have a shelter. That's not possible and it's always a moving target. So I'm not asking that question. I'm asking is this set aside of 10 sufficient? It sounds like it is in your opinion, but I guess I'm I, I'm not convinced. So I'd like to I'd like to understand the rationale for the difficult not I'm I'm not disputing your your reading the legal landscape around Boise at large. Ask about this. Councilmember Brown, maybe I can add to Tony's comment. Um, might kick me under the table, um, but I I would just add I think the point Tony's making. I think you know setting aside the ten beds. I think more broadly, our goal is to get to sufficient capacity as as a whole. Get to a point where those that want shelter, Cassie's point earlier, not everybody will, that those that want shelter, we have a bed available. That's what we're striving for. I know the ordinances have specific language, and I know the council has had discussions in the past about you know having specifically 10 beds always available. I think more broadly speaking than that, the goal is we want to get to a point where we have some uh, beds in place as a as a region. Um, and Larry has kind of mentioned. Generally speaking, that number right now is around six per beds, give or take, ebbs and flows, of course. But we're trying to get to we're, that's that is the goal that we are striving for uh, to get to that place. Um, and you know, the plan that you have in front of us, I think, will will get us there over time. I guess I would just follow up with that by saying, you know, ten beds is, uh, you know, it is that the fact that um, 10 beds are being set aside, is that going to make the ordinance defensible from a legal perspective? I look at it a little bit differently, which is as the ordinance is implemented, are we able to offer shelter to a person uh, on a given day when they're in the field uh, prior to writing a citation for the person? And if we are, I believe that the ordinance uh, can be enforced uh, in that situation. Typically, what we've seen is that legal challenges to these types of ordinances are not brought um, generally to challenge the ordinance on its face. They're brought as the ordinance is implemented on behalf of individuals who have been cited and contend that the citation uh, violates their Eighth Amendment. Thank you for that, I, and I appreciate the... the the lens which you're looking at it. I, I like that lens. I, I just want to 
I just want to make sure that you're doing this in that spirit. So I that, um, but so as follow up, then I'll just return to the question about how that would work in practice. How would somebody throw to potentially be cited um, then practice access that? That on the floor, I, I'm I'm resisting in the terminology of beds because you know they're not generally beds. They're mats on the floor. So um, how how will that work? Or from what? How, what have you? I, mean, I know that's something that's probably or potentially still in process. But just for, based on what you've talked about so far, I'd hear more. Well, uh, I could try to take a crack at that, uh, Councilmember Brown. Um, but I think maybe somebody like Larry, who's you know probably in frequent com conversations with the county, um, as as the city manager mentioned, you know these these. Uh, programs and locations for shelters are gonna be regional. So we do have to work with the county and I don't think it's been established maybe with uh, some conversations that Larry's working on is how will that work and how does, what does that look like? Um, you're right, we don't have a mechanism and we haven't had a mechanism to determine if there's any availability in our city. And so now that it's going to be more of a regional approach uh, it's definitely something that we have to work on on how we communicate not only to us but all law enforcement agencies uh, in the county that will be utilizing I, I believe those those shelters those housing uh, options um, and so as far as today I don't think there's a mechanism to answer your question but it is definitely something that will have to be touched on and, and worked on with the county thanks and I didn't mean to put you on the spot I just thinking about it like Trying to you know visualize you know envision what it would what would happen and thing that yeah. no it's a great it's a great question it's a valid question because oftentimes uh, I always add that input to well this is okay at three in the afternoon but what is it like at three in the morning right so um, it's it's a very important question thing thank you um, and then my so my other question is um, related to and I, I first I, I or I want to step back and say thank you. I wanted to just appreciate the staff at the time to walk through some of this with council members um, prior to the meeting. And so I, I feel like a lot of my questions were answered there. Um, and then also um, um, with the city manager on Friday, but I hadn't read the budget prior to those conversations. So I just have a couple of questions there um, related to some of these line items. And um, you know, I think overall it demonstrates you know, that we are we're serious. We're talking about making a, a real commitment and some of the things that I heard uh, Council Member Meyer say to sort of clarify what we mean when we're talking about, um, you know, case management or the, the people on the ground in the field who are gonna be um, interacting and supporting people in encampments and in shelters. Um, I, you know, I, I, I really appreciate seeing this. I'm glad to see it. Um, and I wonder about some of the costs here in particular, um, and if you may not be surprised that I'm wondering about the, the non frontline additions. And um, so with respect to program administration, um, I see here, um, I think I, I was gonna ask about planning and request for proposal specialists, but that, it looks like it's short term. I, I think I understand what that's about. But um, with respect to, for example, legislative act or advocacy, an external vendor um, at 430,000, well, half of that because a half time external vendor ongoing, um, what is that about? I mean, that's a lot of money. That's money than a their whole, as far as I can tell, for um, the kind of shelter. Uh, you know, outreach and shelter specialists. Um, we're we're going to spend more on legislative advocacy ongoing. So that I'd like to hear more about that, and then a community relations specialist as well. I'm I recognize that there will be a need, and I've I've advocated for a long time that we should get out in front of these um, kind of you know things, you know, as they you know, as they come up, we should get out in front of it with the community and talk with people in neighborhoods before we do something. 
um, that may have an impact. Um, but is that that what we're talking about here? And um, is that something that's going to take be a half time position at, at that level? That seems like an awful lot of money. So those are two, but I'd just like to hear more about. But I can speak to the first one, Councilmember Brown, and then Mary uh, may want to chime in to the latter. Uh, the first, the idea around that is the discussion that I've been having with all of you around wanting to build a statewide coalition to have a stronger voice in Sacramento on some of the legislative changes that really help, particularly those struggling with mental health, substance abuse disorders, it's kind of the, the, the leg of the stool that I feel is ignored on a statewide basis. Uh, although there have been some um, um, encouraging developments just in the last week out of the governor's office, that work is time intensive. And the idea there would be we would be bringing on um, a firm, an advocates firm that has specific experience in that area uh, because it does require special expertise uh, to assist us with building that statewide coalition, as well as direct um, advocacy work with our legislators. Um, so that's the proposal there. It may not ultimately end up being that full amount. Uh, that was kind of an initial flag that we that we used together. And obviously, those details will come forward when we're in the budget. But just broadly speaking, the idea behind it, um, the communication piece, and uh, Larry can chime in on this as well. And your point, Councilmember Brown, um, you know, Elizabeth Smith, our communication outreach manager now, is um, just treading water. She has a lot of um, responsibilities thrown, thrown at her right now, um, really at her max. And so this idea would be around building capacity, that extra level of engagement that I know the council is often asking for uh, on this work. And it also helps us um, adaptive to feedback we're receiving on the plan that we're rolling out. We want to know what's working, what's not, hearing directly from the community, hearing directly from those we serve. That's, that's the idea around um, around that position. Those dollar amounts probably both will move a bit, but um, that's the general idea. Welcome. Hey, thank you. I, well, I guess I'll just say, I, you know, my preference would be not, and I understand that approving this isn't gonna lock us in, but I would hate to see us get locked in spending, um, you know, just under half a million dollars a year on advocacy community relations and when there's a lot of need in in the in the field I guess it seems like a lot oh I'll, I'll leave it there thanks thank you council member Brown uh, vice mayor Watkins yeah, thank you, mayor. and um, I guess I'll just start by saying thank you to the staff is get this together I think in a really short period of time and you know, having been on the council now for five years, I remember when we first, when I first started, there was um, a subcommittee of the council members working on a plan and recommendations for the council. And since then, there's been the cash. There's also the alignment to a lot of other plans. And then there's COVID, a whole bunch of other things that happened. And then most recently, the policy direction given by the council to really think about how to kind of provide those guidelines moving forward and seeing this in a form of operationalizing guidance in, in policy and being iterative, iterative and looking at risk improvement is sort of how I see it. But you have to start somewhere or else you're sort of stuck in a position of inertia and unable to really see a lot of these, um, these great intended plans materialize. So I, um, I realized that we might not get it right. And I realized that my, we will likely get some things wrong, but at the end of the day, we're attempting to really address this complex issue in a holistic manner, to be able to move forward with seeing people finding more success and more independence. I um, so I guess those are sort of my brief comment. I think a lot of my questions have been um, asked and answered, um, but I, the one question I guess I'd like to, there are a couple of points I'd like to reinforce. One, just the closing of um, San Lorenzo bench lens and really providing more access families. I talk to parents on a regular basis at the school that my daughter goes to live down there that just don't feel safe accessing that park with their kids and they're, um, and they're um, expecting kids. So 
I think having that restored is really essential for our community, and I'm happy to see that in the plan. Um, also looking at the sub subpopulations, the veterans uh, housing go in, up in the um, valley area, looking at other subpopulations and how to address those. I know that was also brought, brought up by my colleagues in regards to really targeted interventions for unique populations. And it, although sometimes the housing isn't perfect or the transitional space isn't ideal, or but it's better than not being out on the street, out and out of a shelter of some sort. So I'm really supportive of looking at how we can, you know, continue to prioritize more sheltering. I think there is recognition, and really there's recognition from the governor at this point in regards to a certain population that does need to look at conservatorship and does need to look at how do you work with those individuals who are uh, unable or are refusing or mentally not there or in a different state because of whatever substance is, how are we able to serve those individuals? And I think that will be forthcoming in terms of a kind of a state direction. Um, but I guess my question is, um, essentially in regards to really establishing a number of these housing locations or these sheltering locations, part of what is in the title is transition. So I think, how are we working on really ensuring that no matter what, that this is not as sort of a landing place idea for individuals, but looking at how are we, like, I guess it speaks to some of the case management, but maybe a little bit further, but how are we creating that flow well of really trying to move people to, the more stable and independent living, um, if, if able, and then allowing more space for those that need to transition as well. And I don't know if you, Larry, would want to say that or whoever. Yes, Council Member Watkins, I'm happy to speak to that. And, and you're exactly right, the mechanism, I think the transitional, the transition and transitional community camp really is making transition towards permanent stable housing. Case management really is the mechanism to work with those individuals on those plans to make those connections, get them to the supportive services, get them into that pipeline to services, get more stable housing. So that really is the mechanism. And it is our goal in all of the city-sponsored programs, be intentional from the beginning that that's, that's the methodology and the nature of our work, that it's to, to create those connections and move to permanent housing and then having that capacity for the next individual to work with us. So, yeah, we're looking at initially we're setting four month timeline. I think that's a metric very similar to some of the county programs that are looking um, at success in making a transition to permanent stable housing. So that is certainly something we'll be measuring, looking at to this process. Thank you. And I guess my only other comment slash you know suggestion is you know in regards to really sustainability and and contributing to our community as members as fellow residents is how work on work development and ways to build their capacity and their competency so that they can find success and also belonging in a meaningful contributing way that we all, I think, can benefit from as a community. So I know you're partnering with the county, but, you know, sort of really factoring in the kind of the career technical, I think, also be. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Um, I guess I had uh, a, a couple questions that, that first I'd like to say thank you as well. Uh, this has been a huge undertaking and um, I just want to state that uh, my understanding and my brief time with the city in this role that this is pretty pretty outstanding um, being uh, the first time to really get this comprehensive and take this uh, ownership of investment into services and tools that are needed to address all the levels and um, aspects of this, this issue and our um, residents that are unhappy. Right? And, um, I, I, and so much that has gone into this. And so I appreciate all the questions that have been answered um, prior um, to this meeting, but I know that some questions have been from the community. And um, one, one of the questions 
I think, is um, that the funding, um, many community members are, are having a hard time with the large numbers of dollar amount of funding that's not really itemized line items, but more a general, um, not necessarily a plan, even though it's called a plan. Um, and so if, if you can uh, speak to those, those pots of money, and I know they've been mentioned before, the 600,000 environmental remediation, um, navigation center and things like that, if you can speak to what point those line items, uh, more details will come to surface and how you came to those numbers um, that you're asking for approval um, at this point in time um, from us tonight. Thank you, Mary Bruner. I'll speak specifically to that line item um, of the 600,000 and the, the navigation center and how we got to that. Um, that was a um, communication that we had with our economic development director, Bonnie Lipscomb, and coordinating with her to understand the um, upfront costs that we could anticipate. As you know, the city is going through a number of um, uh, development projects with uh, uh, the Metro South and the Metro North that are um, nearing uh, construction phases. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and we also have um, some phase one and phase two environmental site assessments done, which look at the, um, the um, hazardous material contamination at uh, particular sites. And so understanding the um, type of work that's needed to clean up the, um, the, the sites, there are standards that need to be met in order for residential occupancy. So understanding the level of contamination at the sites, understanding the, um, the, the needed cleanup to, uh, re to raise that to residential suitability, um, shelter suitability in this instance. And uh, then um, the costs associated with putting together a whole series of plans, not just the conceptual, but then um, looking at some of the more specifics, back to plumbing, electrical, structural, mechanical, really aligning us to be competitive for, and, and have enough money so that we can get good cost estimates in place for the overall construction and be competitive for getting the right amount of dollars and requesting the right amount of dollars when we go in with Project Home Key. So that's how that um, particular line item um, came to fruition was understanding here's the cost that we've incurred in other projects that have been that have had similar types of upfront costs and here's what we know about this site and putting those together here's here's a good estimate for what we might anticipate spending in, in that phase of the project. Thank you. Um, and the navigation center um, acquisition purchase um, what was that number again? Or that was that's a million? That's a three million dollar. So that that's three million. I mentioned five million because there's also a one point nine million, um, which is the hygiene bay, which the okay. council um, looked at the bid documents for that um, in early February. So that's that's an anticipated cost based on an engineering estimate. There, um, that's the one point nine million for the hygiene bay and how we came to that. For the three million, that is a, um, a negotiation that is still um, in the works for properties, property acquisition in the area. And our economic development director, again, Bonnie Lipscomb, is, is leading those um, efforts. And um, uh, you know, that's what we anticipate being the cost of this. Um. <clears throat> There was also a question around um, received several emails about funding mental health liaisons and not um, giving that money to police. Um, and, and so I just wanted to clarify my understanding was the mental health liaisons work for the county behavioral health and um, they're not 
they uh, work alongside a police officer. Um, can you speak a little more to that role? Sure, that, that's correct. And I'd invite Ida Splante to um, speak to their specific role, but you're absolutely correct. They're employees of the county work with the yeah, thanks, Lee and uh, Mayor Bruner for the question. Um, yes, so not only do they work for the county, but they also, as we have two now that work with our patrol staff, they actually operate out of their own vehicle and oftentimes respond to calls uh, when it's appropriate on their own without law enforcement or any uniformed personnel with them. Obviously, if there's a safety issue, we, we do respond with them to provide safety. Um, but it, the other part is sometimes they, they will handle calls proactively over the phone with an individual and get them to the right services, get them connected based off of the, the needs at that time. So um, although we have two now and obviously use more, uh, they do work uh, for the county, they work with us. And um, oftentimes uh, they handle calls proactively on their own and, and we're not even involved. Um, and they're not writing with our office any, any longer, actually due to COVID, but I think it's been a really good change. Um, and um, they monitor our radio, they have a radio with them, oftentimes jump in and either assist or take over a call from an officer. Briefly, just talk about the type of calls they respond to and, and their role versus Jeremy's and Chris or other types of services, just so it's clear. More of a crisis mode type of call, or yeah, I mean, that's kind of a tough question. Um, there's, I mean, a lot of different calls that they will assist on, but I think that's the best way of putting it is more of a crisis mode where somebody based off the call, obviously uh, is, is probably in some sort of mental health crisis. Um, and so, um, you know, or just based off the behavior that's described by a reporting party, um, sometimes they come to the assumption that there might be some mental health issues going on. So, um, you know, it's, it's, there's a wide variety. It's hard to kind of give you uh, to narrow it down, but but yeah, they're, they're uh, always monitoring the radio calls and what comes out oftentimes they can pick up on certain keywords probably that, that hang on their radar. Thank you. And I also wanna add that actually I do hear often where officers respond to a call and maybe there's been a crime committed, but the officers identify a mental health issue going on and they will ask the mental health liaison to respond, to handle that part of it once we've established you know, if there was a crime committed or not and, and what, what are the other resources this individual may need. Thank you. Um, so funding for more mental health liaisons in any plan we um, move forward with um, is, is to the county behavioral health. Um, county, yes, yes. I, Larry, okay. I just wanted that, to that's confirm. correct. Okay. Um, the other question was um, the um, one, one citizen wrote that the summary report in the transitional camp doesn't include where they will be located and at what point in any of this would community um, be involved at all in that process that is around that and what I would what I would respond to that question uh, mayor Werner that ties back to the conversation we were having earlier around that conversation of having someone on staff that this with that outreach work as locations are identified. Um, right now, the majority of the focus has been on the sites that Larry um, included as part of his presentation, the 1220 River, uh, the improvement to the armory, uh, the expansion that we have planned at um, the Housing Matters, Pearl Street Campus, 
Um, those are the initial areas of focus, but of course, one of the largest um, hurdles um, to advancing this work is often finding locations that are acceptable to the community. That's gonna be a, an important part of this work uh, as we move forward. And um, again, emphasizing that I think this more distributed approach also helps to mitigate potential impacts on the surrounding areas where those locations are identified. Um, and yeah. more conversations, um, but you know, identifying locations is always an ongoing Thank part of the work. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, okay. That was it. A lot of my other questions have been asked. I will um, turn it over to Council Member Holder <laughs> and then Council Member Meyer. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, thank you, staff. I I do want to applaud everybody that had their hand on this. I can see it's you know a comprehensive, well organized, more of an outline than a plan. I think um, to be more of a plan, I think we're going to have to look at more measurable objectives and some specific language around accountability and things like that moving forward. But the fact that we're here to me says a lot. The people, everybody that worked on it, it's. It's really amazing to see. Um, something that Council Member Cummings said earlier made me think just is ways that we can help encourage people that have extra rooms or places that they're renting out, um, how to how they could, you know, as landlords or, you know, as they reach out to the university with their housing forums, reach out to some sort of the navigation center where they could also be taking in people who are ready to uh, become housed and, you know, just ways for that we could help facilitate that, right? Um, so they won't have to be on Craigslist competing against everybody. Um, a couple of things that came up as questions for me during the discussion was when thinking about those project home key um, opportunities, is there any opportunity for the city to purchase properties that are not necessarily located in the city, like if they're in the county or something like that, but they would be city owned and operated or would they have within the city? Anyone know the answer to that one? I think the short answer is that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge often comes down to a uh, council member Golder of, of how to resource it in a cost efficient way. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things to consider with each site and whether or not it makes sense to, uh, utilize it, but in short, that, that is an option. And then another question that came up that I was thinking when we talked about this a little bit in our, I don't know, public safety meeting a while back was about the off hours when there is no mental health liaison as part of this to develop, so there could be 24 hour availability where someone could be maybe on call or something like that. And then um, when they're not, that's one part of the question. The second follow-up is that, when they're not monitoring the radio, when they're not you know, uh, responding to calls, what would what does the job look like for those folks? And do they ever go out to calls where there's a potential victim that needs um, some crisis counseling, if that makes sense? So sorry if it's like way too many questions in one, but that's it. Is that a question for... Um... I don't know who interim chief Escalante. I think so, but I'm not sure. If there's not a mental health liaison available, what is that? Is that, is that what you're asking? Well, yes, and like with so. But is the resource available? Yeah, the, how can we move to have that available 24 hours a day? And it seems like it would be they could be a valuable resource. At, on calls where maybe the person, if they're not available, if and if they're not busy with dealing with other folks that need them at that moment, be available to show up to calls where there's a victim that might need some crisis counseling or some mental health help. If that makes sense, right? Like, yeah, I'll answer your second, the second part of your question first. Um, we are the only agency in the county that actually has a victim advocate that works in our facility. 
and that is her role really. And so if there is not a mental health component to it, uh, we have utilized our victim advocate to either come out to the scene or we bring you know a victim back to the to the office um, and and that victim advocate also helps throughout the whole court process and all of that. So that would be more of a role for our victim advocate um, if it's just victim services and guiding them through that and there is not sort of mental health um, conditions that, that we pick up on. Um, and then the other question as far as 24 hour service, I, I think that's a great question. It's a, it's a valid question for our entire county to start considering it. And um, the timely question, I've had some conversations with our regional 911 center and how, and I know that there's other examples of this across the country and how we can implement some sort of mental health crisis support to the 911 center, um, which would be the 24 hour care. And really it comes down to just resources, right? And, and funding for that. Um, but I think that as a community, we're moving in that direction. But oftentimes, yeah, after hours, the officers have to, to deal with them if they need to at that given moment. Uh, they, they, they are provided training and are very successful in, you know, providing care and getting to the resources that they need after hours as well. So then the, the only other part that I still didn't quite get was that, so when they're not, when they're monitoring the radio and they're not out on a call when they're working, what are, what are they what are they working on? Like, are they uh, are they doing any kind of prevention or other kind of things, or or are they so busy that they're constantly just driving around? Um, I think, you know, oftentimes I will see them working on again, but maybe back to the office and, and ensuring that that certain folks are getting connected to these services and and doing the outreach to the the folks that are ultimately you know, connecting with some of uh, with, with some of the, the clients. So uh, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to ensure that folks are getting the care that they need. So, and, and sometimes it's working directly with, with telecare uh, or other resources that are maybe even outside the county. So um, thank yeah, you. They, That's good. Oh, go ahead. They, they, they stay plenty busy and there's a lot of kind of extra work behind the scenes that they, they follow up. Thank you. That's good to know because it's hard to visualize like what it would look like from from you know their day to day perspective. But I think that's wonderful if they're building relationships and then continuing that care like outside of the actual phone call time. That's great. Thank you. Does that conclude your questions? Thank you, Member Golder, Council Member Myers, and then Council Member Kellenberry Johnson. Of questions popped up, colleague. Um, first, um, I believe. Um, so I, I guess Larry or Pat, can you clarify that the, how they work with our neighborhoods and our colleagues are going to be in. <clears throat> Fine. <laughs> um, obviously, those properties that are well away from goods, manage, um, or maybe. Um, I also recalled, I thought it, that there was also hopefully a would actually, so instead of having 600 people, 200 people in each camp where it's like, um, my opinion, what crash 5,000 pounds of crack in an unmanaged camp. Um, can you explain to me a little bit more <coughs> or comment a little bit more first idea where, um, Larry, I think I heard you explain, you know, we're focusing on trying to get smaller have a set of rules and accountability and ways by which rather than having the Several living in a <clears throat> alternately suitable for having that abilities. And will those first community outreach development and not just showing up in a neighborhood 
is, oh yeah, these are going to be a neighborhood. What, where, and, and are they going to be in the county too? I mean, is the idea that these county keeps saying they're going to take on more shelter, but again, we're always short on results and long on, but you know, it, it still seemed to me that we've actually been able to have the what is that particular outcome, guys? Sorry, that was a long ramp. <laughs> now I'll, I'll I'll take a stab at starting um, respond to all the elements of uh, your question, Councilmember Myers. You know the the transitional community camps. Our our initial plan, looking at standing up to. This is a new model and a new approach for us, and so we'll continue to evaluate the 1220 being our first. But conceptually, these really are designed to be much smaller environments where it's, you know you can be, you can build community and you can also um, work with people effectively. Um, you know, which as you pointed out, you can't do in an environment uh, with a large encampment. So it's really designed with that kind of outcomes focus in terms of constructing the size and support services related to that work in a way that's gonna generate those positive outcomes and be more likely to be successful. And so that's the intent. I think as we move forward, as, as Matt mentioned, you know, looking at locations, whether it be transitional community camps, how establish other kinds of sheltering, location um, is, is one of those issues we have to grapple with, and certainly doing that kind of community outreach um, is essential to making that successful. And we did that as well, engaged the neighborhood around 20, 1220 River as an example. Um, we've done previous iterations with a different model at that location, so it's, it's not as new, but again, we made that concerted effort to let neighbors know uh, what the plan was there and, um, and met with some neighbors on um, before we started that. Um, new encampment, at, new camp at 1220 River. So you would use that same model at like also, again, are we asking did not our neighbor? A lot of misinformation got out about the CS statements made that you know, we're going to be able to allowed to be on sidewalk. I just want to make sure that very clear that process site um, you know, will be first hopefully over time that these are for basically facilities that people they have to sign a paper that says here is how I will live in this situation. And also is that there is the time limit, you know, with the idea that people are able to cut into part and or stable environment, getting back home to their family, whatever it is they need that touch of, you know, not finding out who the person is. So important. But again, these are, I, I just, very important that our public knows we're not going to create a bunch of small chaos all over town. We have that already. Um, and that, what I can tell is very unsuccessful <laughs> in helping people. So I just want to make sure and maybe get a little more clear what that all looks like. Yes, thank you. I mean, to to answer a couple of your follow-ups um, that I didn't include initially, absolutely just there is a participant agreement that is part of this. If uh, individuals can adhere to that, then um, they will be asked to leave the program, um, as well as there is a through this model and the case management, there is an initial, again, we'll be able to modulate it based off of what we're learning, but initially at 1220 River, as we're, as we're moving forward with this, there's an initial six month period to work through case management. And there's the expectation to be making progress towards those goals and working towards uh, exiting to a more stable housing situation. Um, that being said, we built the prospect extension um, based off of if somebody's making progress towards their their and their work plan and towards that, but there's some structural uh, barrier that's you know limiting kind of that transition. There is a mechanism to extend that. 
there is good progress. Um, but certainly, this is time delimited. We're looking to get that transition and movement um, and somebody who's dedicated to this plan to, to make that change. I, I would just add, uh, Councilor Myers, I agree with all Larry's points. I mean, this really is a paradigm shift in the way that we're approaching shelter. And I know the concerns that the community has and some of the concerns you're hearing from residents related to uh, what they've experienced over the years uh, and what they've seen in terms of what's defined as shelter. We're really trying to redefine how we approach that work going forward based on what's working. Thank you. Council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. I just wanted to comment that I have um, a lot of comments around mental health and behavioral health response, but I but I'll hold that for after there was just some questions that came up and Council Boulder had some questions. I've got some points to make around that. Thank you. Great. That concludes questions for now. I'm ready then to take it out for public comment. I know we are really behind on public comment, so thank you to everyone who has been waiting patiently to speak to this item. We um, did have for groups that reached out and were approved for extra time. Santa Cruz Cares, Reggie Meisler, Warming Center Program and Footbridge Services, Brent Adams, Stepping Up Santa Cruz, Serge Pagno, and Santa Cruz Together, Lynn. If you are interested in commenting on homeless homelessness response quarterly update item number 17 on today's agenda. Please raise your hand now by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature in the webinar controls on your computer. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. As a reminder, public comment will be limited to 60 minutes. We will begin public comment period with the groups approved for extra time. All right. <laughs> so going to um, our attendees and looking for my group, they're all there. Right? Um, so I will start with Santa Cruz Cares, Reggie Meisler. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, um, I'm not Reggie, but I am calling in from Santa Cruz Cares with concerns about the oh, plan. Can I just ask a question? I see Reggie Meisler's hand is up. Um, it, which one of you is speaking for the group for the extra time? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it'll be me. Okay, let's restart the timer then. I apologize, I just wanted to clarify. Um, so if our city clerk can restart the timer, and we will begin. Uh, thank you so much, sorry for the interruption. No problem, thanks so much for sorting it out. Um, I'm calling from Santa Cruz Cares with concerns about the planned use of the 14 million in funding. Barely half of the funding is being spent on actual infrastructure investment, which is what the funding was originally allocated for and what Santa Cruz Cares was directly told it would be used for by council members Watkins, Kalantari, Johnson, Brunner, and Golder. In the three-year action plan document, which provides us with these cost estimates and line items, the unfunded notation is said to suggest that funding will need to come from general fund, new revenue sources, or reductions to other services. There's an enormous amount of spending on light items, which are noted as unfunded after only the first year of operation. This is because these line items are not infrastructure investments, but operating expenses. Taking a closer look at these operating expenses, we notice significant resources going towards staffing of positions that have already had an existing city department with its own staffing budget. 
We want to specifically bring your attention to the spending on two community service officers, the vehicle abatement officer, and the two mental health liaison. These positions are likely to be put under the umbrella of the Santa Cruz Police Department, which already consumes a whopping 30 plus percent of our general fund. Having a fund, helping fund few new positions for SCPD for just one year, which will then have to be funded via the SCPD's budget and general funds in the years that follow anyways, is a transparently inappropriate use of this homeless infrastructure funding. The vehicle abatement officer and community service officers in particular are members of law enforcement. As we repeatedly point out to this council, there's a substantial body of research proving that law enforcement responses to homelessness are ineffective, expensive, and actively entrench people even deeper into cycles of homelessness. Based on the city's own estimate, the cost of these four positions alone could be reallocated to increase our pre-development budget for permanent supporting housing by over 50%. We are very supportive of supportive of the work being done with regard to permanent supportive housing in this plan and are encouraged that the city is moving toward more support of Project Home Key. Please reject the city manager's plan in its current state and request modifications which bring all spending in line with the homeless infrastructure project spending. We'd also like to add that after reading the agenda packet, it is extremely disingenuous to count the Benchlands camp as included in the 150 emergency shelter bed. The Benchlands is located in a flood zone as we saw in December 2021, campers were flooded out without any assistance from the city. They were left there to fend for themselves. Only after tents were completely underwater did the city offer to move people to adjacent parking lots. It is incongruent that the city has a goal of closing the Benchlands camp while also standing it up as, a, as work the city has done to give people quote unquote shelter. The city is woefully behind on fulfilling those 150 emergency shelter beds. The city proposes to close the benchlands in summer 2022, and the numbers listed in this agenda packet do not make up enough spot for people to make up the difference. People will simply not disappear because of their camp. It's literally just moving people around. We'd love to see the city identify more sites outside of the Armory, 1220 River Street, and the benchlands, and to use this one-time funding for that instead of giving the Santa Cruz police more money. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for your public comment. Uh, let's see, our next speaker is Brent Adams, looking for Warming Center Program and Footbridge. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi, Council, or what appears to be five out of seven Council members. Uh, Brent Adams of Warming Center, it's so good to see you all. Uh, great presentation, Senate Affairs. Uh, this is our eighth year hosting warming center, which used to be a backup early winter shelter. Yet now there's not a single emergency shelter bed in Santa Cruz. So we're the backup to nothing. Hundreds of people orient to us as their only stopgap against hypothermia. We activate based on temperature forecasts. And when we're not open, we become the hypo hypothermia geared distribution center, offering more than a thousand blankets, literally tons of warm clothing and jackets, hand warmers, rain ponchos, tarps as many people as need them. But I don't want you to worry about all this material entering the waste. We do laundry for hundreds of people each month. We're doing our 7,000th load of laundry and offering our 5,000th shower this month. Why do people prefer our showers at Foot Services Center to those at Housing Matters? Because rather than seven minutes of lukewarm water, we offer 50 minutes of pipe hot shower. We clean them in between each shower. Service oriented and instead of fences and security guards, we offer the much needed basics, including Q-tips, deodorant, razors, underwear, and hundred other basic items. We believe it matters that our showers are cleaned after each, don't you? We also host a shower trailer in San Lorenzo Park every Friday. Without incident and without closing a single day during the pandemic, we host secure storage for more than a thousand people. With inspiration from the Subcommittee on Homeless in 2017, We've defined what it means to offer transformative services ever since. Isn't it remarkable? People get clothing and bedding from us, store materials and other personal belongings on our property twice daily access and receive free laundry service. Can you believe we've already been doing this successfully for years and without county support? Warming Center Program and I have advocated transitional encampments for the past 10 years and even pointing the term after four years of touring Northwest cities, 
researching best practices, successful nonprofit hosted camp community. We kind of wrote the book on it. Last year, city staff promised nonprofits would have an opportunity to help share, shoulder the load of homelessness. We offered an RF, but now the city, that's my phone ring. I hope you don't have to hear that. You kill that. We offered an RF, but now after the city is running its own camp at 1220 River Street, Let's be clear, a city-run camp isn't a transition camp. It's missing key ingredients of community empowerment, secret sauce of personal healing. It lacks the humanitarian mission to foster. We're eager, eager to partner to operate such a program and demonstrate our vision of what's possible. Over the years, we've seen city parks repeatedly host as many as 300 people in unsafe conditions. They have the ability to camp near dealers and use illegal substances day and night privacy in ways they'd never be able to in a residential situation. Homelessness has become no longer a homelessness problem, but a substance disorder problem and a far larger population that would have would have helped the city last year, last winter, we established an agreement in a far corner of Harvey West Park. This community was successfully in place without a single 911 call for six months and later moved to a fenced area south of the fence where they remained again without incident for another seven months till flooding in December. Most of those are now in 12th. They were primed to begin community. We've reached out a number of occasions to city staff to help recontextualize the bench to something more like separated agreement camp zone. No reply. As you deliberate this homelessness response plan, I'd like to consider that organizations such as ours, successfully serving our community for years, have earned the opportunity to help to a greater degree. There's a large pot of money coming. That money has come and gone many times over. Where there's a welcome at, where's the welcome at and encourage participation? We do all the work for none of the money. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Okay, our next group uh, approved is Serge Cogno with Stepping Up Santa Cruz. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Okay. Welcome, thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor, Council. My name is Serge Cagno, stepping up Santa Cruz. I'm a consultant for homeless services and a member of the county's mental health advisory board. Uh, because of Council Member Golder's questions, I'll throw out an, an invitation to Council, to Chief Escalante, and to the public, the mental health advisory board work on creating a collaborative work group with all of the jurisdictions and the community to review our behavioral health crisis system, find and fill the gaps in our system, possibly using the roadmap, the ideal crisis. We had 78 participants at our initial meeting. Thank you goes to council member Palantari Johnson for attending. As 988 implementation for the new suicide prevention and behavioral health helpline nears, we'll be focusing on that subject with our partner. I'd like to take a moment for Sylvia Harris the foreground of Mr. Huffaker's building capacity partnership slide. Our community lost Sylvia recently to suicide. She was a beautiful soul, and always found knitting at community meetings. I'd like to mention my great appreciation for Matt, Lee, for Larry, and for all of their staff's intensive work on this very well thought out action plan. It's been reactive and opposed, as opposed to proactive long. I was a member of the catch, and it was this council which chose not to take action the recommendations of the catch for outreach first design as well as creating a city action plan our name was the overall homeless it needs action plan which created a much snazzier acronym work that out it was OSNAP. i'd like to point out that there was a lost opportunity in this action plan to not include the community and those experiencing homelessness and staff meetings creating this plan it is a continuing lost opportunity not leveraging the knowledge of our community and those experiencing homelessness anywhere within the action plan to review and make improvements throughout the next three years. I ask that you add an advisory committee to this action plan, which includes all perspectives of our community. To move forward as a city, I think that it, this is a moment we can work together and work collaboratively to manage the tragedy of those on our those struggling in the struggles of our city. To do that, we need to admit where our services are working, where they're not. Honesty and transparency allows for collaboration to improve. I appreciate Lee's emphasis on data. I'd like to point out a few places where the data and messaging is not in line with that. 
currently considering the bench lens as part of the new 150 safe sleeping places required to enforce the CSSO is not providing the required safe sleeping places. It's not in line with health in all policy require people to move to the bench lens when the city is not willing to guarantee their safety. It should not be considered a successful outcome of 1220 to revert, refer someone to another shelter or a treatment program where they'll be returning to homelessness at the time of their discharge. It's not effective to or consistent in values to support low barrier services, but not trauma informed care. Our shelters are always full by those wanting help. Saying it's necessary to make an ordinance threatening to go with citations to get engagement is not true and will not make the safe sleep sites more safe with those not wanting to be there. From the viewpoint of the home of a homeless consultant, the outreach and shelter specialist with only being part time will not allow them to attend collaborative homeless case management outreach meetings, provide case management, or provide housing navigation, which is necessary for the housing voucher. I'd also like to ask all of these services will still be offered if the Postal Commission or a lawsuit, either the CSSO or the OVO not enforced. Again, please consider adding an advisory committee, which includes members of our community, members of our community housed and unhoused, nonprofits, businesses, and other interested groups to support this action plan with ongoing review, suggestions for the success of this plan in our city. Thank you very much and stay safe. Thank you, Serge. Okay, our next uh, group is Santa Cruz together. And it looks like uh, phone number ending in 1705. Hi, I'm hi, I am not representing Santa Cruz together. Okay. Um, I just I do want to comment publicly, but I'm not the Santa Cruz Together representative. Okay, let's. Um, I'll go ahead and let you, um, and then I'll come back finding. Okay, but um, I want to thank staff and the and council for all their hard work, and I recognize that uh, this is a very very difficult issue with multiple causes and no easy solutions. And so I do appreciate that hard work. But so I do see a really glaring issue with this plan, aside from the funding issues in the year, in the subsequent years beyond year one. I think the biggest problem is the city of Santa Cruz, by um, most, uh, by the city's own admission, has one of the highest per capita rates of unsheltered folks in the whole country. And one of the, so one of the reasons is that we have, uh, Site services and have a bunch of, you know, tolerance. We, and we need we need to do our part for the homeless. But this and you know, following up on uh, Councilmember Myers and Golder's uh, inquiries, this plan is citing even more service, more shelters within the city. And what really needs to, because we already are doing our part, is we need to get some of these services, some of these shelters cited in other jurisdictions in the county, because it's just a vicious cycle. The more services we have, more homeless, unsheltered folks will come, and then and then we need more site more services within the city. And the other jurisdictions say, well, all the all the unsheltered folks are in the city of Santa Cruz. We know that's where the services be. So I really think that, um, you know, with all good intentions, and I think that should be the number one um, focus is Standing up these services in other jurisdictions. <laughs> Not to say we shouldn't do anything. We already are doing a lot, and we need other jurisdictions to take on their fair share. So, uh, thank you very much for hearing my comments. Once again, I do not represent Santa Cruz together. Thank you so much for your public comment. Um, I will try again for Santa Cruz together. If you can press star nine. Raise your hand, and then you can press star to unmute yourself, or press the unmute uh, control on your webinar.
um, he um, I wonder Mayor, if they, they can't unmute themselves until I give them permission to, but I can't, I don't know who it is in order to grant permission. I, um, I'm looking at the phone number. I think it's the 6959. I think that's what I have here on the list. There we go. Thank you. I, I just, yeah, I, I don't know if she's ready though. Hi there. Is this Santa Cruz together? If you can unmute yourself. Uh, let's see. Press star six. If you're on your phone or device. I can come back as well. There should be an unmute feature on the webinar on the computer or star six to unmute yourself. Okay. I will come back and move uh, to the next. Hand in line, uh, Jane Neo. Go ahead and mute yourself. Hey, I unmuted. Yes, welcome. Thanks everybody for the effort and the work that went into this monumental work that has been ongoing. Um, one of the things, um, Look at me at the boots on the ground in the bench land because I am the lead for the best. And um, one of the things that I didn't be included is a real focus on um, family. And if you set up certain camps, I just want to go back to Donna's uh, remark. You know, the women, the, also the men who have children, they are embarrassed where they're at. And if you set up a, a camp, there needs to be a place where these people can bring their kids and not feel like they're exposing. Anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, so I really, really urge for that kind of camp. Um, the other part is. I love all the ideas, and I know that it will take a ton, a ton of really hard work and a ton of extra people to see through. It looks good on paper, but in reality, this will take an incredible amount of work. So the more uh, you can allocate to having a process, go back, housing, et cetera, the better. DST is uh, really well geared to help with that, maybe even contact with them. Uh, I would really urge that too. And um, the other part is I would like, that's it. <laughs> Thank you for your public comment. I. Um, We'll move on to the next caller. I did get a message that the group is having technical difficulties, so we will come back to the group that was approved for extra time as soon as that is through. Um, in the meantime, I will continue with the hands raised. And it looks like caller ending in 0249. We'd love to hear your public comment. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and City staff. This is Carol Paul Hamas. I have a few very short comments from Westside Neighbors. First, we'd like to express our gratitude and support for the tremendous amount of work the city staff has put into this plan with all of its moving parts. 
We especially support the city's efforts to expand actual shelter and safe spaces type. We support the original oversized vehicle ordinance, which included the county as a partner as a means to increase safe spaces parking with services. Our questions are all physical. The proposal discusses hiring 10 staff and we're concerned about the unfunded liability for these positions going forward. Thanks to council member Myers, I actually don't have to ask the next two questions because she asked them and they were answered. But the bottom line is we really wanna say we don't want the city to duplicate the services that the county should be providing. And we encourage working closely with the county to make sure that the county provides the services that funded to provide by the state. Thank you so much for all your hard work on this pressing issue. Have a good night. Thank you for your comments. And our next for Reggie Meister. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, you know, I like some of what's being done here. I like um, homeless infrastructure spending that's being done. I like the um, <clears throat> line items about permanent supportive housing. I was a little confused because some council members were talking about not wanting people to stay here, not wanting them to be permanently here. But I mean, if we're aware of housing matters, uh, their primary goal is expanding permanent supportive housing. So, I mean, it's not about temporary shelter bed shelter space or something like that. So I was a little confused by the um, comments made by council members Colin Tari Johnson and uh, uh, I forget, uh, maybe it was Golder. Um, I guess the main issue I have with this is um, <clears throat> what Santa Cruz Cares brought up uh, in particular, that Santa Cruz Police Department is their own uh, city department with their own staffing funding and uh, they have a lot of the general fund as is. So I'm wondering why we're paying for things like community service officers and vehicle abatement officer um, with one-time infrastructure funding, which will then have to just like ping pong to be paid for uh, with the general fund and S funding the following year anyway. So, um, and I also find it kind of just inappropriate conceptually that these positions are sort of intended to criminalize the unhoused, uh, that we would spend infrastructure money to fund those positions. So I think I'll leave it at that. I'd like a motion to sort of change this up a little bit, uh, reallocate funds away from uh, the police staffing cost, and at least put that towards, towards permanent affordable housing, uh, permanent supportive housing. That Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next, I'm showing I am watching you. Oh, uh, hey, did you read or note the 105 letters that were sent in questioning the blowing of the whole 14 million in the first year of a three year plan and a desire that the plan should spread it out over those three years instead? Otherwise, this is the government obligating a future more and more obligation when blowing one-time money to start up a program and then asking the taxpayers for substantial amounts later and forever, perhaps that starts later this meeting. I count maybe 10 additional staff requested over time, and it is little mentioned those positions might go on for a lot longer than three years. Why some emphasis in placing these expenses in context with some other item focusing on explaining a balance on figuring out how to avoid terminal city bankruptcy is a mystery to me. I would love to hear what happens when all these resources are fully expended and the homeless spawn a coming. It's a question either no one has asked or for sure no one answers. Are you promising the illegal begging on the center dividers are gonna be gone forever if this path to wherever camping? When is the timeline for clearing the bank plan? Are you gonna measure the homeless population every year, including all who are on full support and admit if this does not reduce their total numbers, this is a total failure and go to plan B. As I have said many times before, why is locating these shelter units just outside the city not a priority option that would reduce the extraordinary density of homelessness in the city 
relative to any geographic uh, state city boundary in the state. If you build it, they will go. It seems success providing unfunded long-term shelter for those who will accept shelter so police can hassle or arrest to leave. It would seem this has an unknown outcome as shelter fills up. Surely some priority effort to spread homelessness around the county equalize the negative effect and there are negative effects on everyone is missing. Thank you, Comic. Our next caller, let's see, I think this might be Santa Cruz together. Uh, ending in 6959. Go ahead. Hi, this is Lynn Renshaw, com. Sorry for the second, I used the second number at work. Um, I want to thank Senator Layer for 14 million state funding. Please spend most of these funds on permanent physical infrastructure, spread the spending over the three years of the plan with the primary objective of replacing all, unsan all unsanctioned camps with fully managed camps. In 2018, the Homeless Action Part received 10 million. What is there to show for that? The grand jury report shows 46 people exited to house and 145 exited to a safe exit, like a ticket home. What is the exit goal for this 14 million? Create a dashboard, update it quarterly, showing results. Track exiting to housing, turning to family, entering addiction and mental health treatment, and more. The three-year action plan is a plan for a plan. The agenda report appears to contain the concrete details, the actual plan. Reducing fire risk could be a clear objective in 2021, the county published a report titled Wildfire Threat to the City of Santa Cruz. It mapped 142 fires in 2020, with many in the Pogonip, Harvey West, Housing Matters. The report notes, quote, there were 19 fewer fire incidents in Pogonip in 2020 than in 2019 due to the clearing of encampments, unquote. We cannot afford to lose additional house wildfire. Fire are irrelevant metrics for our dashboard. Um, further, is there a goal to clean up the city and reduce trash, beetles, excrement? Um, towns, trash, here, other potential metrics, as was noted about the cemetery camp and the 99 tons of trash biohazard. I want to thank everyone for hard work implementing the CSSO and OBO. The city's Bergman survey that came out recently found 73% of residents are concerned about homeless impacts on local businesses and neighborhoods. The majority of residents are with you with implementing these two ordinances. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Senator Layer. Our See if there's other attendees who'd like to comment on item, agenda item number 17, homelessness response quarterly update, <laughs> response action plan, homelessness staff and homelessness response funding sources. And press star nine, raise your hand. And I see Jacqueline Cuttle. Yeah, um, this is my first time asking a question. I'm not sure it's the right place. Is this uh, is this public comment just on this particular item? Correct. We will have um, in about one minute uh, oral communication. Okay. Then I'll put my hand down and you okay. can call on me afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, I see Dawn. Welcome. Um, thank you. This is Don Lane. Um, I want to thank the mayor and council members for this opportunity. As you know, I've been working on this issue for a very long time. It's been a long and frustrating process to create an effective system. And I appreciate that you are each scrutinizing the details of the current plan and set of proposals. 
for major system improvements before you today. Community de members definitely need to understand this agenda item. However, I do hope that beyond your scrutiny, you will recognize what a sea change this represents in the city's response to homelessness. It's comprehensive, it's appropriately ambitious, there are amazing new commitments of money and human resources. There's a much improved strategy. The partnership with the county is unprecedented. The plan reflects urgency we have not yet not seen before in the city's response. And it represents a lot of learning from our past mistakes. And I say our because I have been a participant in some of those. So I want to thank everyone who has put this very good package together and urge the council to move this forward implementation as quickly as possible. This has taken long enough. I'm sure it's not perfect, but it's damn good. I also want to add a word of caution. The homelessness response system can be excellent in every way and will still fail if there is not sufficient housing units so that each person, whether it's a school child or a person with a long-term long drug addiction, can end their homeless by moving into an actual home of some kind. Homelessness won't go away without adequate, affordable rental housing in our community. Thanks very much. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, I will have to pause this item. If that's possible, we have a time certain uh, oral communications for 6.30 p.m. on our agenda. And as we just saw, there is uh, a member of the public here for that. So um, <clears throat> at this time, I will um, go to oral communication for members of the public who are streaming this meeting and you want to comment during oral communications. Now is the time to call in and raise your hand for oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on the agenda. Press star nine on your phone or select raise hand in the webinar controls of your computer. And um, I will move out to oral communications. The first person is Jacqueline Tuttle. Go ahead and press star six. Thank you for your time. Um, uh, I, my name is Jacqueline Tuttle. I'm a member of COPA, Temple Beth L in APA. And um, we in, in COPA have recently met with the city manager and I wanted to thank you as the city um, for working with the county and developing this long-term plan that you talked about. We see that as something very positive. Um, I do have a, two concerns. Um, one is that there are many, many people who have applied for rental relief through the state. And the state, I'm not sure why, uh, is has not come through with all the funding that people have been waiting for. And therefore, when the, the uh, moratorium on eviction expires March 31st, um, I have some great concerns about people who will be eviction proceedings will be starting while they're waiting. And so um, we have a question of, is there a way that the city can work with the county or by yourself, extending our local, uh, making this eviction uh, moratorium extend for the people that have applied for this funding and are waiting for the money? I, I just have this vision of people, you know, being evicted when the money is on its way from the state. The second suggestion may be, if that's not possible, I hope it is, but if it's not possible, is there a way that mediation between these people who are waiting for their money and landlords might be recommended so that there'll be a way for people to communicate with each other? Just so many people, the, the vision of that is, is very troubling. Um, I thank you for your time and hope that uh, we welcome further um, uh, or continued conversation with you all on the city council on these issues. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. I will now move to the next member of the public for oral communications. That is items not on our agenda today. Gregory Cole, go ahead and unmute. Press star six. Unmute yourself or unmute on your webinar. There you go. Is that uh, unmuted now? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, being an ex-city councilman in another community, I know, know what you're going through, but nothing quite as difficult as what you're going through. But it is relative what I've called about. My name is Gregory Cole. I'm an architect here in Santa Cruz. Perhaps you used to drive about around my, uh, build, my uh, office on the corner on your way to the crow's nest there at the bridge. But all that aside, I am a law breaker. I have broken the law, and that is I have a beautiful, absolutely stunningly beautiful little two-bedroom apartment in my own house upstairs, which has been determined to be an illegal unit. I only bring this to your attention because I know I'm one of 650 other ones here in Santa Cruz City Limits who may be going through or may end up going through the same thing. And the city of Santa Cruz is losing two bedrooms for the next 20 years. I'm 75. My goal was to be here for another 20 years, so that's uh, 24,000 nights of lost sleep, those three people who were renting from me upstairs. I bring this to your attention because these are incredible, this is an incredibly beautiful little unit. I brag a little bit about it. I'm looking at the sunset now over the main beach, the lighthouse, the wharf is, uh, is out there, and I'm on the San Lorenzo River cliff overlooking the boardwalk as well. It's all just a beautiful location for a fantastic honeymoon cottage. It turns out that the people who have created this loss of a unit here in Santa Cruz uh, were on a honeymoon, and they'd been there for seven years until I had to give them 60 days notice. I'm sorry to say. Uh, as you know, that's something I can do no reason, and I have a good reason. But that aside, I think my goal is to alert you to the fact that it is not the fact that this is a dangerous unit. It's the fact that the regulations are tougher than they were when these things were built and maybe tougher than they need to be. Being an architect, and you and I have probably slept on those lofts with our grandparents or whatever, I have, uh, as you know, when you're in your bedroom, that's uh, about 95% of the time you're in your bed, your bedroom, you're horizontal. And in my six foot three uh, six foot three height bedrooms at the top of some steep stairs, um, it's perfectly comfortable for that 95 percent of my night. I'm bringing this to your attention because I think it's a very very important possibility that there are a lot of units out here we can preserve if we alter the regulations and we don't make sure everything is built according to what the current code is, but rather modified codes which allow me to walk up i'm six foot i'm six feet tall i walk into my six foot three bedroom upstairs and i wake up with the seals bark, barking upstairs but now i can't rent that out and unfortunately like i say that's losing twenty three thousand nights of sleep for those three people that used to be there while i'm here in santa cruz for the next 20 years it should be legal i'm not a dumb architect <laughs> and i really do encourage that possibility my number very easy to remember, I want you to walk through this unit with me. My number is four two, the rest is nines. I want to show you my unit so that you can maybe Thank think you. about what you I'm are, thinking about, which is I was never play. ashamed of this gorgeous unit and the people loved it so much they never wanted to leave, but I had to make it an ending. Thank you so much, I appreciate Gregory. your Thanks for calling um, your public comment for oral communications. Our next caller, uh, says, I am watching you. Yeah, hi. Hey, maybe you missed it, but the federal government declared the COVID emergency over. It seems they have a new emergency to replace it, but they sent Walensky out to do a most disingenuous 60 minute spot to wrap things up. I see no reason to delay it as uh, over any longer. Do you really want to be the last neurotic, paranoid, obey or else government entity to end their state of emergency? I hope not, because the government response using that declaration was and is a dreadful deceit and caused a lot of unnecessary damage. 
As the last meeting, sixth district and elected mayor election item, she sure didn't answer any of the questions I posed and have really lacked a detailed transparency as to exactly how November's election is gonna go down. That mayoral sentinel piece did reveal an answer to the question that there will be alternating three district elections every two years that was missing in the ordinance itself, but questions still remain as to how you will fairly choose which district will vote first while the rest scrolls their thumbs and I suppose the council members the two years remaining, if they don't abandon ship to go to the county, will pretend to represent those districts they might not even live in. The question as to why not put a choice of the mayor's term on the ballot for the people to decide, which you could still do even today, has not been answered. One wonders just how rigged this November's election will possibly become. For that matter, some of the same questions remain unclear as the alternative uh, of uh, the seven district initiative. If the six district initiative fails or we have a seven district. I missed giving my objections to the renter's prayer resolution, so I can't go into it much here, but that is pure welfare that belongs in the welfare system and renters instead deserve a piece of the property tax deductions instead, regardless of income, since ultimately they are paying most of those and receive most of the benefit from them. The renter's credit is more of the state throwing in the towel and individual rights because of inflation, like their rent control acts, and I don't see a resolution from you condemning the real cause of inflation, the prolific and moral exponential balloon debt spending of the federal government combined with a print money happy Federal Reserve banking cartel. Government spending money that they don't have before asking for more and more is going around and we don't have to look any further than the next item 20 to find. Uh, as to throwing the towel in on individual rights as in rent control, I wonder if it has dawned on you that when Cynthia Matthews pulled that yearly average 3.5% large rail increase figure out of her rear that they pocket. I wonder if anyone considered now or then the consequences of 7% inflation in 2021 or so far 7.5% in climbing inflation now. Eventually, we will have loss of runner mobility and loss of housing when investors decide that they're being squeezed too much and they sell out. Thank you for your oral communications. Uh, next, I have caller ending in 1705. For opportunities to items not on the agenda today for oral communication. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, I also have a comment on district, the six district map. Um, I hope we can get another map for the six district options because all three of the maps have this one crazy district that runs from Mission Street on the west side. Two of them go all the way to the limits of the city by the harbor, and one goes almost that far. And I don't think that anyone who lives in Santa Cruz, no matter what your political leanings are, would believe that the natural district in any sense. So. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm wondering, I know there's an option for citizens to draw their own map, but it seems like, especially in this press time frame, uh, that's, you know, a little bit impractical, or maybe the, the council could provide some direction or provide direction to the demographer to draw up a, another alternative for the Because I just think that uh, it's just, it's just not a natural district at all. And uh, so, yeah, if you could give some direction on that to the community and or the demographer, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other callers for oral communications? Items not on today's agenda. Okay, so that concludes oral communication. I will now bring it back to item number 17, homelessness response quarterly update. And uh, let's make sure there were everybody, public comment had a chance to um, weigh in with their comment. I will say in addition to the callers tonight, 
did receive 124 emails uh, to the city council email regarding this item with various um, broad and general, I mean, broad and comment on this item. So input has been very helpful. Okay, if that is it for public comment, I will bring it back to council members for deliberation and action. And this is, um, there's two, two recommendations on 17.1 to receive updates regarding council directed homelessness response programs and services included in the Camping Services and Standards Ordinance and the Oversight Vehicle Ordinance to adopt homelessness response action plan by motion, acknowledging associated funding requirements and sources, including use of the 14 million from the state for homelessness response. 17.2 is a resolution amending the classification and compensation plans by administratively implementing staffing to support the city's new homelessness response action. So now I will bring it to council members. Um, I see uh, council member Cummings and then council member Myers. Thank you, mayor. And um, thank you, members of the public, uh, my colleagues on the city council, staff for the wonderful discussion that we've been able to have this evening. Um, there's been a lot come out um, throughout this discussion, and um, rightfully so, since it's the first time this has come to us and the first time that the community's had a chance to look at this. So I just really want to, um, again, express my appreciation of the city manager and staff for pulling this together and um, bringing this to our attention. Um, I did have a few comments um, that I'm gonna ask questions earlier, but I felt like I, in the essence of time, I'll just make a few comments. Um, it, throughout the conversation, and what I've heard from the community, a um, few things that came up that were concerns were a need for clear goals and outcomes. And so, for example, I know we heard that um, Larry mentioned housing vouchers as, as a success, and I think um, one thing that would be helpful is if we're clarifying what um, what are good outcomes, because while somebody getting a housing voucher uses a, a success, I think we could all agree that making sure that person actually gets into the house is probably an even better success. So I think one thing, something that would help would be for us to kind of clearly define what the goals are we have for um, um, programs, especially since we're putting so many resources towards them. Um, there's also been expressed around the need for clarity around some of the positions. Um, in particular, there's a number of positions, for example, like the um, planning request for proposal specialists, uh, the legal legislation advocacy, the advocate that wasn't included. And given that those are some very highly paid positions that are taking a lot of these resources, um, people have expressed wanting to know more about you know, why we're, what the role of those people are gonna be we're gonna be funding them so heavily. Um, need for clarity around how we're gonna target different populations. And I think uh, to council member Meyer's point and some of the points we heard in public comment, you know, really understanding, you know, what are we gonna do about families, women experiencing homelessness, veterans, people who are, you know, who just kind of lost their homes, but are working. So really trying to figure out how we're gonna target various populations. Um, one thing that came up as well, um, I don't think addressed is that I had a conversation actually with one of the mental health liaisons and although they're using their vehicles and that was largely because of COVID, I actually think that, um, what I heard from them is that that's actually not a good thing because if they encounter someone who is experiencing a mental health episode and they can actually take them somewhere to get them help, if these people have kind of, they've defecated on themselves wearing soiled clothing, they have to put them in their personal vehicle and that shouldn't be the case. So, um, you know, I think that there needs to be um, a, a deeper look at whether or not we can provide, the city can provide vehicles for our mental health liaison since you know, they're providing this needed service and they shouldn't be putting 
not only mileage on their cars, um, but you know, potentially um, bringing people in they don't necessarily know, and city vehicles might be more appropriate for that. Um, I really do agree with the point you brought up, Matt, and I uh, want to just reemphasize that as we're doing this outreach, really highlighting what has worked in our community. 1220 River Street, what we had in the past, worked very well, along with um, some of the other shelters we've stood up at, whether it's 1220 River Street or uh, the San, the um, Salvation Army shelter that we had stood up on Laurel. These are all really good models of things that have worked. So as we're moving forward, we're really being able to um, put those models at the forefront when we're, in, when we're engaging with communities, I think is probably uh, going to be to our benefit because we do have models that work. We really need to understand what those models are. Um, one of the, the community members brought up 988. Um, a kind of call service that's moving forward around mental behavioral health and suicide and that's something that we really need to um kind of think about in terms of as we're developing programs what programs might fit within those models or that, that could benefit from that service and um i really do want to also express that the city should exercise caution when stating that benchland is a city sanctioned encampment i know that we are sending individuals there but there has been a lot around um just how that camp has been managed, the negative environmental impacts that's had, um, and the fact that you know, I, although the city is is allowing people to camp there currently, that is not an ideal model for what we want to have and what the city can provide as far as services are concerned. So, um, really, you know, agreeing with what was mentioned earlier by one of the um, callers that, that this is. What's at the Benchlands is kind of a legacy of um, the fact that when the county moved their services up to well, up to the armory, there wasn't enough capacity to move everyone from that area up there. And uh, after the court order was lifted, really haven't done anything to move those people since. So um, as we stand up you know, these various forms of shelter, many of which will have case management, um, I think we'll be able to show the, that we are, um, you know, moving towards models that provide health, um, safety, and security for people who are experiencing. Um, I'll leave my comments there. I think the last thing I would just say is that it would be great to get some clarity around case management, what that is and what it looks like moving forward. And with that, I've prepared a motion um, that I sent it to Bonnie. It doesn't include everything that was brought up um, Including the the stuff we the including the comments that we heard, but um, hope is that there will be an opportunity for us to address some of those uh, concerns as well. So Bonnie, you, wanna you know what? Send me a link. Oh. Okay. Well, I will send that. And then um, we'll read it. I can get it. Okay, I just sent it. There's no subject line in it. And I'm prepared to read that motion once you're able to put it on the screen. A lot of it is, I'll just say right now, a lot of it is in line with the staff's recommendation with a couple of adjustments and really wanting to see how we can work towards consensus because I think this is something that we all are supportive of. So the motion is to, and this is in line with the staff's recommendation, receive updates regarding council-directed homelessness response programs, services, including the camping services and standards ordinance and the oversized vehicle ordinance, to support the direct of the homelessness response action plan, acknowledging associated funding requirements and sources, including the use of $14 million for the state's homelessness response, Number three, uh, include under community safety bullet point six in the action plan, work with the county to prioritize and develop 24 seven non-law enforcement alternative emergency crisis response program and explore federal and state funding opportunities. Four, turn to the council for final adoption by or before the second meeting in April with information on goals and outcomes for programs and services to determine effectiveness. 
strategies for targeting and supporting the different homeless populations, and justification for new roles and costs for including but not limited to community relations specialists, legislation advocacy, and planning requests for proposal specialists. Second that. And again, this up is a second. But no worries. Go for it. So, sorry, I'm so sorry. You can go ahead and do that. No, I, no, I that's okay. assume that wasn't okay. going to happen. No worries. I was busy reading the, the <laughs> yeah, screen. The, the type, type I apologize. My screen. I can't read all of it. I made a oh, so, um, it looks like one is the same, Council Member Cummings, and two uh, yeah. is the same, just worded differently. No, the two is support. Um, the staff also says to adopt, and I changed it to support to express that we are supporting. Direction. The reason why I didn't uh, want to move with adopt because we adopt the plan. That means we're also adopting the budget and heard current budget. So wanted to see if we could express our support. Then when have it come back with some further uh, around some of these other line items that we discussed around that so we can adopt it. Um, at a, that's why number four has returned to council for final adoption. Okay, um, so I will, yeah, go to uh, Council Member Myers and then um, let's see, I see Manager Matt Cuthbert, um with. Mayor, yeah. Mayor, I just had a couple comments too, if I could, um, yeah. here's just some initial thought. Um, I think everything that's being proposed by Council Member Cummings is reasonable. I would request for a bit more time on item number four to give us all the first meeting of May to bring that work forward and that. That actually aligns with the next quarterly update that we would be bringing back to the council. Um, some of that work's already underway, but um, the additional time would be helpful. And then for clarification on point two, um, council's not adopting the final budget tonight. The budget will come through as part of the budget process itself. So that helps with some of the current um, additional details the council's wanting to see. We can certainly commit to bringing that work forward. Um, but it may not, may not um, need to weigh in on whether or not you're supporting or adopting them. That is one of the, one of the main declarations as well, but of course we would defer to the will of the Thank you for those um, points. Um, okay, there is um, that correction first meeting in May. Are you fine with that? Um, update there and the seconder. Okay, so um, Council Member Myers and then Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Hearing, um, real quickly on clarification of the end um, work with the county and with. That I'm just curious to find what you mean by price. Uh, just wondering if that for mental health price or not clear what emerged. Yes, that's for um, mental health crisis response. But what some folks in the community have been pressing is that you know, there's also calls for like wellness check. Um, whether it's behavioral mental health, um, substance abuse, homelessness, um, that those are calls that don't necessarily require law enforcement. And I think, you know, part of the example to what Council Member Boulder brought up earlier was, you know, we don't currently have 24 seven mental health liaisons going out. And there's also been um, indication that there's a, there's funding that's available for pilot programs to do this kind of, non-law enforcement um, emergency response. And so 
Um, the wording around how to frame it, I think, is has gone back and forth a lot in the community, and because um, some people say, well, it shouldn't be just mental health. Other things such as um, wellness checks, as I mentioned before, and also homelessness. So this is the best way I could, could frame it. It is the intent that the county would actually operate this different than, I guess, program that they recently started. I'm curious about kind of how it this pair with. Are you referring to healing the street or the yes. mental health yeah. liaison program or both? I'm I'm about whether or not this is additive million that was by the county and for example um Larry mentioned a program called going to be initiated and I believe that would be no I'm just trying to understand whether we work with the county something whether or not there's addition there's additive that is not envisioned with some of this yeah, I think it's. I think the purpose of this is so that it's in alignment and supporting what the county is doing, and also you know, creating a role here in the city too. Because you know, if this is a three-year homelessness plan, um, really kind of explicitly pointing out that we also want to have this, you know, twenty-four-seven um, emergency crisis response and mental crisis response. Um, because what we currently have is something that's not 24 7 and so i would actually um like to see the staff you know come back to proposals on how we can better define this working with the community working with the county so that we're not duplicating efforts but we're we're trying to stand up something that um that really addresses the concerns of the community and also um is working in collaboration um i have uh a friendly amendment, perhaps that might help with items. Um, so work with the county prioritizing support twenty four seven non law enforcement alternative emergency crisis response program rather than develop. I think there are several programs already uh, built. I think it's a build upon effort that we need to prioritize. Um, so instead of support and develop support and yeah, the support and build upon existing. Um, is that where you're going to? Okay, you're minimal to that. Yeah, I and I guess the clarification is, I would hope that this as a kernel of a, a program up because most employees would not. Then I just have a. Or my idea of um, the line there, uh, Bonnie, after it says, after the word nay, comma, council final adoption of the action, fire, after the word, if had. And I'm up. Yeah, okay, stop there for a second. Um, old is after the word add.
those are my additions. Also, for a point of clarification, uh, with the with the change that Councilmember Myers is asking for, that have an effect on moving from support to approval of the action plan tonight. Detailed implementation plan came at that date certain in May. Just a, just a, a question: Are we talking about the same things or uh, one? Might that might that move the needle on a? On an actual adoption of the action. Or was that for me, Matt, or for the maker? I guess it's a combination of both. Um, uh, just a question. I guess my question is. Um, You know, I feel like supporting the plan, um, it sounds like there's still some concerns with, for example, the finances and, and what these metrics are. So I'm just curious how you envision the difference between supporting and adopting. Like, what, what would that really mean um, if we're going to move forward with adopt? Because um, I think the big concern is that. Uh, by adopting it, we're also like as I mentioned before, we're also adopting the budget. And I know some of that will have to be back, but um, it does sound like some concern around a variety of the different positions and how. So I think that uh, if we adopt the plan and we adopt those roles and positions, I mean, forward with uh, the new classification, the other things. And I think there's some desire to. Have more discussion around that, and and also have some more clarity on on what the outcomes are. So, um, I just want to make sure that you know, as we're spending a, a very large chunk of tax dollars, that we're not only providing the opportunity for the community to weigh in, but also ensuring that we're getting concerns met before we're making improving um, what will be a a very expensive move forward. I appreciate um, that council member coming. The significant investment that is included in the plan contemplated. The only positions that are specifically being approved tonight um, are the ones that um, Lisa Murphy had outlined earlier. It was like hours ago, probably was hours ago, um, presentation. And then outside of that, there will be um, ample room for the council to give additional direction on final budget through. Um, that process over the next few months um, that helps try to resolve some of the questions about just around the other positions that are not included in uh, the council's formal approval tonight. Um, but I, I hear the concerns you've raised and some of the input we've had, but I appreciate your mind. And I guess I would just, I would lean towards the top tonight. Um, I am reflecting on some of the, uh, the uh, Mayor on Lane's comments. Um, well, please change. Um, and actually, had this kind of programmatic. Some of the, um, I got into they have very, very different. My past. Flag in the ground, adopt the um, we adopt this act, ask for those, those, those actual implementation. But put a flag in the ground. There is room for things to find us back in. Um, but I do feel like it is important. Depression state let Senator Laird and Member Stone. Um, was no other state of California that correct, correct, um, homeless and this effort already garnered funding in the five million the camping 
camping homeless encampment grant come in. And I think that's going sort of the driver behind all of this is to be seen as a city that's doing that ready, that's to accomplish both in as well as programming, thoughtful programming um, that has metric and um, ability to express any rightfully in the commenters asking. But I would I would expect make her the motion consider that all of these things out of us um, and take adoption. I had a I had a uh, a motion that would have had an part definitely option. Got to make decisions. Got to get it done. Go. So. <laughs> Mayor, I guess before I mean, I guess I'll. I know that there are other council members who want to comment, so maybe yeah. we'll get their comments and then. Okay. Um, I have some concerns, um, but do want to hear from other council. Okay, thank you, Council Member Cummings and Council Member Myers. Um, I will move on to Council Member Kalantari Johnson and then Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, to, um, Member Cummings and Member Myers for and and Mayor for um, massaging this motion. And I just want to I just want to comment and note. How far we've come <laughs> um, in the last year to crafting this together. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, I I'm, I'm supporting the direction that this is going. I agree that I think that we do need to put a stake in the ground and that we do um, commit and adopt this plan, knowing that um, some of the friendly amendments I was going to make were made, knowing that there is some specificity that's needed. Um, in particular around metrics, that are around the budget narrative, and that's in here. So we know that that's coming, and we know that we can continue to work on that. And, and I know Council Member Maya already quoted um, John Lane, but it is a sea change, unprecedented partnership that we're showing, and and we got to forge ahead. So so I I would support um, that friendly. I don't know if someone made. I think Member Myers made the friendly amendment shift that to adopt rather than support. I wanted to just make some comments around the behavioral health um, uh, topic that's come up over the course of the discussion. I have been uh, meeting with uh, community members, including community members who are on the mental health advisory board and um, colleagues at the county who work at behavioral health, director of behavioral health. And there's a lot that's happening right now at the county that's in the works and it's in the process. We haven't seen implementation yet. That's why we haven't seen outcomes and results. Um, but there's a lot that's currently happening and there's a lot that's in our way. Um, I think that for us as a city to be the entry point which makes sense. And then for us to um, really integrate with, work with, the county so that they as experts are providing the services is very, very important. Um, in the last year, we've applied to a number of grants. We've been, we county, us as a community, um, we've been successful in 100% of grants that we've applied for. And it's about $15 million over the last year and a half that we've secured specifically around mental health, behavior health, um, and some of it overlapping with uh, homelessness. So that's encampment outreach, suicide prevention, step down services, including spaces, children's crisis stabilization and residential programs, and crisis response. So what I recently learned is that we submitted a $3 million grant to the state, and we were actually awarded $0.9 million because they thought we were innovative and they thought we were doing a lot of work um, and we were ready to receive the resources and be in action. And that $3.9 million is going to do exactly what we are talking about tonight, exactly what some of the callers called about, um, increasing mental health liaisons, having co-responder model with emergency services, 
having a peer crisis support team, having an, a mobile emergency response youth. Um, so it, I mean, it's happening and it's really exciting. So I think we're in a really good place. There's also stuff happening at the, at the state level. There's um, AB 118, which is the Community Response Initiative Strengthen Emergency. Um, that's being established. There's a stakeholder group right now that's at how do we have alternatives to law enforcement? How do we get crisis response, really fully robust crisis response integrated into communities? Um, Cal AIM, so how we think about funding behavioral health is coming down the pikes. Uh, round three of Prop 47 funds with the Safe Neighborhoods and Schools Act, and then Newsom's Air Court. So I'm just I'm just listing all this because I think I think we're in a good position. So let's not waver here. Um, we started on this journey a long time ago, and us seven of us, community who's been engaged and staff a year ago, um, let's commit to this because there's there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of doors that'll open if we are primed and ready. And I. Think are. So that's it. Those are my comments. Thank you so much for comment. Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I'll start out by saying that um, I have a, a strong preference for support at this time. I think that there are, um, you know, I, I'm just not willing to adopt a plan that says we're going to spend 260 thousand dollars a year on legislative advocate without any other um i for example there are other areas um i i guess i'm going to ask this as a question i think it's a rhetorical question but i'd like to hear because um i'm hearing this insistence that we have to adopt it let's move um and so i guess i'm wondering what um would prevent our staff Council members, you know, people who are involved bring this forward from continuing to move forward at the same pace, all of the same activities, if we support this plan versus adopt it tonight. Um, so I'd like to hear um, from those of you who are suggesting that we must adopt it now in order to get things done, how supporting this and asking for more information before an official adopt and adoption would prevent that undermine that. Um, would, uh, see, would Matt Tufficker, city manager, like to speak? The work of ADOPT to support what city staff would continue or not be able to continue that different. Uh, a few thoughts and to that, Councilmember Brown, and I appreciate the, the, the question. I, I think it does, a, it does a couple of things. One, it, it sends a clear message to the, the community and the organization that we have a firm plan in place. The community is eager to start moving forward with this work in earnest. Um, it also gives clarity in our homelessness response team the ability to take the direction tonight and come back with that detailed plan that the council was asking for. Uh, there are additional details we need to bring back to the council, and I appreciate the questions about conditions, justification for need. Um, and I, I also just want to make clear that this is going to be an ongoing conversation, session with the council, uh, with lots of decisions to come um, for the course of this work. Um, and I also admit it's a big, complex, multi-layered plan that we're asking um, the council support on tonight. So I, I, um, I don't envy uh, in, in your role and having to make a, a decision on it tonight, but it would be helpful in our work uh, to move these various actions. Again, if I could just, I, I still don't understand what they're not going to be able to do if we say that we're supporting this now as opposed to adoption. And perhaps this is just me. I would really like to support this. I would like this to be a unanimous vote. But I, I cannot, in good conscience, vote to adopt a plan that includes, again, $116,000 for a legislative advocate, um, you know, hiring 
community service officers, for example, as part of this budget without knowing what that procedure will be for hiring? Will they specifically be dedicated to um, homelessness response or you know addressing public space where there are issues related to um, our unhoused and I don't need all of my questions answered, but I think those are pretty fundamental questions. Um, and so I'm, I don't, they're nitpicking kind of questions. They're pretty big questions about a pretty significant chunk of money. So I guess I'm just, again, trying to understand what you can't do supporting this as opposed to adopting it, which I believe, um, yes, it sends a clear message, um, but it, it sends a clear message that they're committed to spending money on that I'm not ready to, you know, I mean, we're not adopting a budget, of course, but we're saying this is a plan and that's part of the plan. We adopted this. But if we want to adopt something, I mean, I'll, then I'll start picking it apart and talk about the things that I think make sense to adopt right now because a lot of work has gone into this. Um, but there's kind of bells and whistles and some direction there that are, is not in So I guess I just, I, I guess I just don't feel. I mean, we're being we're being told that adopting is important as a way to send a message to um, get get moving. And I guess um, I'm I'm not entirely that mess mess. If it well, some of this stuff is going to can't really tell you about this, um, you know. And I'm sorry, it's difficult about this. But it's a really big deal, as everybody's saying. And I just don't like saying we're going to support this right now. We could do an official adoption. Get that some of that information back. Um, it it just doesn't seem like. I mean, it's either it's a big deal and it's not a big deal is what I'm hearing. And so I I'm still just I, I, what will we not be able? To do? Yeah. So I, I appreciate the directness of your question, Councilmember Brown. Right. This is an important decision tonight. I think most specifically and most importantly, it would delay our hiring of the positions we're asking for tonight, uh, which will, to a certain respect, hinder some of our, our work as a team, start getting fully resourced up. It would delay some of that work until we bring back um, bring back that decision to the council. So that's, that's a specific example of what would be delayed by not having a final adoption tonight. If there are specific questions related to the CSO team as an example, we will do our best to try to answer those tonight. So the council feels comfortable with the positions that we are requesting, but your question, it would delay moving forward with the organizational structure that we're proposing, uh, which I think will, by extension, have some impacts on the to which we can do the work that we're All right, then I guess I have some questions. <laughs> Sorry to say. <laughs> um, okay, so um, if, so the one, can we get some additional information about the plan for um, the two community service officer positions? Um, will they be uh, using the same job description? Will they be hired in SO pool? Um, and just another two additional officers? Um, or will they be specifically dedicated to particular tasks related to um, homelessness response? Um, alongside that, I guess I wonder uh, where are we at of having all of our CSO positions filled? I know the police has had, issues, has had challenges with retention, and um, um, so I don't, I don't recall what they've, I, we, I know we've had updates, but I don't know where it's at right now, so I'd like that um, and um, I also would be, yeah I guess so I guess those are some I'll just start there so I can get additional information yeah thanks for the thanks for the questions Councilmember Brown I'll pull uh, Barry probably um, Chief Galante back into the conversation they can help speak to some of the uh, the intent around those additional CSO positions. I'll, I'll kick it off and um, then uh, turn it over to others. I think uh, part of that is um, providing 
assistance to um, address the um, instances when um, people do need to move from the location where they are. Um, I think the approach, the you know, starting with um, outreach and or the land and um, resource uh, conservation uh, staff and having that um, those individuals um, recommend these people move and uh, there's a place for them uh, in the shelter facilities and um, you know set timelines for that. Um, if those individuals aren't um, complying with that, then the um, CSOs um, carry a little bit more weight. I, I see it as a, a sort of a progressive approach, um, and um, I welcome Bernie's, uh, sorry, Interim Chief Escalante's uh, comments on you know, how he foresees uh, those resources or Larry's uh, thoughts as well. but. That's um, how I envision that um, sort of uh, uh, progressive approach happening. And so that would be dedicated PSOs who are specific to the staff or just whoever gets called. So we're basically just adding to the, I mean, are we adding to the pool for CSO officers who are doing the same work as every other CSO officer and it just happens that those They'll be, they'll receive a call just like any other CS. I'm, I'm, again, I'm really trying to understand this because we're, if it's coming out of $14 million grant uh, for homelessness response that um, you know, was intended for infrastructure, and we're, you know, I, I recognize there are significant needs around services, but we're, you know, we're, we're going to pay for it and then we're committed to it and the city will continue to pay for it out of the general i just would like to know are we just essentially hiring more yes and they'll get the intention is that they'll get more calls in general because this the expectation uh councilmember brown is that we would be adding uh two full-time equivalents so adding to the pool but having having a total of equivalent of two dedicated positions uh, to assist with that response work that Lee was driving. So they often work in tandem right now with crews from our public works and parks and parking. But the vision going forward is we have these positions to be able to support in a more dedicated way that assistance work coming alongside the resource and land management team. The, that's the vision. In addition to that, um, it would also allow for an increased presence downtown. Um, we have CSOs that have been doing some of that work recently in our effort to try to um, assist with some of the behavior challenges that have been occurring um, in the downtown area and using them as a bridge to connect individuals that come across with services. So um, that's that, that would be the vision for that role. Yes, they would be added. The, to the CSO team, but um, the expectation would be that there'd be more dedicated direct service provided to what we're describing. Okay, thank you. I would just uh, I would just add that I I would expect that as these individuals are um, regularly addressing these homelessness related needs, they are going to gain a, a stronger familiarity with the county services for example, and they'll be able to make some of those referrals and provide some of those connections, similar to what we would expect as a regular basis from the outreach folks. Um, but I think that just by virtue of that um, regular exposure, um, they will be able to also provide additional connections to services, whereas um, uh, the, the, yeah, I, I think that's, I'll, I'll leave it there. All right. And are, are we at full staffing now on CSOs? And so we, or is that maybe Pascalante? Yeah. I'll answer. Yeah, yeah I can answer that question. 
we are currently budgeted for 13 community service officers and we have nine. Um, and we are actively actually recruiting for additional CSOs. But the CSOs, you know, they do a variety of tasks throughout the community. So what we found is that when we can dedicate a couple community service officers to this assignment, working alongside you know, other um, city staff or uh, Chris and Jeremy, and they're out there providing service, providing direction to other alternative. Um, we're not, we don't have to pull them away from that their assignment. We commit them, they know exactly what they're doing. We'll be looking for those skill sets that are, um, you know, will provide them a higher level of success of working with uh, other groups like Encompass. They work with them now downtown, but oftentimes we have to pull our CSOs away from that or whether it's traffic control at a traffic collision or, or other duties. In this particular case, they could be solely dedicated to this particular task. Um, and so I, I, yeah. That's really helpful. I'm again, really trying to understand this. Um, okay, um, so another question I have is this, you know, we're kind of saying, well, you know, everybody agrees to have some you know, outcomes and metrics for determining success. Um, but when can we expect to have um, some of that firmly established provided? So for example, uh, Council Member Cummings brought up a point related to this and I'm just, in the interest of transparency, accountability, and understanding if what we're doing is working and fiscal responsibility of the taxpayers, um, when are we going to, when will we see about X number of people, you know, cows, the Section 8 vouchers actually getting used, you know, and there's, I mean, I, mean, I can think of all kinds of things I played already, so I won't going on about that, but <laughs> overall, it would be great to have a, a sense of like, when can we expect to more of that? That be in May as well, or at the next quarterly meeting, um, quarterly, quarterly report? I, I appreciate that question, Councilmember Brown. We, we had some conversation with the team leading up to tonight with some of the feedback that we were receiving around wanting to see uh, meaningful metrics articulate the report on regularly. There's two things I would say to that. One is we're feeding up in larger regional housing homelessness strategic plan that we partnered on with the county. There are very strong metrics built into that plan that I think we can forward and apply it to the action plan that we were discussing. And then I also think, and as we've been talking about all afternoon, in our own local experience, there are some other metrics pull from the work we're doing, vision we have uh, moving forward to add to add to that. Um, and I, I would suspect we would have that put Larry on the spot of what's a reasonable, reasonable time frame, but um, either in May or as part of the quarterly report. Thoughts on that, Larry? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I certainly, we can have a framework that has some metrics and outcomes benchmarks for the next quarterly update. This in May. That's definitely doable. Thank you. Okay, and so I'm jumping around a little bit here, but I just, sure I get things that are really, um, uh, I, I have concerns about in particular address. Um, vehicle abatement officer, um, where would that person be um, housed? And um, what, you know, I mean, it sounds like it may be an ex-vendor, it may not be, and so I just like to understand that more. I mean, I don't really support it in general, but um, I want to know what we're signing on for here. Yeah, um, very early, but I want to jump in. But I think the intent there um, is to have a vendor on contract that can provide for some of the necessary work included in uh, the OBO ordinance. And, you know, I think to your point, Councilmember Brown, it's the last resort, not a mechanism we want to have to utilize, but um, it is a necessary component to implementing the OBO and having that resource available. Uh, it would not be an in house position. On um, and so that's not something that we currently have in place. My my understanding is you have a vendor, and then the vendor 
we didn't have a place to send the RVs, the oversized vehicles. And so, you know, we've been sort of in a little bit of limbo. Do we have a vendor? This in addition, the expectation is more towing happening. You want to speak to that? Yeah. Trying to I think Bernie, um, Chief Escalante, has info on the vendor they have for towing, yeah. which is a little bit different than you know um, a broader role in enforcement. I think Matt, or you articulated in terms of what we're looking for is as capacity around the OBO, but I can't speak specifically um, to the vendor we have for towing. Yeah, we we um, do have a temp employee. Uh, they are technically a community service officer as the vehicle abatement. Uh, they are temp. They are a, a temp employee. We do have a vendor that we operate with, um, but our current vehicle abatement officer uh, primarily focuses on you know 72-hour abatement issues around the entire city. So the anticipation here is the potential increase. Uh, workload around the enforcement of the OVO if, if it gets to that. So um, that's what we currently have now and what they focus on. And, and like I said, they are a temp employee. So uh, we anticipate if the workload increases, it, there's going to be a bigger. Um, Matt, you want to go back to another, um, see if I can get some resolution question about um, calling San Lorenzo, um, the Benchlands sanctioned encampment and counting it towards the number of um, uh, spots that we, you know, um, trying to think of the word spot. I got, I'm just going to call it spots. I can't say beds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't say beds. Um, so, like, if we're, we're talking, but that's going to close. Or, or, are we, so why is that in there as a, Encampment to count towards a number that have, that the council has set um, as a minimum. When well, it's not really a place to stick around, and I think we're, are very clear that that's it's not an appropriate location for a long term encampment. Um, so I, I'm not oh, no objection to that, but I'm I'm just wondering. I mean, that's in the that's in the plan here, right? That's in the language of staff report and I I'm I don't want to I don't want to adopt a plan that says that's part of our plan. I, just, yeah, I appreciate that I appreciate that point, Councilmember Brown, and as we talked about this afternoon, um, we are moving away from bench land serving as suitable shelter space. So the, the target that we're aiming for that that talk specifically about the 150 bed around and then of course there are beds on a regional level. Um, the goal is by this summer, the bench lines would be demobilized. Those beds would not be obviously counted uh, as part of that work towards standing up the other shelters that we and Barry have described today. 1220 River, uh, the Housing Matters expansion, the Armory, uh, as examples. Those are the beds that we're counting for the more permanent target. Thank you. I, I don't mean to be difficult here. I just really, we're going to insist on adoption. I'd like to hear a valid question. Thank you. That concludes your questions, Council Member Brown. For the sake of us all being able to sleep for a few hours tonight, yeah. <laughs> I've done plenty more, but. Thank you. Uh, okay, I will move on to Vice Mayor Walker. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And yeah, I, you know, I appreciate the discussion. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, it is about kind of saying it's time to go, right? And I really just want to say how much I respect the work. And I haven't always agreed with John Lane, and I think he knows that, but I've always respected him. And I've always known, no matter what, he is committed to supporting our most vulnerable population. And I think it's really telling when he calls in to say, gosh, you know, I haven't necessarily been as effective, not for a, a lack of will or trying or ultimate dedication he truly really had long as I've known him and has have known his positions in public office. But at the end of the day, it's about shifting from reaction to proactive, right? And it's go time and it's about trying to get things moving. And and I think that's really telling to what this what this proposal says. 
in terms of embracing how we want to be responsive to our most vulnerable population in a meaningful way, as well as responsive to the community at large and how to balance that. I think it's hard to say yes. It is really hard to say yes. These are really challenging, you know, proposals before us. These are difficult financial decisions to make. And I think the lack of ability to say yes to hard things has been a state of inertia. And I think we need to go and we need to move forward with an adoption. So I'm supportive of moving forward with incorporating that word. I think that also, if we think about fiscal responsibility, we also have to think about shifting our mindset from a reactive fiscal response to, you know, the tons of leftover trash that we're having to pick up or our criminal justice system that is now, you know, embracing having to be the first to respond to an unmanaged situation. So if we're thinking about how we're going to be more prudent, but also really investing in upstream and intentional um, proactive policy programming and partnership, I think that's what thing here before us. So I know it's not easy. I don't think anybody really wants to be in a position. But I, you know, if in a perfect world, we had everybody doing well and thriving and healthy and supportive, I think that's where we want to be. But moving forward in a way that is pragmatic and is responsive and is thinking about the unique subpopulations and all of the different components that when you have funding that you need to have in place in order to adhere to getting them pumped, Right, like you can have the best programming, you have the best of funding, but if you have nobody to do the work, then what? And I want to thank, um, you know, former Mayor Myers for her legislative advocacy, because what that led to 14 million, and you know, in response and in collaboration with our state legislators, right? So if you have good legislative advocacy, that small uh, drop in the bucket, considering what you could potentially get in return, same as to the concept with a grant writer, right? Like. You put money into supporting grant writing, then you ultimately, hopefully, get the return. So I know that questions that feel really hard, and frankly, some of them might not work out. But nonetheless, it's really shifting our mindset from saying we want to be in a of you know feeling not fully prepared to a state of not being able to paralysis by indecision, or enough to say, gosh, we have a pretty you know we have. We have our lane here. We're going to try to do our best to stay in the lane. We might fall out, turn. That's where the data component comes in, 100% of that for accountability. But at the end of the day, we're going to figure out what doesn't work. At the end of the day, we're also going to figure out what does work. And at, and ultimately, what that leads to is for a healthier community. And so I guess my, my comments are, you know, more at large, but I guess I think it's really important that we think because it's it's really important that we keep moving. And I think that um, working in this way is is also a, a priority. I the last thing I think I will say, and I think that's what my hand went up originally for, um, was really the notification and you know identification of really prioritizing subpopulations that was outlined right away. And I, I just want to make sure that that something that was brought up in the that I feel really strongly about that also written into both the ordinances. So just making sure that that's also reflective in our, um, you know, our adoption of this plan is thinking about how are we supporting our most, how are we not um, targeting or further harming people like women who are struggling or transitional age families or single parents or those ones that are really, truly really needing our, our ultimate um, investment in wanting to them and that was something that was pointed out early on in the CS code. Um, you know, I know in the interest of time, just because I also have the extended, <laughs> extended agenda, um, you know, I'm comfortable with making a substitute motion and transferring um, really, I think it's just really one word, right, from support to adopt and um, moving this forward, knowing that we're going to have updates, we're going to have refinement, we're going to have um, a budget adoption eventually, we're going to have further information to move from, as well as accountability metrics to learn from. Um, so with that, I'm prepared to make a substitute motion, really essentially keeping the same language that was presented in the prior motion, um, but shifting from supporting to the top. That's my is, um Okay, instead of a, an amendment, doing a substitute motion, 
I mean, I, I think if we could, if the amendment was welcome from the motion maker and the seconder, then that, then I'm fine with doing that. But if not, then I think I'm motion. So we'll go ahead and I'll, I'll go ahead and withdraw my substitute motion in hopes that an amendment would work for it to now reflect that we would be adopting um, instead of, instead of Reporting in the interest of trying to resource really a lot of these priorities that we've set out to accomplish in a meaningful way, um, as opposed to sort of extending the timeline. So, if that's accepted by the maker of the motion, yes or no, that's fine. If not, then I'll go ahead and make it. Maker of the motion accepts this amendment. I know that the Councilmember Myers had brought this up. The one thing that I'd express was just wanting to hear from council members, and I think we're almost there. So that's the only reason why I didn't. Hold you know. on. Um, um, I think the city clerk misunderstood, or maybe I misunderstood, that your word of support and adopt is not related to item three, but to. No, the I'm just first copying. I'm, I'm, I was just copying and pasting. The, it's to adopt the action plan, right? Yes. Yeah, I'm just copying and pasting so I have something to work with. Gotcha. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> and, and I think I might need to, I, I need to, in that my general amendment, property. I'll, yeah, we'll get that. And I just had, I had some, questions I'm not I mean okay. as I, th I think we're all trying to work towards consensus here and I think we're pretty close um you know because this is if we get behind this plans I think we want to feel good with especially because the next item we're going to be discussing is moving forward with the revenue measure and if we're not on you know if we're not able to reach consensus on how we're going to spend 14 million dollars towards homelessness what confidence can we give our community when we're saying, hey, you should, you should be voting on increasing our tax? So that's, so I'm, I'm not, not that I'm opposed, I'm trying to see if we can get some questions, questions answered, see if we can get there um, so that we can also have support um, as we're moving into the Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, so is it my understanding, um, can we scroll um, so it's smaller so we can see all the entire motion? There we go. So number two is what uh, my understanding is Council uh, Vice Mayor Watkins um, for friendly amendment. I think. Uh, I think. Councilmember Myers had made that, moving that forward, that suggestion forward earlier. And, and one thing I asked Mayor was if we could hear from the council, kind of see where we're at. And I think we might be pretty close. Because we're, so I, I had some questions. Um, if I raised my hand, because I want to be. I want to respect the order um, at this point. There yeah, was not, a... I was just saying that's why my hand. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, okay. Well, I guess I'm a little bit confused in that um, in what the request is. I think you know, at a, at a certain point. Well, one, I think you know, I, I adopt means that we give firmer direction to move forward and 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 knowing that it's gonna come back for refinement. And that's sort of where I'm at. And I, from what I've heard from a couple of the other, my colleagues, and I'm happy to listen to the others before moving forward, um, that seems like that's where they are at as well. Um, so I I don't ask answered at this point, or if, if there's sort of a conflation of the, this item with the next item, um, because I feel like what I've witnessed over the past, you know, various iterations have been you know, a lot of discussion and hope of trying to move forward and then 
maybe one thing will not do that, right? And so I, I don't know if 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 that's the interest or intention of of you, Councilmember Cummings, what you're wanting to have happen tonight in order to, to sort of feel the confidence that you need for the next item. But I'm sort of I'm kind of a little bit concerned about about what where we're at with. So I mean, is it an is it a note? Maybe is that what it is, or I, can we see the friendly amendment? I'm not seeing the whole. Thing. Okay, great. Um, great. So your friendly amendment was changing item two from support stop. It, yeah, given what we heard from our our staff, really, as well as in terms of moving and as our really our our ability to stay competitive and be able to. And also be able to yield some of the funding we want to see. I think adopt is. I heard that too overwhelmingly is kind of an important component. So I'd like to move forward with that, and I, and I'm happy to make you know either a substitute motion or if we want to postpone that, that's fine. But um, at some point, I think we're going to have to make it. Okay, so there's a friendly amendment by Vice Mayor Watkins on item number two, and um, is the maker of the motion amenable to that? I'd just like to say that, um, again, Council Member Myers, as the second of the motion, had said she would want to move forward with adopt. We asked, I, I said, maybe let's hear from the council members. I don't know where my hand is at, order, yeah, but so I just had, I a, I just had a few, I just had a few questions, <clears throat> and I think that if I can get some resolution on my questions, I'd be willing to entertain the second that. For the uh, yeah. friendly amendment, friendly amendment. forward by. I second. think so. Uh, Council Member Myers next, and then Council Member Cummings and Council Member Brown. And um, because it, Council Member Myers had framed it more as a question, whereas Vice Mayor Watkins did a formal friendly amendment, that's why I'm asking again if, there, if you're amenable. We can continue with. The discussion and hold it here um, before you, if you want to continue the path we're on. Just to just to sort of frame it um, here, if the friendly amendment isn't accepted, then the motion could be framed as a motion to amend the main motion or a substitute. Well, it's it neither. Like Accepted or denied at this point. Um, you know what? Here's here's what here's what I'll do. I'll accept the friendly amendment for purposes of continuing the conversation. And is the seconder okay with that? Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Myers, and then Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to um, maybe talk. A little bit about my thoughts. I had a lot of questions about this. You know, this legislative, um, I think Council Member Watkins, or excuse me, Vice Mayor Watkins, really did point out the effectiveness of active legislative, um, uh, you know, uh, strategy. Uh, and and you know, we have the, effect, the, the type of effective um, legislators that we have at all levels, statewide as well as national. Um, you know, that is that's something that a lot of parties don't have. So I think I, I respect managers by um, also, uh, you know, is realization that we for um, as a coastal so when I was mayor there were I did have colleagues out other small that um, per capita much larger population um, than even you know per capita than large city um, and obviously much less resource um, I think there is a lot of interest in our city manager proposal to be able to work more into this 
the coastal cities by nature, whether it's weather, whether it's um, communities that, that end up trying to accommodate folks that are realizing that it's not a sustainable situation for small cities, or whether it's um, environmental advocacy. I know there's a lot of a lot of people that are very upset about Water Act violations that are basically associated with, you know, not with, with homeless camps, um, you know, along riverways and borders. I mean, I know a lot of water advocates mm -hmm. that are sort of fed up with the amount of garbage waste that are getting washed into the ocean. So I think this uh, legislative very strong point in time and it it is well worth best um and it can have dividends in terms of really understanding and getting us this state we've already seen the state court board the kinds of things that we talked about <coughs> in the last year new put money on the ground to help now how trans try to um talking about a workforce development help participate Areas trying to keep areas um, dedicated funding. Uh, this last week, starting to try to dig in, you know, um, the severity of, of mental and behavioral health issues. How do we how do we make how do we have a um, when they're struggling? So the work done over the last year is signals all over Sacramento that we're on the right track. So, you know, this is small investment as our city. It could be a lot less, I mean, with the right kind of approach, um, you know, very much a, a cost share type of situation. Very strong. Also cities in California pay so many tax dollars for the state of California that we are, of course, um, and we need help we not sustain our little budgets. Uh, so I, I just want to make a plug for that. And I ask us as part of this. I just wanted to clarify. Um, I think it's very, very. I'll stop there. Thank you. And I do, and I do accept the, the yeah, part of the amendment. Sorry, I already did that. Never mind. Sorry, Mayor. <laughs> Getting tired. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cummings, there's Council Member Brown and Council Member Golder. Um, after that. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to stay really focused on plan for us. And I know that what was in the agenda report isn't necessarily what is encompassing this plan. That's my understanding. Maybe I can get some head nods if that's the case or not. Okay. Um, so you know what we're what we're seeing in the report is kind of an update on what's been happening versus what's in the plan, which is outlining kind of what is the pathway forward. And so, you know, the reason why um I'm took the the, the stance on support versus adopt because this is $14 million one-time funding that we're receiving. And I just want to acknowledge that there was information in this proposal that was lacking. Uh, when we have this budget chart with a number of different line items, there was an explanation on to what the roles would be and why we're spending money on those roles. So that's the reason why I was moving towards support versus action plan. Now, that being said, I guess my question around wanting to support or with taking action on this plan first, um, or you know how we're going to vote on this item. I guess more for me, more of this. I just like to know some clarity around when we adopt this plan, and I know I mentioned it before, but what exactly are we committing to tonight in terms of what money we're going to be spending? What we're going to be spending? Money on because the two things what I see is that there's a proposal of a variety of action um, and action areas. In addition to that, 
have the second item, which has, uh, it looks like um, you know, a handful of positions, but not all the positions that have been laid out in the budget that was And so the concerns that, that have been raised is that, for example, you know, legislative advocacy, $432,000 a year, planning and request for proposal specialist, $336,000. Community relations specialist, one hundred in that whole category of expanded capacity and partnerships, it's nine hundred and sixty-eight thousand two hundred seventy-five dollars, and much 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 of that has not been explained in the report that we received, nor is it act plan, nor is it explained the the item that with us, and you know with respect to prudency, transparency, we really need if we're going to be making decisions on how this money is spent. My concern is, and I'm, this is why I'm saying this in relation to um, the revenue measure, the, the next item on our agenda is we need to make sure that the community needs to make sure to understand that it's clear what we're spending their money on. And so we take action tonight. I just want to know what are we, what exactly is are we spending money on and what exactly are we committing to and do these um, – Positions which haven't been defined, but those included, what we're going to be moving forward with. Thank you, Councilmember Cummings. It sounds like there's three positions you're specifically calling out as concerns that we've heard um, about in in the um, information we've received, and um, for you to feel comfortable moving forward with an adoption of the plan, those positions um, need to be clarified. It doesn't even have to be those positions. I just need to know what are we approving in terms of what we're going to be spending money on. Because and at the same time, the positions that we've outlined resolution, um, there's only, you know, I think uh, add one or five, seven positions, looks like that we're adding. So planning, community development, add position, city manager's office, add three positions, uh, add new classification and position for homeless services coordinator, add two community service officer positions, and then delete management analyst, lead assistant city manager. So that's clearly defined in that part, but it's not clearly defined what the roles of these other folks will be. Are we approving those positions tonight? And so I'm just trying to get a, get a, some explanation around what exactly we're dedicating that we're going to spend money on. Yeah, so Councilmember Cummings, you have that right with the list of positions that we had identified earlier. Those are typically the positions that would, we will be moving forward with tonight with approval uh, and adoption of the plan. Some of the other items we've talked about, like legislative advocacy, that'll be done through the contract that would come uh, come forward to the council at a later date um, and for consideration at a later date. Um, that's also true of, of the uh, supplemental uh, vehicle abatement um, vendor work. So specifically tonight, crystal clear is the positions that we identified just listed off. Um, the other items will come forward as the part of the more detailed plan, as well as the budget uh, for final adoption. And I'd call on Leader, Leader Larry if there's anything in addition to that that they'd like to share. Um, but um, that, that, that's what the ask. Hopefully that has clarified your question, Council Member Cummings. There's um, specific city positions that um, would be approved move forward tonight if we adopt the plan and the contracted out um, identified positions would come forward at a later date for our consideration. But they are here in the framework as an identified necessary helpful component framework is that kind of so i guess um oh. if, if i could um finish so 
moving forward tonight, we would be approving these positions. And then I guess at, when would this be coming back? Because it sounds like there's a number of um, asks in terms of returning with information. And I would, and um, part of that is also asking the information and justification for the roles and costs which would come back at that meeting in May so that we would be able to determine whether we want to move in that direction or not. Is right. That so, yes, uh, Council Member Cummings. So, we are committing tonight to bring those additional details to you no later than May. I will say it's not to say that there, there may not be elements that come forward sooner mm -hmm. as we try to advance that work. So, I, I want to make that clear as well. Ali and Larry, for instance, on some of the pre development work related to uh, the Coral Street Master Planning, uh, there could be contracts that we can expedite and bring forward to the Council for consideration sooner. And I, I would Fact that that would be um, council would be supportive of that, um, but yes, outside of that, the additional details we would have to uh, no way to. Okay, so I I just like to say that that helpful for me. We want to move forward with supporting this because what it's saying is that we are not committing those positions, and tonight the only thing we're really committing to are the positions that are in seventeen point two. And until these other items come forward to us around, um, even the case of the armory, sheltering, transitional encampments, all that has to back over the $100,000 limit. Is that correct? That, that's correct. I would also add that the additional time will allow us some extra scoping around alleged advocacy in particular. You know, that, that's of special interest to the council and uh, some of the community feedback we received. Uh, we can start conversations specifically with some of the legislative advocates in terms of that work and come back with a harder number, get a better sense of that as well. And then to your point, anything that's above uh, administrative authority has to uh, matter of process back and forth. There'll be, as I mentioned earlier, lots of opportunities around uh, down the road for the council to weigh in on. Okay. Um... Yeah, and so I guess um, one more time for clarity for the community service officer. This is these are dedicated positions that are going to be specifically working on homeless response in those in those roles. Correct. Okay. Um, yeah, as long as that's clearly defined, I think that's I'm um, I'm supportive of moving in that direction. This, um, I did have a question though within some of the spending. I know that. Uh, in previous conversations that we've had along around homelessness, one of the things that that had come up was um, dumping for RVs, creating kind of dump site, and I don't see that in here. And I'm just wondering, kind of where that that like how that fits because that is a critical piece of infrastructure that um, community has expressed over and over that they have, so that people aren't dumping their black water, gray water in the streets. And so I'm just wondering where that is. Yeah, there is a reference in there. It's easy to miss. I'll, I'll ask. Certainly, yes. Um, it's in the plan, um, but um, it is included. It's wrapped up under the basic services and safe parking. So part of that includes um, installing an RV dump station, the infrastructure for that as well. It also includes a mobile pumping service uh, to support safe parking. So that's all wrapped up in there. That is an element. Uh, and that number also goes back to the plan that was presented and approved by the council on December 14th. So uh, that's the same budget. Just extending the time as part of this. Plan. Okay. And then I guess the last piece is that um, I would just maybe make a recommendation when, when this comes back that uh, there might be the consideration of vehicles for the mental health liaisons. So that they're not using their own vehicles. So that concludes my comments. And um, yep. Um, thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, just one point of clarification: my understanding is that the county mental health liaisons, county vehicles, and. Um, encompass outreach workers um i i'm not sure if they use their own cars and um our our city staff the temp positions 
I'm not sure if they use city vehicles or their own cars, but definitely the county mental health funds county vehicles. I'm mistake. I meant for the the city's compass workers because the Bernie Escalante mentioned earlier that they their own cars and the ones that I've encountered have said they're using their own cars, and it might be good as I mentioned before if if our people who are in Engaging with people who have mental health crisis, um, emergency issues, um, and want to take these people to places where they can receive help, and the people are in such conditions to where, you know, they're soiled clothing or what have you, and that they can ruin the person's car. I mean, if we're going to put those people in that position and ask them to do this thing, then we should be providing them with vehicles that we can clean in the city that are dedicated to those specific purposes. So that's just my recommendation. Thank you for that recommendation, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor, can I add something? Yes, uh, go ahead, sorry. You. That, that, that's okay. Um, I guess I'm, I, I wanted to get some clarification from council member coming. When you say their own vehicle, are you under the impression that the existing mental health liaison drive their personal vehicle? I, I met, um, person from Encompass who does one of the outreach workers, and she had mentioned that he is currently using her personal vehicle and brought up these concerns because prior to COVID, the outreach workers with police officers and police vehicles, and because of COVID, they're using their personal vehicles. And she had mentioned this, this scenario, which is why I'm bringing it up now. And we see. Yeah, use, no, you know, it's a valid point. Um, just for clarification, so the staff with Encompass and the county mental health liaisons that work alongside our officers are two totally different sets of folks. And the, so the two county mental health liaisons that work with our office, um, they are driving county vehicles. I can't answer to Encompass because they don't necessarily work uh, as directly with, with our department. So I can, t I can rest assured, uh, you know, you can be certain that the uh, county mental health liaisons drive county vehicles, not their own personal vehicle. That's, but that's good feedback, Council Member Cummings. We can look into that with our original partners, make sure that uh, the teams we're working with have the resources. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, Council Member Golder. Welcome. I had my hand up for a long time, um, <laughs> only because Council Member Cummings asked where we were at. And um, just knowing that this is not, like I had said before, the plan, it's been an overview with updates um, that are, we're expecting to see in the coming months. I'm very comfortable with adopt at this point, having heard everything I've heard in the discussions. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other hands? Um, I guess I'll go ahead and say some comments as well. Um, this has been a really good conversation. Um, I had a feeling it would go longer than um, we allotted on our agenda for this, but it's a really important conversation to have. I really want to thank all of the community members that emailed us, as well as all the callers tonight. Um, your input is really um, important to hear and did help inform, um, you know, very specific points to um, really move this forward. That being said, um, this is quite the investment from um, our our team, our city, um, in a way that has not been invested in before, investing in care and shelter teams and um, land management and resource teams, partnerships with the county and regional, um, really coming at it instead of just an enforcement way, but really getting to um, a support um, uh, uh, model uh, for folks. Um, that are unhoused in our community. And um, I really think we've um, 
um, making great progress. I want to um, call out the um, um, <clears throat> just the raising standard of the shelter models that we have typically uh, stood up and really wanting to be better um, um, models of shelter. Um, and I know the word pallet shelter was brought up. I, um, you know, Larry earlier or Lee had mentioned or some other types of shelters. I think it's important to stay open um, to different options of shelters. Um, um, we've had some community members that have reached out about some engineered models created and want to help and contribute. And I really love seeing those types of um, um, our community um, want to help with this. So whatever the the camp uh, shelter model is not and Benchlin and really people um, connecting to the resources they need for better well-being and for our environment to have a healthier environment. So thank you so much for all of the work that has gone into um, this this plan and these elements thus far. So I look forward to the next up. Um, and and so now at this time we have a motion on the floor with three friendly amendments, and um, um, Mayor, really quick, if I could, um, Laura kind of consolidated all the friendly amendments and everything to go into just motion language to make it maybe a little more clear. So um, I'm going to put up that. Okay, I'll let the, give a minute to read it through. The yep. amendment. Thank you. Uh, Correct. Long. But the, the county to prioritize support. So Number three. three. Try, try to develop that. Oh, yeah. Only on the amendment. To support. Um, right. There was a lot of use of the word support throughout the discussion. I'm wondering if we can also keep prioritizing there. I, I, yeah, my friendly amendment, I thought it was in there. So, yeah. So. Okay, we're going to um, go I, back to that. <laughs> well, it was, it was good. It was just it was prioritize okay. and yeah. support instead of prioritize and develop. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're there, Bonnie. Adding one word. If you want to go back to that, Bonnie, it was it was it was good. So work with the county to prioritize support instead of prioritize develop. So delete develop. There we go. Thank you. Great. Is the maker of the motion and the seconder of the motion? The um I think um in four return to the council on or before the first of May because City manager did say that there's the opportunity for certain aspects of the spectrum. 
that was in the original. So the number four says buyer before the first May. Yeah. A reads a little strange. Identification of relevant metrics tied to the county's homelessness strategic plan and additional ones for measurement of outcomes for our act. There it is on the screen. Yeah, it's in the language that was just put before, so there's a, a bunch of information about the county, and I don't think that was the <laughs> Like we can swap that paragraph, no paragraph. That would help. Make sure that all consistent. Yeah. So A would a paste. Right. For that whole section regarding timeline, goals, it's. All right. What make sure we have the system? make sure we have the original intent. There we go. Are you saying to delete that? Yeah, that to delete A and swap it with the first part of that paragraph. Yep. Copy. Or get easier, maybe it's just the whole section. Uh, hard to figure out where to. Why don't you just do the whole section, Bonnie? And it... Or it looks like maybe you could end after. Oh, sorry, lost it. Um, Before it got to the positions. So, I, I think I think the intent of this was to make it easier for everybody to read to get rid of all the <laughs> friendly amendment additions. If everything you guys see here is accurate. This is what I would. I think Laura just did this to make it a little more, like make it clear. Yeah, I think we stuck with the met the actions that we took. I think it also helped the flow of seeing where amendments were were made, and that way yeah. we don't leave anything out. Because otherwise, we're just going to be going through and cutting and pasting and reviewing for another. So, on. so appreciate the intent though. That's why Bonnie is the city clerk. She knows what she's Thank you, Laura. <laughs> no worries. Okay. So we have a motion with um, three friendly amendments. Um, and there was no additional comment. So I will ask the clerk for a roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. I'm sorry. Mayor. Mayor. Yes. The, the resolution for the human resources items was missing, so that needs to be added. Unless oh, is that going in this motion? It should well, all, unless you guys are going to do another motion, I'll be there because we need the human resources personnel complement to be approved. I. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Myers. So we'll continue. So is that a separate motion then? Yes, that's okay. Break it up for okay. council member Cummings. We just add it to this because I thought that when we started the item, we were going to hear it. both items at the same time, public comment all at the same time, and make because right. otherwise. The only problem with that is that particular recommendation fell under 17.2, not 17.1. Mm -hmm. um, for, there are two separate items in our agenda management system, so it just seems to me 
better and less. Sorry. We'll proceed um, with this item 17.1. The motion, there's a motion by Council Member Cummings and a second by Council Member Myers. Three friendly amendments. And so we'll do a roll call vote and then move on to item number 17. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Sir? Aye. Coming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And now we will um, go to item 17.2. This is the resolution amending the classification and compensation plans by administratively implementing staffing to support the city's homeless response action. Um, I see Council Member Myers. Uh, I would uh, make a motion to adopt. We have a first by Councilmember Myers and um, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Do you have a second? Yes, I'll second that. Any discussion on this item? Okay, I, um, if we can move to a roll call vote. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Sir? Aye. Coming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Deep breath. Thank you, everyone, for enduring to do that work. Great job, everybody. Um, that brings us to we had two items that we continued and not discussed. So um, we've gone through already oral communication earlier at six thirty. We are now at item number 20, resolutions requesting the placement of a sales and use tax ballot measure on the June 2020 California statewide primary election. And before we begin, I'd like to call a 10 minute break um, and then we will come back at 8.40. Okay, I'll give everybody a minute to get back to their cameras. Hopefully get a little stretch in. Back pain. Is um, clerk ready? Twelve. Okay, so we will resume our um, meeting. We are at the final item on today's agenda. Agenda item number twenty: resolutions 
requesting the placement of a sales and use tax ballot measure on the June 2022 California statewide primary election. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and return to the council for deliberation and action. <clears throat> okay. So um, we will now begin the presentation and I will be taking us off for presentation be okay so um i uh, i'm speaking on half of our uh, ad hoc budget and revenue committee uh, myself vice mayor watkins and council member brown and um <clears throat> really some brief background we are uh, recommending uh, this item, um, we started, uh, next slide please. We started with a review of um, some background and exploration of different types of revenue for the city to explore and um, really looking at uh, uh, a way to uh, keep our city of Santa Cruz, uh, the essential services intact and continuing despite the loss of revenue during COVID, during CZU wildfire impact um, and other challenges. And um, did someone say anything? And um, so some of the uh, background for the revenue items that we did look at were uh, property taxes and sales and use taxes, service charges and assessment fees. Um, we looked at uh, revenues from other government agencies, rent of public property, um, and development impact fees kind of went through a whole spreadsheet of options and um, associated descriptions, potential annual yield, um, and administrative overhead, uh, you know, looking at other cities as well and others, other jurisdictions. And so really the goal is um, to be able to maintain and expand our full city services. And um, we decided to do a poll. So next slide, please. Um, we um, started after the November full financial status update, um, transitioned our um, council members in February, reviewed the most revenue results and projections as well as their budget of and we really put a lot of evaluation possible revenue sources for the highest impact. next slide so the poll that was conducted was in january for a potential sales and use tax measure and that poll is done by an outside um consultant and it's done with a randomized uh, selection of voters in the city. And um, those analyzed poll results uh, came back with other risk factors as well. And there were questions um, uh, uh, and, and, and communications with businesses, including downtown businesses, hoteliers, community-based organizations and um, conversations with a couple of people in bar bargaining. So what the poll results found were that 
um, 61% of the uh, randomized voters selected felt uh, positive for a successful passage, so in support of sales and use tax measure, um, and really wanted to see uh, support in areas of housing. And um, I think our resolution did a great job in summarizing what we found in the poll results, um, really that the residents uh, wanted uh, investment in housing, especially for low and middle income residents, um, uh, problems around uh, addressing those unhoused and mitigating the future of wildfires and water supply, and, um, public facilities and recreational areas. Those were the top focus from the poll results. Next slide. Next slide. Um, so this is, again, we were shown this slide previously, the mid-year financial outlook um, improvement with structural deficits remaining. So really um, looking at um, what our path is without any additional revenue sources. Um, and at the bottom there, you'll see the assumptions um, at the bottom. So this came to us at our previous meeting. Next slide. And already with uh, the reductions, there have been um, expenditure, expenditure reductions and um, hiring freezes, early retirement furloughs, reductions in services, um, and so on. And so really we're at a point where um, we need to not only replenish our reserves, but be able to fund our essential services and capital and continue to build back up. So um, that's next slide why we um, looked at some of the uh, risk factors from the polling and um, knowing that we have some ongoing uncertainties ahead and um, next slide. I'm going to hand it over to Vice Mayor Watkins to talk about the possible uh, use. Thank you, Mayor. And I want to thank our staff and my colleagues, Mayor Brown and Mayor Bruner, for really diving into this. So, yes, we looked at some of the possible um, uses and really thinking about how we're gonna move forward with alignment with our previous plans and ultimate just values and hoping to move forward with some of these um, investments and really looking at the guiding principles of sustainability and green economy, engaged community, equity and well-being, and essential service delivery. Okay, next. Um, looking at some of the Kind of pending projects we also have. We have 50 units of all affordable support, supportive housing coming online at 314 um, Jesse Street, speaking to our, our really our value and commitment to equity. Same with our Coral Street, uh, very exciting with a number of uh, 120 units of permanent supportive housing coming there. And gosh, got really ex so, so exciting to think about what is possible for our project north and um, I know a lot of have been afforded and, and are moving forward to make uh, make this come to fruition and as the slide really indicates we have 94 units 92 of which are affordable 25 supportive uh, really just transforming our downtown and providing really much needed housing for our community Pacific Station South same 70 units 25 percent supportive, really putting into action our commitment to equity and our commitment to moving forward with uh, policy programs that are going to support our community and our housing. And our transitional shelter, really 
thinking and gosh, we just kind of had a, a in-depth conversation about this, right? So really thinking about health, prioritizing health, prioritizing these services that we just discussed in depth, um, which I know all of our all of us are committed to being moved forward, and um, some of which include our hygiene and moving forward with our transitional. Um, and then our community meetings, really thinking about how we're engaging with our community and how we're engaging with individuals who are experiencing homelessness and um, uh, loss of housing and thinking about how we're supporting them and their individual needs and pathways to find, um, you know, really independent and uh, hopefully health and well-being for their future. Next. And our homeless response management as well as um, how you know we are in sort of prior slide really how we're thinking about investing in supporting these individuals and our um, in our connection and integration into this network of care and there I think I'm trying to I can't quite make it on the picture but I, I believe that Jeremy who is mm -hmm. really helpful to our community and to our response and and a really great demonstration and illustration of the work. And Matt, I see that you came on. I'm trying to see. I'm not sure exactly. I don't have my other. I didn't get it. I don't have my others. If there's others who were wanting to over it, I jump right in. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're doing great. I just wanted to confirm that was Jeremy. That was Jeremy. Okay. I could tell, but I could, you know, it was kind of blurred. So <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, so I can um, continue here, and then I'll pull in Sandy for sure. after this. There, um, you know, it was almost fitting that downtown streets team had their presentation earlier at the start. We started off our meeting with a presentation from downtown streets team, which they had booked already um, or made a request uh, for a presentation for a council, and it just aligned. Um, Coincidentally, the same date with this item, um, our, our previous item, and and here, but in in you know having investment not only in um, some of those services, but also in the the partnership, the community services that um, are that exist. So downtown litter abatement crew, hope services um, has various teams that. Um, Know, hopefully we'll be able to expand on because they definitely are part of um, the services that our our residents are asking for. So next slide. And that's just another photo for them. There's been um, part of the the health and well-being. It's a win-win situation. Next slide. And then wildfire safety was a huge, um, uh, was one of the top items of concern where um, our residents pulled and really wanted to see continued investment and services around um, wildfire safety. Next slide. And vegetation management, of course. Um, there's a, a big business and recovery component to this and um, a desire from a lot of local businesses from the west side to midtown to downtown um, that really are still um, seeing several challenges and really not, um, not just within their business, but um, around their business and really need support with um, various aspects of their business depending on the type of And so there were several meetings with various um, types of businesses and stakeholders. And um, next slide. Uh, safety and maintenance was um, a very critical part of um, you know, having not, this is a wonderful picture, but I think what also fell under the category were roads and sidewalks, just um, 
residents feeling that those those basic services to be able to still fund and and address those needs of basic safety and maintenance for our city throughout our various places. Next slide. And there's roads and sidewalks. Next slide. And so Sandy, I will hand it to you. What are summary recommendations? Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor Bruner. Um, so, um, and I, I also want to, um, my uh, colleagues on the budget and revenue staff work with us plan together. Um, and I'll save my other comments for a little bit later, but um, we did uh, agree that uh, this was uh, a solid recommendation to full council tonight. Um, the recommendation is a general half sales tax increase, which would add five cents dollar purchase. Um, groceries, prescription medicine, diapers, and feminine hygiene products are exempt. We talked about that. Um, visitors also pay the tax, and um, a significant portion of our sales tax actually comes from uh, tourists, from from tourism dollars. So um, uh, visitors pay the tax, uh, and so you know half. I think it's actually a little more than half of sales tax paid by visitors. Um, so that's the recommendation. And um, I, do we have another slide? Yes. But thank you. Um, so here is the the ballot language that uh, generated uh, for your consideration and um, so we did here but I'll I'll just um, point out that um, you know for me this really is about protecting quality of life through um, programs uh, and really through supporting our cities I just want to say I think their city's workforce is well they provide Services, um, whether it's fixing streets, uh, maintaining our parks and recreation facilities, uh, wildfire risk reduction, uh, and obviously all the work with our um, climate action manager and uh, working to fight climate change, um, and then just the overall concern about uh, service reductions. Um, so <clears throat> um, the question then is: Shall the city of Santa Cruz be authorized to augment the general fund by levying half of one? Tax, raising about six dollars. So there, yeah. here's the, the council act recommendation, which you also have in your. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, I will bring it to um, any questions from council members. Uh, Council Member Cumming. Thank you. I'm wondering if you could put the slide back up, not the last, I think it's the second to last, the resolution. Oh, it might have been the ballot language. Yeah. There's a draft ballot language. Um, so, you had a question. Um, <clears throat> maybe this is. City manager, um, city staff. I guess a couple questions. One in particular: What, in terms of the fighting, fighting climate change? I'm just curious, kind of what types of strategies, or you know, what would we be funding when it comes to like our ability to try to fight climate change? Because um, I know that um, having been on the council, seeing a number of our different um, Climate action plan, West Cliff management plan. Um, there's a variety of things, uh, whether that's um, kind of reinforcing some of our cliffs versus um, the need to start investing in. If we have to have managed retreat of some of our areas, especially like beach flats and our low income communities, like that's something that we should probably be investing in now. And so I'm just curious in terms of 
kind of how we're going to be approaching fighting climate change as an example of this, um, what um, you know, this funding would go to support potentially. Yeah, thanks for the question, Tuffin. We're coming. We've got some other folks on the call that may want to chime in as well. But um, <coughs> I think you're right. I think a, a, a large piece of it is around uh, is resiliency and adaptation projects related to uh, uh, planning for the inevitable impacts of climate change, clearly uh, being as susceptible as we are on the coast. Uh, those are not significant projects, uh, as we all know. Uh, some of the areas along the uh, along West Cliff are good examples of that. So, and you know, more broadly speaking, we have about three hundred million dollars in unfunded capital pressure projects that are part of what you were describing. Outside of that, continued investment programmatic areas that you know, Tiffany brought forward, our <coughs> climate action plan as a whole. She is a one-stop shop um, on our sustainability and climate planning front and it's stretched very thin. So uh, additional resources would allow us to advance some of that work um, and, and support the strategic ways she's working with the region to move those efforts forward. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. We could probably call on Mark Biddle and others that could speak to more specific projects. I'm happy if, if, if it's helpful, I'm happy to also just when we were talking about the interim recovery plan, really rooting that in our intention to build it around health, resilience, sustainability. And I think in all things that we do, really it applies in that way. And how Tiffany's position is funded, and I'll, I'll let Matt give the refine my response or, or correct me if I'm wrong, is that it really is part of our general, it's part of our general um, general fund budget, right? So having her and having that as a priority for investment is something that we can build into our strategies moving forward with this with this revenue stream. And then also, I, I did want to just also add, and I, I didn't bring it up earlier, is that you know having been on the council now for many years, we've been through a number of rounds, at, and I know we're we're facing a lot of really tough decisions in terms of finding. <clears throat> so, um, what this is also going to do is allow us to move forward with, with a number of our priorities and. And to con continue to um, provide a lot of the services our community is is really wanting to provide. I think I would also add um, a lot of um, services that already were, you know, when we got into the piece of it, services that already exist that we don't want to or, you know, go down that path. So it's not even about adding additional um, necessarily, but main services that make a big difference in our uh, Mayor Berner, I think it's a bit more, we, I know this is um, well known to the council. We, we've gone through multiple rounds of reductions down to our services. We're at the point now where we're faced with some really hard decisions as to what services need to sustain. Uh, many of our departments are stretched very thin. Uh, we're asking a lot of our employees, which is simply not sustainable uh, to continue in our current mode. Um, and what that means is without additional resources, we're, we're talking continued erosion of the quality of services, and the range of services we're able to offer. And that I think our community has, has come to expect from uh, the work that we do. Um, and so the, the low hanging fruit has all been um, continue to project a structural deficit, and we need to look at sustainable revenue sources to get us on from the. Can I ask a follow up question? Yes, go ahead, Council Member. Um, one, I was going to see um, maybe Matt, you mentioned having some other folks kind of comment on that. Climate change piece. I'm wondering if anyone is on who can follow up on the first question I had, and then I'll I have a follow up question. Sure, um, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works, would happy to comment on that. Um, I know uh, electrification of the fleet is something that's very um, interest of interest to the council, and although um, a refuse service is a rate based service, that would be. Um, 
have to be worked into the rates, but this is a general fund tax. Our um, general fund vehicles, parks and um, streets vehicles and those kind of things that your general fund, this would supplement some of that. One of the things with a general fund tax is you don't have a lot of specifics and you have flexibility in it, so it's not a specific tax that's identified what you're going to use it for. That gives you that flexibility to direct it towards your programs that you want to implement and allows it to pass 50% plus one. So I think it's, um, it really does allow us to maintain the services as Matt said. Um, we are looking at significant cuts and this would allow us to retain and, and continue to provide the services to the community. Thank you, Mark. Yep. And I, okay, so, so follow up question uh, or another question I said that I have, and this is somewhat related to the conversation that we've just been having around homelessness. So, you know, prior to the adoption of some of the policies last member of uh, the situation for our finance, that if we weren't to do anything and receive ARPA funds, we were, you know, going very far into black in terms of uh, you know, revenue generation over time. And um, however, we have moved towards this down this path of providing homeless services our community, which a lot of people you know, have expressed need to do. All that being said, I'm just kind of wondering you know, if this is going to bring in $6 million annually, how much of that is going to go toward homelessness versus and, and supporting those kinds of programs versus all the other um, services that our city has been cutting or are on the verge of cutting trying to think about this context of, you know, getting you know, to support this and then also knowing that we have broad range of capital improvement and the maintenance of other services, some of which have been cut and need to come back, some of which um, can't really risk. Yeah, so I appreciate that question. Welcome for coming, especially on the, on the heels of our discussion this afternoon around our homeless response. Um, first and foremost, I think it's going to be really important that we invest these dollars in ways that are what the community is telling us is most important to them. And we continue to hear loud and clear over and over again that any capacity have more effective approaches to homelessness response, along with affordable housing, um, top of the list. So, having said that, looking at the proposal for the um, homeless response action plan, you'll also see that in the outlier, you have some of the programmatic investments funded. <laughs> so the intent would be for, for a portion of this revenue to sustain some of those additional services we're standing up, as well as preserve uh, our operation as, as a whole. Um, the last thing I'll mention, and I, I don't think this is a secret, um, almost all the other jurisdictions in our County are likely to do sales tax increases as well, and particularly in our county, <laughs> um, our county partners around homelessness response. We have a shared commitment of leveraging those funds in a way to support our collective efforts um, to sustain this new approach discussing this afternoon. So I see there being opportunities there as well that we can. Um, bring bring those efforts together in a way that allows us to be more effective as a region. Not to say that all has to be city of Santa Cruz dollars. Um, that's another element to this, and, and that's been part of our ongoing discussions. Great, and I appreciate those comments because um, I think one thing that we want to make sure it's clear is that that the the approach that we're taking on providing these services towards homelessness and the funding that's going to go into that is not just going to come from the city of Santa Cruz, that we're going to be looking and exploring other ways to maintain those services. And I think as part of that, as we're standing up services, I think that we need to have clear expectations on, you know, what we can provide, uh, what we can't, and really be mindful of how money is going to be spent so that um, we're not, you know, so that we're able to keep all the other services that we provide um, well supported as Forward. Um, those are all my 
questions and comments for the moment. And so I uh, thank you for. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, Council Member Myers and then Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Very nice. Um, for y'all know that otherwise um, it's also important to investment um cover and read think also acknowledge wide everything all the way down by every it's called um and I'm in again by the In their lives, of all the people there, community. Amber Ballot is always vision. Strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Council Member Kalantari Johnson, and then Council Member Cummings. Thank you. Yeah, I'd also like to thank all of you who worked on this and, and forward um, this recommendation. And just to, to comment on what Matt Huffaker just said, that it's, um, it's hopeful to hear that the other jurisdictions, including the county, are looking measure have by the approach across the um, and um, and and these efforts you know what one city does and another city does it'll all build on each other so I'm I'm really glad to hear that and it's even more motivating for us to take this action tonight um, and really builds on what the last agenda item we were talking about as you said for us to really be able to accomplish um, some of these robust goals that we have we need some additional funding and this will further prime us and prepare us as there are other opportunities in the state and the federal government um, to jump in to address some of the, um, I'm losing steam here, so <laughs> um, to, to take, take the opportunity and be prime and ready for when funds come our way, we will show that we're ready as a community. Right, I'm going to stop there because <laughs> I'm talking in circles now. I'm losing steam. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Brown. Thank you. And um, I'll also just thank the Revenue Committee for bringing this forward. I'm sure that you all had a number of different options and weighed them. And um, 
you know, the fact that we were able to get to something today um, just makes me hopeful about our ability as a governing body to work together to consensus. Um, the one question I do have that, you know, in order for this to be effective, um, there's obviously going to need to be a substantial amount of outreach. And I'm just wondering whether the, the subcommittee wants to com uh, comment on this or the city manager, but I'm just wondering what the out strategy is going to be and has there been a strategy that's been outlined so that um, you know, we're really sending clear messages to the community because obviously there's opportunities for you know, people to say that you know, this is going to make it harder for people for you know, low-income families to buy groceries, which it won't to buy medication which um so i'm just wondering what the <clears throat> communication strategies to try to get people on board with this um there definitely is a framework and i um will pass it to uh city manager matt Cuthbert to speak about um some of the framework that we discussed and the outreach needed to go forward thank you for bringing that point up yeah, it's an, it's an important question. And I, I would make clear for starters, so we as a government entity are prohibited advocacy. So we have a, an outreach plan in place to help the community understand uh, what the ask is and why uh, why it's needed, uh, what our fiscal uh, situation is and what, uh, what the possible uses of it. And outside of that, I know uh, that there are a number of community members Supporting that work as well. Um, so we um, and we've also been working with um, PBWB and Props and Measures consultants, who um, who is assisting with guiding that as well. So short time frame, we're going to have to hit the ground running if there's support from the council tonight. But plan to this. Thank you. Does that conclude your question, Council Member Cumming? I had one more, but I forgot. So. Okay, we can right. come back. Wait. Council Member Brown. So, uh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to ask. It seems like we're a comments portion. Um, Council Member Cumming is asking questions, but um, I, I do have uh, some additional comments. I'd like. I thought go out public first. Yeah. Um, so, okay. I just wanted to make sure that. They're, okay, great. So at this time, if you are interested, if you are a member of the public and you are interested in commenting on resolutions requesting the placement of a sales and use tax ballot measure on the June 2022 California statewide primary election, raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or select raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will be set to a minute. I will go out to our TV list. It's definitely shrunk. And let's see if, is there any member of the public that would like to do this item? Raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to uh, our Council for Deliberation and Action. Um, so, Council Member Myers and then Council Member Cumming. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I have, do have a question. I'd copy. I have a question about the ballot statement, how that, who does that, but whether or not that needs to be fine tonight. And together that does ballot favor and then the battle of that. Oh, I see those on the ballot. You know, a, a ballot measure, you can have that. That's something that you do, or is that something? How do, how do we help with that action? 
council can, uh, or the mayor can direct uh, a, a, an ad hoc committee, draft the arguments in favor and can authorize um, that to, to occur. So the mayor, the mayor can designate. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Can't hear me. Bonnie, I'll have to, have to test my stuff. Meantime, I'll, I'll yell. Okay, then did that answer your question? Yeah, I just was curious about that. Thank you. I did want to, um, just, there was an attendee whose hand went up right as I went out and um, they just took their hand down. So I just wanna make sure they do have the opportunity to speak. Um, great, their hands back up. So I will give this uh, <coughs> caller the opportunity to speak. Caller ending in five, five, four. And if you can unmute yourself by pressing star six or unmute on your webinar controls. Item number 20, resolution. Hi there. Good evening, Council Mayor Brunner, Ron Pomerant. The issue tonight is not the need for supporting important service programs. The issue is how best to raise those revenues. Raising the sales tax by half a percent at the time is poor policy. I find it harmful to a significant portion of the community. When students, poor and working folks, are just trying to get their heads above financial waters, you're now asking to add an additional financial burden on top of the highest inflation in 40 years. Sales tax increase will compound this cycle. Sales tax is called a regressive tax, as opposed to a progressive tax that puts the bulk of the financial responsibility on those most able to afford to pay. <clears throat> I asked how much business will be lost with increase in the sales tax on that study. This sales tax increase plan is under the guise of a fiscal emergency. An emergency is, by the dictionary definition, a serious and unexpected and often dangerous situations requiring immediate action. Over nine months passed, council had the opportunity to place other revenue raising measures before the voters, such as a COT or a property transfer tax. <clears throat> Neither of these revenue supplements caused financial harm to marginalized struggling community members. The city's fiscal ailments were known long ago long before COVID and the fires. Upper management administrators still make obscene salaries, pouring money down rat holes, PR hacks and consultants, trying to jam through a boondoggle parking truck, turning the wharf into Disney Central West and other wasteful projects. Fiscal emergency is not an emergency, rather in large part, one of the city's failure to act judiciously. I strongly encourage the council to place on the June ballot the long overdue Two to three percent increase, transient occupancy tax. <clears throat> sure makes good sense for the city to join the county to place both of the TOT increases at the same time on the June ballot. And if all else fails, it's always November 2022 with a sales tax. Without declaring the deceptive fiscal emergency line, thank you for your time and thoughtful consideration. Thank you for your public comment. Um, our next caller, Barbara Meister, go ahead. Hi there. Thank you, Mayor Brewer. I appreciate your reopening uh, public comment because something was happening that I wasn't catching that. So glad to be here. Um, I'm Barbara Meister. I am a parish member at Holy Cross Catholic Church and also active in COPA. Uh, with the pandemic, our parish was serving over 300 families a, year, a month uh, struggling with lack of income, the loss of jobs. And we've also been working through COPA to um, help people stay housed through accessing the rental programs. And as my colleague earlier during your public comment period mentioned, there are over 2,000 people who are still awaiting rent from the housing is program and those have expired the end of this month. I bring that up because I noticed, and I do not know what COPA's position will be on the proposed sales tax. We'll vote affirmatively tonight. 
but I bring this up because I, what I didn't see in the description of the ballot measure, I saw mitigating the impacts of homeless and uh, of increasing affordable housing. Gap of opportunity in there, people housed by focusing on preventing homelessness. And COPA through the years and hundreds of, of people we've been talking to and assisting in workshops, assisting in their applications, learned a ton about the struggles of renting uh, in this whole um, very high cost of living area here. We've got a number of ideas and options. We started to share these in two meetings with city manager recently. We'd like to be in conversation with you about those ideas. One of them just simply is the fact that there is a dearth of tenant assistance, education, legal assistance that would help people just understand what a three day quit notice is. And they could be prevented from, many are just self evicting out of intimidation and fear and misunderstanding. So just that that project in and of itself, uh, really beefing up those services, both at the city level and county level. I'm glad you're working um, that's just one of many ideas that we've got, ways to support renters and could be a return on investment to preventing people from becoming homeless in the first place. So Copa would like to be in conversation with you if you pass this tonight um, to think about how could some of that sales tax revenue in ways to really prevent. So thank you for your time and your service. Thank you so much for your public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, I will bring it back to the council and um, I will uh, let council member Cummings and then council member Calentari Johnson. Mayor, I had um, some additional questions kind of based on the comments that we just heard. And so first one, well, and I, I had another question that came to me while we were, um, having this discussion. I'm just wondering if someone could comment on, you know, in terms of our ability to raise sales tax, this, will this half cent sales tax cap us at our ability to be able to raise the sales tax moving forward? That's correct. I just wanted to make sure that that's clear to the public that this is, I mean, unless something changes at state level, or otherwise, this is the last opportunity for us to raise sales tax um, in the city. Um, the other question I had was whether or not there were any progressive tax uh, considered by the subcommittee, and if so, because I know there's been a lot of discussion around TOT and other tax like coming forward uh, later, and so I'm just wondering if folks can speak to kind of what other um, opportunities might be moving forward that would allow for uh, more progressive tactics to consider. DOT was considered as well as part of the, part of the research. We actually pulled the community uh, to play for a DOT. Um, and there was a collective consensus <laughs> given uh, where things currently stand. The fact that a DOT increase wouldn't yield the same uh, in total revenues to the sales tax that if there were to be um percent pursuing <coughs> DOT, it would make sense to, to perhaps follow um where the county's going uh they're most likely bringing in like June uh and because that kind of sets the tone for the larger region allow us to see where that goes and if appropriate bring something similar in November of next year potentially. Um, but for now, the, the subcommittee, and they may have their own thoughts on the matter, thought it was important to prioritize the sales tax budget. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanna acknowledge um, that there's a lot of community kind of concern around raising sales tax. Definitely people in our community who see that raising sales taxes Aggressive tax that that we should be exploring other options. Um, given that that's that I was on this revenue committee previously, and um, you know we had come forward with the revenue measure to increase the sales tax. Then um, there's been more engagement with um, to address other council member concerns on that. And you know tonight we're here to consider this 
once again um, feel that you know, we really do need to be using the options available to us to try to help address the city's um, fiscal situation and try to do so in a way that we're not putting it too much burden on uh, low income middle class residents. Um, part of why I'm supportive of this, and actually I think we, part of what I'll be including in my motion related to this item, is that um, this will also, we think about our workforce and the workers in our, this will also help support some of our lowest income workers. And I think that we've made commitments as a council to help um, support low income workers, um, support our workers in terms of contracts over the time that I've been on council. And moving forward, you know, want to have programs that support low-income people uh, in our community and middle-class folks who want to support affordable housing. But this is an option where we will be able to um, generate a large proportion of this revenue from the tourists. Um, um, it's a revenue stream that um, will be consistent, and um, you know, although I'm hesitant to move forward with this. Kind of given some of the decisions that have been made that have put us in this situation, I do um, see that you know want us to be able to uh, you know, take advantage of this opportunity um, while for us while we have the ability to use this as a way to generate okay. revenue that will largely come from um, as I mentioned before people who are visiting our and also the fact that it won't be it won't go on groceries or medication some of the things that uh, feminine hygiene products and some of the things that really um, are important for women. So I'm happy to move this, the recommendation that's before us that was brought by the subcommittee with one additional change to that, which is to, and I'd sent uh, the one line item over to Bonnie, uh, but the one change that I would like to include that we gather input from uh, Council members and bring back a resolution of intent first meeting in April. And I think we just heard from folks who called in, um, in particular the folks from COPA who expressed you know, ways in which we can use this revenue um, to help support low income people in our community. I know that the last time this came before the council, there was uh, interest in providing a resolution of intent. And what that does is it's not a commitment to how we're going to spend the money, but it is expressing to the community that should ballot measure pass, these are some of the areas that we would be interested in supporting. And knowing that we there's a diverse uh, amount of interest in how we spend our tax dollars, um, having this resolution of intent could help provide some clarity around what we're hearing, how the money spent should it pass. So that's my motion. Thank you. We have a motion from Council Member Cummings. Is there a second? I, I can second that. Um, and, and I had additional comment. Um, Council Member Cummings, I had a very similar motion um, with the, the, the last piece that you had up with the resolution of intent. Um, what I had added to my motion was that it would be revenue ad hoc committee that would bring back a resolution of intent based on council input just to keep it um to keep us moving and keeping it contained would you be amenable to adding that i think the one uh why i want to push back on that is because um technically that would violate the act because we can't since we can't talk to more than council members um, and maybe Tony, you could weigh in on this. Um, but my understanding would be that if all the council members are communicating with revenue separately, that actually could constitute a Brown Act violation. So I don't know who the staff person is, or Tony, if you want to weigh in on how we could. That is correct. If council members were uh, chiming in on the work that the ad hoc committee uh, is doing, however, <laughs> I have the same concern about the amendment motion that you made council member Cummings I don't see how that I guess I'm having a little trouble uh, reconciling that with 
with the Brown Act. Um, just for the record, I did communicate with Councilmember Colin Charlie Johnson earlier, and I thought that the ad hoc committee was a neat uh, option for avoiding a Brown Act um, <coughs> issue while still gathering input with the understanding that um, council members could come back to the meeting in April and weigh in on the recommendation to make appropriate modifications at the, the so that was kind of the germination of the of the uh, ad hoc proposal that council members had discussed I guess my question is I know previously that, that letters of or, uh, resolutions of intent brought forward and I know that in, on previous items, you know, sometimes staff reaches out to all the council together. So I'm just wondering how that's any different from, um, you know, what being proposed in terms of violating. If you know the staff working with the subcommittee, if that staffer was able to come to all the council and gather their input and then put together that resolution of intent, and then everyone gets to weigh in. So I guess. I mean, I think I think it's a little tricky, but I guess the way I look at it is that if if the staff were going to accept communications from council members and then base the recommend resolution on um, you know, some sort of council consensus, then that would be a brown act. If the council were to just ex or if the staff were to just accept comments from all council members and then just bring back a potpourri of uh, of, of recommended actions then i just don't know how i just don't know how valuable that is as a tool for the council to determine um what its actual priorities are so, so Sorry. Just, trying to, just trying to get input because you know trying to figure out how we can work this out so, so, sorry if i if i may council member cummings um let's let's use this opportunity here to provide input um and and not uh risk any kind of brown act violation have the ad hoc committee take this input from tonight and forming that resolution of intent i mean we have this um pretty robust packet that was given to us all the few days ago <laughs> so hard to read through it all but um it's it's pretty clear from the polls and what was in the packet where we need to go um so if we can have that discussion here and then the ad hoc committee can just take that into consideration. That's that's the suggestion I have. I guess um, my one concern is that we're going to be here for another few hours if we're kind of popcorning all of our ideas. But, I, I, but you know, that um, point, so maybe what we could do is um look the ad hoc maybe we could just put this in the hands of the ad hoc committee we'll see what they provide want to make any additions I, mean, I think the intention of this is that we all want to we want to have a document that has that captures kind of all the positions of where we're at so if we can add to it then maybe we can save ourselves some time um Going back to your original suggestion. Maybe we so it sounds like uh, Council Member Cummings, you might be amenable to um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson's friendly amendment yep. for motion. Yep. So, um, okay, I will, we have a motion by council member Cummings, a second by uh, council member Voluntary Johnson with a friendly amendment um, that has been accepted. So I guess number five would read, um, well, let me just, let me just read what I, what I wrote. Um, direct revenue ad hoc committee, bring back a resolution of intent allocation of funds generated for the income sales tax. So, so that's, um, instead of gather input 
council members, it's direct revenue ad hoc committee to bring back a resolution of intent. And I guess we, we could leave the same. Does that about capture what, what your friendly amendment is? Oh yeah, sorry, you're talking to me. <laughs> yes. Okay, and um, just one more confirmation with council member Cummings. Great. So now I will take it to council member Brown. And then Mayor, sorry, Mayor, if I, if I could just make a quick comment. Yeah. Um, that, um, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't mean that we should stay here and deliberate for hours and hours, but, um, but that, that it, in terms of the resolution of intent, um, the pieces really stand out, um, uh, from the polls and the slides that we had earlier. And that is focus on our downtown, a focus on our open space, wildfire and water, housing homelessness response. So it, it's all there, the information is there. Um, and I trust the ad hoc committee to be able to glean that in their resolution. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member Kalantaj. Does that conclude your comment? Okay. Uh, okay, Council Member Brown, and then Council Member uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. <sighs> So I, I do want to make a, a couple of comments here before we take the vote. Um, I, as you're all aware, I had serious concerns about bringing a, declaring a fiscal emergency, bring a sales tax measure forward and put that on the ballot when this came before us last year. Um, and I expressed those concerns pretty thoroughly, and so I won't go through them all here. Um, but I, I, I'd want to say I, I remain concerned. I mean, the um, one of our public commenters uh, raised concerns that I, I continue to have about uh, who is affected most by uh, sales tax. And um, I recognize that is a traditional source of funding for cities. Um, and I also am, um, you know, I'm disappointed that um, my colleagues have not thus far during my time on the council been willing to consider more progressive taxation measures. Um, for example, the real estate transfer tax. Um, as over 40 cities in California, cities and counties in California have done, many, many of them in the Bay Area are neck of the woods. Um, raising significant funding. Um, I was at a meeting actually with council member Kalantari Johnson Cummings, where heard from the San Jose mayor about how they're using their real estate for tax funds on uh, properties over dollars to help support their, um, uh, use the term tiny home, but we kind of talked about how it was exactly tiny homes, but um, you know, temporary. Um, housing and um, you know, small housing for people transitioning out of homelessness. So um, <clears throat> we know that is also an effective mechanism. We know that that can raise amounts of money. And um, I have heard from my colleagues over and over um, that um, we have a responsibility to allow the voters to weigh in. I have not seen that same um, recognition of allowing the voters to weigh in when we talk about taxation measures that will affect those with the greatest ability to pay, um, for whom in many cases would not tax whatsoever. Um, so I'm just going to continue to be disappointed about that um, and express my interest in uh, looking at more progressive taxation measures as Council Member Cummings has. Um, already stated this evening, um, I, in many respect, uh, supporting moving forward with this sales tax measure clears the path, no longer going back to that, um, that uh, source. So if you want to raise additional revenues, we have to start serious considering progressive taxation. I don't believe we really seriously have considered 
um, many of those. Um, that said, I um, many of the concerns that I had about how the um, money, uh, additional money would be spent and the what I believe guided priorities kind of not really moving in the direction that I wanted. Um, it's, uh, use of new revenues, um, a lot of those concerns have been addressed. And I'm not going to talk about the particulars of that, but um, I want to thank my council colleagues for um, helping me feel uh, that uh, we are fair uh, uh, priorities and are willing to make those investments and work together to find a way forward. So I really appreciate that. I want to thank um, our uh, our city manager for um, you know. Putting us on, you know, I believe, um, and obviously not single handed that we're a team and we're in this together. Um, but I really feel like we are moving uh, very positive direction and um, that we're going to be proactive about some of the um, really critical things. So um, I have, uh, <laughs> and then working on the, the revenue um, and, and feeling um, like have a, a common set of priorities. So um, I'm, you know, I, I'm feeling good about uh, moving forward with this and you know, I am going to support it. And, you know, I, I want to just send a big to everybody and, um, you know, continue to advocate uh, finding new revenues places have, have a lot of a lot of wealth. The, the property market. So, um, sit there, um, everybody for here. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins and then Council Member Golder. Well, I'll keep it short too, because I'll just, you know, uh, I recognize it is late. And, and I, I too, I guess I'll just build off what Brown shared and just really thank you, Councilmember Brown, for your willingness to jump in with our subcommittee and really work out some of these nuances. And um, there's going to be tough discussions. We've had them already, and there's tough discussions to come. And that's all part of the Democratic process, right? So how do we just embrace that? And I really do believe wholeheartedly that we all run to serve this the best of our ability and that we're elected to do our best to bring that perspective when we have these really tough and robust conversations. And it's true, there are so many um, limitations to what cities do in California in regards to bringing revenue. You know, the city of Santa Cruz is in a tough spot in that we have a lot of big city issues with you know, limited resources and we have a sort of a small city, right? So, um, you know, we, we we have to be creative and continue to look and explore different options. Um, and and I think, you know, ultimately entrust in our voters that no matter what, we'll listen and we'll work together to do the best good stewards of taxpayer dollars. So um, I, I know it took a lot to get you to this place and I really want to acknowledge and recognize that. I'm really encouraged by my, by my colleagues, by us all in terms of what's possible. So I'll leave it there, but with, with gratitude. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Council Member Golder, and then Council Member Cummings. I also just wanted to thank the Ad Hoc Revenue Subcommittee for their work on this and everybody that worked to move this along. I think um, we all realized that with um, some of the tax revenue that we lost during the pandemic, it's essential that we, we um, bring this forward to our community. In, for consideration, for um, for the sake of you know just keeping essential services running, and I just want to thank everybody for their teamwork and collaboration and open mindedness and you know thoughtful consideration when talking to each other. And um, I was going to suggest that if people had other things they wanted to bring up without violating the Brown Act, that we run it through the city manager, like bring our ideas to him, and he could bring it to the subcommittee too. Right? Me? <laughs> or no? We can, 
we can we can work. Okay. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cumming. Um. Yeah. I guess this last thing I was going to say um, is that one of the things that I'm hoping for comes out of this is that some of the funding that will raise this and kind of piggybacking on our last conversation um, around homelessness and homeless response, um, the fact that we're investing in some new services that could, you know, potentially help save money in our community. So, you know, as we think about the alternative crisis response and how that might save money and time for police and fire that would normally respond to those calls and having you know, folks who would be dedicated to cleaning up some of the encampments that we find or the, not, I shouldn't even say the encampments, the, the remains from encampments or the trash that we find in our open spaces will free up Parks and Rec and other certain people to do, you know, more of their dedicated work. And I'm just thinking about the fact that you, as we're moving down this path of but, um, approving this ballot measure that we also think about the indirect savings that we will get from helping support our existing services and other services that we've outlined are important based on the conversations that we've had with Yeah, it's hoping that we can include some of that language too in the uh, letter of intent around uh, certain services. Oh, and then I had a question. Last question is that I'm wondering if um, some kind of communication could go out public so that if people want to weigh in on what should be included in that letter of intent. So for example, we heard from folks, COPA, and their interest in supporting um, low income residents, uh, that that might also be a way that we can include more voices to um, that item when it comes back forward. And after we take the vote, I would like to see if maybe um, <clears throat> we can comment on, or if, I mean, whether I should make a comment now, I mean, it's not it's the item, but I think there was something that was really important that was brought up during oral communications, and I'd like to just ask a question to the city manager, city attorney. So oh. I don't know uh, whether to ask it now or later. We will ask that. Um, I'll come back to that after the item. Thank you, okay. Member Cummings. Um, thank you. Uh, so I did want to just um, say I just, you know, in looking at all of the different revenue sources, I certainly learned a lot of what the options are out there. And Council Member Brown, I really appreciate you on this ad hoc revenue budget committee. I think um, the three of us are bringing a, um, you know, a good perspective uh, representation of, of um, what were our goals and what we are hearing from our community and our constituents and brought up um, some progressive taxes. And I just wanted to, um, you know, speak a little bit to that in that, um, uh, you know, for this context, I think really what brought to this recommendation was um, the uh, the revenue it would bring to the crisis we're in, and that um, six million annually. Um, I was just going back through my notes. I know we talked about transfer tax, and and that was estimated at about hundred thousand annually. So you know, nothing. Um, comparable to six million um, in this context, certainly, um, you know, we always have future opportunities to always assess revenue streams and look at um, our spending and um, make sure that we're being transparent and fiscally responsible. And um, I appreciate um, um, having having all the input tonight from. Everyone, thank you. So with that, have a motion on the floor 
Council Member Cummings, a second by Council Member Colin Perry Johnson with a friendly amendment. And um, we could bring that up and then we can go to vote. Great. So um, there's a motion to accept a report regarding the recent work of the Council Ad Hoc Budget and Revenue Committee and adopt a resolution making emergency findings for placing a general one half of 1% sale transactions and use tax measure on the June 7, 2022 election and adopt a resolution requesting that the consolidated June 2022 California statewide primary election include a general one half of 1% retail transactions and use tax measure and support the measure for the purpose of authorizing arguments, provide direction regarding the authors, direct city attorneys, there are the impartial analysis and providing direction to the city manager regarding the preparation of the fiscal analysis as appropriate. And five, gather input from council members, bring back a resolution, or five is to direct the council ad hoc budget and revenue committee to bring back a resolution of intent for second. So may we have a roll call vote? Perry Johnson. Hi. Hi. Aye. Brown? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Chris? Aye. Yep. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, okay, thank you. Before we adjourn, we will go to we did have um, oral communications squeezed in uh, at 6.30 and um, Council Member uh, Cummings, you had a question or a comment about that. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I um, can't remember, there's been so many timelines now with the eviction protections, um, but I do remember at one point um, I don't know if it was with this group or with another maybe committee that I'm on, um, but there was some discussion around um, people who had applied for the, the rental assistance and them not being, uh, th that there were laws in place that said that if you had applied for rental assistance, then you could not be evicted even after the eviction protection fired. And I don't know, um, City manager's office might have any like information on that, or if we get some information on what the current protections are. Because if um, if those if the, if I'm incorrect, people who are awaiting rental assistance might face getting evicted um, after March 31st. Then it might be appropriate for the city to see whether or not we can put additional protections in place. For those people who are expecting rental assistance from the state. So, Councilmember Cummings, we are investigating that. We're also concerned about planned uh, expiration of, of the state protections on March 31st, and Tony and his team, as well as County Council, are reviewing what local um, authority might exist and what, what options you might have at your disposal. Um, we've also been engaged with the county regarding, um, and one of the speakers spoke to this, just around more robust rental assistance. Uh, part of the challenge has been how slow this funding has taken a roll out and really actually make it into the hands of those that uh, applied. And one of the proposals is if there were to be an extension of a moratorium to have it conditional on those that are waiting, that have applied and are still waiting for funding. So all of that needs to be sorted out. Um, it's on our radar, and we'll be bringing more information back to the council once we have our arms. So I guess. You know, in terms of trying to meet that deadline, you know, we, for example, if the city council were interested in potentially putting some protections in place, then we would 
Can I have a hold on the March 2nd agenda for this item? That's what I was going to ask. So, yeah. All right. That's all. We're working that. through some um, um, some more information, and um, there's a hold on the March agenda. So if I could just elaborate on that a little bit. Um, yeah, the concern is um, I've talked to the council about this as well. Um, but the past eviction protections that the city council put in place were pursuant to an executive order uh, authorized by the governor. And apparently those authorizations, some authorization is firing on first. And the, the real question is, does the city have the legal authority to enact eviction protection without um, that authorization? Because otherwise, generally, uh, state unlawful detainer law is preempted by the California Civil Code. We are aware that the city of Los Angeles and perhaps one or two other cities enacted their own uh, regulations independent of any state authority, and we're researching um, whether or not that's a viable option for the city of Santa Cruz. We're underst we understand that the urgency in March 22nd would be the goal to have a discussion on that, but as you might, re might recall when the city adopted an emergency um, uh, rent freeze ordinance a couple of years ago, it was done uh, retroactive, and so um, that's also an option. Not able to uh, come to any conclusions with that market. Thank you for the uh, input. Tony. No. Okay. Um, with that, oh, and well, I wasn't going to say anything, but I, I was only going to say anything. I would, but um, I, I would just caution us to also look at if somebody applies. Does it mean that they're definitely getting it? Because I've applied for a lot of things and not gotten it before, because I wouldn't want to have any false hopes out there. And if there's landlords that are counting on the money and it's not coming in, I wouldn't want somebody to. You know, face foreclosure on their home because of us meddling in things. I, that, and so I, I just want to look at the whole big picture before I take all of that into consideration, if that makes sense. Sorry, but in. All right, awesome. Good night. <laughs> all right. I think I can call it. Meeting is now adjourned. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.